I welcome you to tonight's meeting of January 24th, 2022. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. Here. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Present. Councillor Emmons. Present. Councillor Azadi. Here. Mayor McNally. Present. Councillor Nermella. Present. And Councillor Seymour. Here. Do I have a motion for uh, minutes? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to approve the minutes of the January 10th, 2022 meeting as presented. Councillor Seymour. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of January 10th, 2022. 22. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to, we don't have any presentations tonight. So that brings us to public comment. The public comment portion of the meeting is an opportunity for the public to communicate with the city council on any topic they choose, unless there's a topic for a public hearing is also, if it's also scheduled. This evening, we have two public hearings, 10A and 10B. The public hearing and action on the annexation of eight acres of unincorporated Adams County and public hearing a first reading of Councilor's Bill number one regarding proposed co comprehensive plan amendments, changing land use designation for Semper Farms North Parcel. First reading of Councilor's Bill number two regarding the proposed comprehensive plan amendments changing the land use designation for Semper Farms uh, or Garden Central and South Parcels. First reading of Councilor's Bill number three regarding the approval of rezoning of Semper Gardens North and Center Parcels and approval of the preliminary development plan for the Semper Gardens. Anyone wishing to speak on these items, please hold your comments until we reach that agenda item later in the evening. The current public comment portion of the meeting is not intended to be back and forth, but rather a direct communication from the public to the representatives. There are four methods available for participation in the public comment. You may submit written email testimony, record a voicemail to be played back during the meeting, or request to speak virtually through the city clerk's office or speak in person at the meeting. Please see the posted agenda for details on how to participate using any of these methods available. This evening, the city clerk has informed me that we have Zero persons requested to speak live by the deadline. Two voicemails were received by the deadline and one email was submitted by deadline and forwarded to council and added to the packet today. Ms. Fitch, would you call the first speaker? Yes, the first speaker for public comment is Karen Calavity. Just remind you, you have five minutes and welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, Karen Calavity, uh, West, uh, 9940 Westcliff Parkway. And I, I guess I'm getting a little tired of coming up here. It's kind of pointless. So this is not really towards the city council, but because I know that some people are watching these meetings and I want to inform them that there has been a referendum filed for the Uplands project. And that would give us an opportunity to get signatures from people and change the course of that project so that people could, citizens could vote on it versus uh, the city council. So I just wanna inform people that um, we have Facebook pages, um, Citizens for Open Space and Westminster Save the Farm that I hope people will uh, you know, make note of and contact and um, sign, these signatures that we need to get on, to make this a ballot issue that the people can vote on versus the city council. Um, and I, I quite frankly think this is not really a home, real, home rule community as much as it is a developer ruled community. And I, I think it's a little sad, um, but that's my two cents worth for today. And um, I hope people will look us up and sign the petitions. The next speaker is Donna Workheiser. Welcome. Hi. 
Uh, Donna Works Kaiser, 7461 Elliott Street. So I have uh, got enough papers this time. You remember me last last month when I only had the one packet of the holes along the wall with the erosion of the dirt from the swell. And so anyway, I um, brought up the oak trees. So on the first page is a draft. I found it on the city's website. My layout, layout I have a hard time saying that didn't know where this was. And I guess the city planners didn't know where this was. It's only a draft, so I guess it doesn't consider anything. But in this draft, it really does make a lot of sense. Like you don't plant oak trees under the power lines. If you see on the page, I have this is the Westminster Station Park Nature Playground, which was opened on November 6, 2021. First page, you see a pine tree planted right under the bridge, which will last how many years before they got to take that pine tree out because it's too tall? Second page is you got two pine trees planted right next to each other, about that far from the sidewalk, which will last no time at all. Third page, you have a pine tree planted next to the sidewalk next to a park bench, which in a few years, I'm gonna have to take that pine tree out. Um, so they spent $7 million on this bench, on this park. They have picnic tables with just bolts on them. They have three big round tables. The bench is already taken off and stolen or done something with. I have pictures, but I didn't print them out. So the next page is a red tube. This is McDonald's coming down. It's going down 74th Street. The drainage issue on this was it had a heavy rain. The water went directly into the house's basement. Um, called the city. Planning Commission, whoever, the engineers, they put this red tube there. It's been there for years. That was their fix for their drainage issue. I have no idea what kind of disease that tube has now because it's been there for years. But it, I guess it is. We haven't had a big rain since. So don't know how well that red tube is going to continue to keep the drainage away. Next page is the email I got from Dave Luceman explaining how the swell behind my house is working. As you saw the pictures last month, it's got the dirt erosion. So now I have a steady stream that will go straight into our yard. I've never had algae in my yard before this. And now I have algae on my retaining wall in the summertime, of course. Um, he's explaining how it's better now going from a flat piece of land to a 20 degree slant into my yard. Because um, 75% of the water now goes drains into federal because it's all concrete. The next page is Eric, who says the city holds on to security bond during the time to help encourage the necessary correction work. I've been dealing with this drainage issue for years now. At one time, I had three inches of water in my backyard, just sitting there. In my area, we have three different garages along that side. So there is going to be structural damage. I mean, when you got erosion, and the gentleman that I was assigned to has only been here for like a month. So he doesn't know. I mean, of course, none of the planning commission knew about this draft on how to plant a tree. And, um, you know, he made a comment to me, well, they'll probably just fill it up with dirt. That's not the fix. They need to fix it. I mean, they really need to, I mean, they're holding money to fix this project. They need to fix it. Um, we have a school called Orchard Park, Park Academy. They plant apple trees around it, maybe because it's called Orchard Trees. Um, I love apple trees. I love bees. But who's going to clean up after these apple trees? If it went through the draft where it says where to plant things, you don't plant apple trees near sidewalks. So I'm just wondering, I'm not sure where this draft came from, who printed it out, why it's not in, um, why it's not usable. I mean, it's 53 pages. I mean, what did the city pay for this draft that makes sense and nobody's following? So I guess that's, that's it, you know. But yeah, I'd like to hear back on the draft why it's not being used, it does make sense. I could have paid, you know, like printed all 53 pages out, but I mean, it's on your website. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, City Manager Andrews will have somebody follow up with all of the pieces that she talked about tonight. Thanks. Next. The next speaker is Carol Campbell. Good evening, city councilors and Mayor McNally. My name is Carol Campbell and I'm a 40 year resident of Westminster residing in Legacy Ridge. Tonight I wanna to touch on four issues. First of all, the status of the Semper Water Treatment Plant and the land acquisition associated with it. Where are we in terms of having an independent review of water 2025 decisions? And will there be a public process to hear the results of this review? When can we expect to hear about it? I'm extremely concerned that the city will waste a golden opportunity to get infrastructure dollars from the federal government while they re-examine a well thought out decision for the drinking water plant replacement. Secondly, I wanna talk about resolution number seven, which is about reappointing members and alternate members to boards and commissions. At a previous meeting, council agreed to table the reappointment of 2021 members and alternates to member slots until after the strategic plan had been revised so that the members could resign if they did not align with the present city council's plans. One counselor said at a recent board meeting that we needed more diversity of thought on these groups, which sounds like code for that we want people that agree with us. My experience as a former board member for Westminster was that recommendations were provided to city staff and council which may or may not be adopted. Better decisions occur when there is an inclusive open process where diverse opinions are heard. I'm unaware of any previous council throwing off board or commission volunteers that did not agree with them or were appointed by previous councils. If inclusivity and transparency are important, then the present system of appointing boards and commissions should continue. Any proposed changes should be put out for public comment as it is the public, specifically those that volunteer their time that are affected by this decision. Next, I wanna talk about resolution number six, which apparently is proposing to ask public health agencies, Jefferson County and Tri-County Health to allow individuals and businesses the freedom to decide whether to require or wear masks. I'm extremely sad to see so many counselors without masks tonight, as well as some of the audience members. We must listen to the experts on how to best protect ourselves as we live, work, and play. When everyone gets to do whatever they want on vaccines and masks, then my freedom is limited. Vaccines and masks save lives. I support science and public health and strongly disagree with this resolution, which I think will be an embarrassment to Westminster if it passes. Lastly, on the strategic plan. I've reviewed this present strategic plan. I see it's very broad and I don't see much that needs to change because I think you could say anything under it. I might change some of the language such as triple bottom line, cause-driven holistic solution, place-making strategies, more plain English terms. The public doesn't know what those things are. I am concerned with the process and how the public can provide input. I know that the retreat is Saturday and Sunday and that public is allowed to attend at the recreation center. But is it gonna be streamed to a wide audience to listen? Because that's a long meeting. Will there be a new draft strategic plan that the public can comment on? What's the process that's going to be used to develop the final plan? I think the public needs to know. Thank you for the opportunity to provide these comments. Thank you. The next speaker is John Palmer. Good evening. Um, this evening, I believe the rank and file of the police department, as well as the residents, are due an update on the collective bargaining agreement and the status of where it's at. And again, I believe that should be this evening. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next speaker is Chris Stimson. Madam Mayor, City Council, uh, this weekend you'll be reviewing the strategic plan of the City of Westminster. Annual reviews of the strategic plan are normal and are part of council responsibilities. However, I note that you have chosen to conduct this review in a location where no arrangements have been made for streaming the event, effectively reducing the level of public participation in your deliberations. I would remind you also of the first stated goal in the 2021-22 plan, which is, I quote, to foster and maintain a beautiful, desirable, safe, and environmentally responsible city. I and many others agree with this goal, and I certainly hope City Council does too. But I wonder how you think, given recent council decisions, you will be able to maintain an environmentally responsible city. You have voted, in effect, to allow the city's biggest residential water users to continue their excessive outdoor use of water as if it were an infinitely renewable commodity. I should remind you that the uh, very recent wildfire that destroyed nearly a thousand buildings not five miles away from where you're sitting would probably not have occurred had local precipitation been anything like adequate. Instead, rainfall since July was in the order of a couple of inches, and snow didn't come to the area until December 10th, a record. This is the reality today, not the fantasy world that most of council seem to live in. How do we achieve and maintain an environmentally responsible city when council has delayed an essential replacement of our aging water treatment plant? If and when we find ourselves undergoing restrictions to our use of water for all purposes because of a plant failure leading to contaminated water. Uh, will that be environmentally responsible? When we're told as this region continues to dry out and experience water stress that, surprise, surprise, water is not infinitely renewable and we must now abandon parts of the lifestyle we were led to believe was acceptable, will that be environmentally responsible? Responsibility of all sorts, council members, often means doing now what is hard, not ephemerally popular to gain votes. In order to ensure a more reliable future, you have responsibilities and the environment is one of them. The next speaker is Karamia Gunther. My apologies. Hi, um, as I said, I was, my name is uh, Karina Gunther and I live here uh, South Westminster. Um, in, uh, from my understanding, uh, you are thinking about modifying the strategic plan. And for the most part, I like what the current plan is. Um, some of the concerns I have of what you might want to change it to includes um, the, uh, I really would like it, it to maintain the idea that we keep and expand our open space. Um, over the decades, as I lived in Golden and other places, I've seen places for horseback riding and other things go under uh, development for office parks and housing and other things like that. And considering where we're going uh, with what the previous, uh, a couple of the other previous speakers mentioned with a water getting tighter in supply as our region dries out and we lose some of the snowpack on the average snowpack, um, we have to reconsider what our development is going to be. Um, we cannot pack everybody in and possibly create an old fashioned type of city. We have to rethink and reimagine what a city should be or town should be and a plan accordingly to limit our footprint 
whether it's with water or carbon dioxide or other uh, pollutants. Um, in addition, um, if we are going to do development, we should focus in on, on um, affordable housing and not micro mansions and uh, think houses for the rich. Um, and then when we put in parks and um, and plan for open space, we should plan for having zero scaping and work with native plants as much as possible instead of plants that take up a lot of water. Um, those are things that will help see us uh, through uh, what is to come with the changing climate. Um, Again, and then if we do do development, one of the other things I would like us to focus in on is small businesses, uh, local businesses, which are better for jobs and much better for our tax revenue because the big box stores, uh, only something like 30% of that comes back into local revenue. The rest of it goes out of state. Uh, away from us, whereas a small business, something like 60 or 70 percent of their business comes back to us locally and helps fund things like police and fire uh, needed services that we need. Thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you. The next speaker is Alan Farb. Last Wednesday, January 19th, was breaking my heart. It was cutting deeply into my soul. As I have done every Wednesday for more than a year and a half, I picked up 60 or so donated sandwiches at Westminster Presbyterian Church, loaded them into my vehicle, which was already loaded with water, sleeping bags, tents, blankets, uh, coats, underwear, and other assorted items. And I drove to some of the many spots in South Westminster and Southwest unincorporated Adams County where many of our unhoused homeless adults reside. The day started first with temps at about 23 degrees. People were practically begging me to get them into motels. I wasn't able to. The city's single homeless navigator already was out trying to house as many people as she could with the limited rooms available. At least two people I encountered in the city were shivering uncontrollably. One man was trying so hard to warm himself by a wood fire that was half in, half out of his tent. It gave me visions of the tent catching fire, just like the three burned down tents I'd recently seen. In fact, one, uh, there was a young homeless woman who had burned her hand as she dragged out uh, a neighbor homeless person from his burning tent. He was burned, but he was saved. People just wanted to be warm, but there was no more rooms at the ends. Later, I encountered an old ragged man who could have been my age. He'd obviously had had a stroke at some point. He was difficult to understand. He used a cane. He just wanted to be warm. No one in the area knew him, but another homeless resident was worried and asked, uh, asked me to call 911, even though the elderly gentleman did not want 911. I called, the responders came, he was checked out. The old man refused to go to the hospital. The first responders left. And though no police came, one camp resident was pretty upset that I had brought attention to their camp. It was a bit tense. But as we talked, he calmed down. I spent about 30 minutes at this site. Even the few minutes that I was at most sites, by the time I got back to my car, my fingers and toes were painfully sore from the cold. I was able to pass out blankets that I had gotten from a motorcycle missionary group called Christian Riders. And I also gave out a couple of coats and a four person tent from the city of Westminster. It was some comfort at least, but by day's ends, temps hovered about 19 degrees. 
everyone I encountered was under stress. And even as the city staff has been doing a consistently better job of addressing our household or our unhoused residents in just the past two years, our homeless resident neighbors need subsidized affordable housing. And that must be coordinated with physical and mental health screenings, career counseling. I'm sure Adams, Jeffco, the state and federal entities can all assist our city. The status quo means of dealing with our unhoused residents, though admirable among the city's caring, dedicated, but minimal staff, it remains a Band-Aid application on a gaping wound. And it also seriously misuses police and emergency responders at too much of a financial cost to all city residents. You know, it costs about $35,000 a year for every unhoused person, who those who are chronically homeless, where the money goes towards publicly funded crisis services, such as jails, hospitals, emergency departments. In this city, that could cost us one and a half million dollars just in those kinds of services. In my year and a half that I've spent out there, I've seen more than I should have to see. And don't wrongly think that if the city chooses it won't have affordable, low-income housing for the homeless and other poor, the people will just go away, or that if the police keep moving our homeless or incarcerating them, they'll just permanently settle outside our city limits. It doesn't work that way. North Glen has a pilot program that's bringing in unhoused adults out of the cold and into city-owned facilities. We should be doing the same. We should be saving people, not letting them perish in the cold or in a fire. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Tom Jurgens. Westminster City Council, Tom Jurgens, Westminster resident. The strategic plan, which will be reviewed this weekend, does not address the direct fire threat to our community. As illustrated by the Marshall Fire, our open spaces are a potential flashpoint for a devastating wildfire. And it will only get worse as our region receives less rain. Plans for mitigating that threat must be one of the goals of the plan. Regarding transparency, the city must provide the residents of Westminster a live stream of this weekend's retreat so they can understand what the city is doing. On another subject, the proposed masking resolution number six is wrong and flies in the face of safety for our community. If you are vaccinated or had the disease months ago, you can transmit COVID. Many studies show that over that wearing a mask reduces the virus's transmission rate. The medical evidence is overwhelming. The Omicron variant is extremely contagious. When a few shirk the mask mandate, this is sufficient to increase the number of COVID cases. That is happening right now. Case rates are not going up because masking isn't effective. It's because masking is shirked and the Omicron virus is extremely contagious. COVID-19 patient, patient loads in the Denver Metro are exploding and hospitals are filling up and patients have shipped to other hospitals in other regions because of this. And patients are not able to receive adequate medical care for heart ailments and other ailments that are not related to COVID. Do not make this situation worse. Masks slow the spread of virus, the virus. Do not approve this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tim Pegg. Hi, hey, councilors. Uh, since you have a special study session coming up to discuss the city's strategic plan, I would like to share with you some of the current plan objectives that I think are important. Uh, first and foremost, objective 3E, promote the organizational culture of uh, service, pride, integrity, responsibility, innovation, and teamwork. And objective 1A, 
um, continue to expand outreach to connect better with the community. I'm pleased to say that talking to city staff has always been courteous, professional, and helpful for me. I believe the spirit values encourage this, and I'd like the city to keep them. I would also like to see the city keep trying to improve communications with the community because this helps promote transparency in city government. I think these two strategic plan objectives are birds of a feather. Helpful interactions with city staff, in my experience, promote transparency by making it easier to find the information I need to know. The next objective of the current strategic plan that I care about is objective 1B. Preserve, expand, and enhance trails and open spaces and provide geographic equity and connectivity to neighborhoods throughout the city. The Big Dry Creek Trail is one of my favorite recreational amenities in the city, and I even use it to run some errands on my bike. To me, it's one of the things that makes Westminster special. Improving connectivity of this trail in particular and off-street trails in general would really enhance the fun for me and no doubt for others too. Uh, I also feel strongly the city should keep objective 4C, enhance access to opportunity through improved connections and multimodal mobility solutions and alternatives. Succinctly, if Westminster is ever going to make progress on its traffic problems, multimodal mobility be, will be an important part. Uh, finally, I think it's paramount that the city stick with objective 4A, identify and implement innovative approaches to diversify the city's revenues. The taxpayer's bill of rights makes it hard to raise taxes. Whatever your views may be on Tabor, the fact of the matter is that it has survived multiple challenges in court and at the ballot box. If Westminster is going to continue providing quality services to its residents, the city must get creative with how government earns revenue. Thanks for your time. Thank you. That's the last um, live speaker we have, but we do have two voicemails. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Councilors. My name is Dave Carpenter. I live at 10762 Ross Court. I'm calling to wholeheartedly support tonight's resolution number six, urging public health agencies to support the rights of individuals and businesses to be free to choose how to protect themselves from COVID-19. First, a quote, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, former FDA commissioner said on CNBC recently, we need to look at the things that have been the most divisive and might not necessarily be contributing the most to trying to reduce further spread in society. The mask mandates that Tri-County Health and Jetco Health imposed in November are quite divisive. They also were ineffective. Cases were trending downward from the fall wave prior to the implementation of the mandate and continued falling through most of December. Then the Omicron wave came and the case numbers exploded, even with the mask mandate still in place. There have been states that have been back to normal with no restrictions for quite some time now. And we can see from their example that our policies aren't slowing the virus down enough to justify their use. We should join those states. Now, to those who may say this resolution is political, I say the unelected and unaccountable public health boards are already acting as politicians, making policy with the force of law. The health boards should inform the elected officials who actually are accountable for crafting public policy. Instead, they are shielding the Adams County and Jefferson County commissioners, amongst others, from having to make tough policy decisions on the public record in an election year. This resolution begins the necessary correction to the situation and encourages returning the decision making to our actual elected officials. This resolution is a vote for freedom of choice. I ask this council to stand for freedom and vote yes on this resolution. Thank you. This is Emily Brooks with comments for tonight's council meeting. I want to strongly object to the action taken during the last council meeting to table the reappointment of members to boards and commissions. I'm very concerned about the message this sends to the many community volunteers who serve or are interested in serving in these positions. The rationale of waiting for the new strategic plan to give people an opportunity to decide if they really want to continue serving is an insult to the entire community. Folks always have the option to step away from these volunteer positions and there are processes in place to fill vacancies. In the course of the discussion on this topic, a statement was made that the boards and commissions work for the council. 
While I agree that the work of these, these groups does inform and support the work of council, these groups work for the residents and businesses of Westminster. This is a shameful attempt to hijack the work of these citizen-led parts of our municipal government. I urge you all to vote in favor of the bill tonight to confirm these appointments. There's also a resolution on tonight's agenda regarding the County Health Department mask policies. I strongly object to this resolution. Right now, close to 2,000 people a day are dying as a result of the pandemic with three quarters of a million new cases every day. It may be inconvenient for us to wear masks to protect others from illness and death, but to me, it really is the ultimate sign of respect and concern for our fellow humans. I'm ashamed of our city for even considering this and urge a no vote. I also want to comment on water rates. In reviewing the materials for the post meeting discussion, it seems that we may be headed in the direction of having lower usage customers subsidizing the cost of higher volume users. I strongly object to any action on council's part to negatively impact the majority of Westminster water rate payers to provide a reduction to the highest water users. And I also am concerned about any decision that would back off the necessary infrastructure maintenance and development plans that would also jeopardize our water system. My last comments are for the upcoming strategic plan retreat. I encourage the council to continue to prioritize maintaining the strong financial position of our city and to commit to funding the programs needed to maintain streets, parks, and utility infrastructure. It's also important to continue to increase the availability of workforce housing. We should support the businesses, schools, and our own city services in our community by providing places for employees and families to live. And we should continue and strengthen the work to make our city a welcoming and inclusive place for everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. That brings us to report of city officials, city manager Andrews. Thank you, Mayor. I do have a few comments uh, this evening uh, with your indulgence. First, I would like to thank all the speakers um, tonight. We do, um, we do listen to each and every one of you and we will follow up uh, where you've asked for follow up uh, on your items that you've raised. So thank you for doing that tonight. And uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, first, I would note uh, as the mayor uh, has earlier that we have three meetings tonight. This one, the city council meeting, the regular city council meeting. Um, the second is the Westminster Economic Development Authority or WIDA meeting. And the third is a post meeting of city council. Um, at this uh, meeting, uh, I'll shortly ask West, Westminster's Director of Community Development, Dave Downing, to join us, and he will help us with the two public hearings. Uh, first, on agenda item 10A, the proposed annexation of unincorporated Adams County land, and second, on agenda item 10B, the proposed Semper Gardens Comprehensive Plan Amendments and Preliminary Development Plan. Um, also, uh, as part of this regular City Council meeting, we have item 10C, which presents resolution number five, to amend the 2022 police officer pay plan. This amendment is another step the city is taking to ensure our police department continues to be a top choice for high performing police officers. This adjustment, uh, if approved by city council will help the city recruit and retain officers. I would also note uh, one of our speakers this evening asked about the collective bargaining status of our uh, police officers. And we are planning to bring a draft collective bargaining ordinance forward to city council for its consideration and direction on the February 7th study session on that topic. Finally, uh, the, the final uh, meeting of the evening is the WIDA meeting. And uh, we have only one item uh, on that agenda and we will be seeking to table that item to the February 14th meeting, uh, regular meeting of um, council. So um, if anyone is here for that item, we will be seeking that to be tabled tonight, and moved to our next regular city council meeting. That's all I have tonight. Thank Mayor, you. Thank you. That brings us to council comments. Anyone? Obi? I mean, Councillor Obi, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Gotta remember where we're at. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank the city um, residents. For the past few weeks, there's been a lot of outreach and helping folks in the Marshall fires. So thank you for your contributions and your donations. Um, second, Mayor, I'd like to uh, if you don't mind to have a poll, uh, so I spoke with city manager Andrews and he said that if council agrees 
um, he can direct staff to make every effort possible to make live streaming a thing for our strategic planning retreat. I think it's in the best interest of our residents to give it a good shot. And if the technology fails, which I've heard has happened in the past, we at least gave it a good shot. And I think we need to be fully tra transparent there. Um, so I'd like to request a poll. Councilor, or Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Zadi, for bringing this forward. I will say that um, I'm not in support of this, not because I'm not in support of being transparent, but that is actually a change from what we've done in the past. The last time we did strategic planning and it was live streamed, it was because of the pandemic. Um, and it ended up taking a good amount of our day um, juggling technology and it, did, and it didn't serve the purpose that it was there for in my mind. Um, so this is probably one of the most important things that we do. Um, and I think that having uh, the risk of spending the day trying to fix the technology once we already start streaming, which would be the case, seems like a risk that I'm, I'm not interested in taking. This meeting is open to the public. It's as, as transparent as you can be. Um, a speaker had mentioned about that it's in an offsite. This has always been in an offsite, except it, it's at least every year that I've been a, a participant in it. We've done it in various different places where it's a little more laid back and we can um, talk with each other as people and, and work on the issues facing our community. So um, I appreciate everybody's desire to see that. I'm open to looking at that in the future as we continue to improve our technology, um, not just to stream these meetings, but the uh, offsite meetings, but I just don't feel like we're there and that's a short period of time to turn that around. Councillor Emmons. Yes, um, thank you, Councillor Azadi, for bringing that forward. I, I'm in support as doing as much as possible um, to stream, but it was pretty difficult when we had a strategic planning that ate up into the hours that we could be working together. Uh, so if there's any possibility to stream it, um, even maybe audio, um, not necessarily vi uh, visual, um, if there's any kind of audio, maybe listening as a podcast, right? instead of what we're doing on council. Um, I, I think that that would be still appropriate for uh, listening opportunity. Um, so if we can, I would support it, um, but I would not support that um, if it's a heavy lift that we are eating up into our planning, I, I wouldn't support moving forward with it. Councilor Numella. Yeah, I, I, similar to uh, Councilor em Emmons, gotta get it. <laughs> 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 uh, that uh, yes, yeah, so I think it would be great if we could find a way to stream this. But uh, yeah, if it's, I'm totally fine if it's um, just audio. So. Councilor Sumer, I, I I am concerned about the time, um, and I know right now we're investing so that we have all of our venues so we can take road shows, town halls, everything that we're working towards that. Um, but, but I know that we have restrictions on the internet at Westview and, um, you know, if, if we can do audio, that's fine, but we, we can't be stopping the meeting and, oh, we can't, we can't get on. It's just, those are two long days and we need to be efficient with our time. I, I would be in favor of audio, you know, it's an open meeting, always has been. I've I attended it in the past myself as a resident, but um, eventually we'll be able to, wherever we go, we'll have this set up, we're just not quite there. Uh, I, I would be in favor if we can, but uh, yeah. Councilor Baker. I'm What's polling? your poll? I need an answer. No? Seymour was yes for audio. For me, um, it has always been open and I have had people uh, attend and they come and listen. And it's like a meeting like this, that it's our meeting. Um, we don't take um, any comments during that time. It is our time to work um, because that is the job of the council. I'm just concerned if they can guarantee that audio like this can be heard. Um, we won't be able, when we speak, you can't wear a mask or it gets jumbled. And we know that from your experience of trying to listen at home. And uh, I, I just don't know what it takes. 
and that probably means we have other IT people that will have to give up their weekend, so, that they didn't know they were going to have to give up their weekend. So my first reaction is no, just because we aren't ready to do that. Um, but I don't know how tough it is to do the audio. So I will leave that in your hands. Anything else? Councillor Emmons. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to thank you for everyone bringing their thoughts and concerns to council. It's an opportunity for all of us uh, as a body to hear your concerns. Um, and I think that's particularly important for our strategic planning this weekend. Um, and just as a final note, um, just as recognition, uh, my name change, um, I recently had a name change due to a marriage last year. So. Uh, no longer Councillor Smith. If you say Councillor Smith, that's fine. Um, been that for most of my life. So, uh, but it is now uh, Councillor Emmons. So, um, if you see the change, that's not a new councillor, just a new name. So, <laughs> thank you. Anyone else? Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to give um, some quick comments. And one, I wanted to follow up on something one of the residents brought up and make it maybe a point for manager Andrews if you could bring it back I had a similar ask about um, bringing the sheriffs in to talk to our county partners which I know you're working on um, I think it would be interesting to talk to our um, county partners in homelessness I know that uh, um, to the resident who brought that up that is something that I will certainly keep addressing in strategic planning and did in the past and there's some things I'd like to bring up with the new council that we had talked about doing in the past so but it's a good opportunity to I think to have a study session with our our county partners and see um, how we can collaborate and try to uh, better tackle that issue. Um, the other thing that I wanted to quickly mention that from one of the public speakers is a uh, fire mitigation in that I know that this has been brought up by multiple council members to the city managers after the tragedy that we saw. And so I know that we have staff already working on that. And I do anticipate that being part of our conversation. Um, I know I'll bring it up if nobody else does. So um, but we appreciate everybody who came forward. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, obviously, hopefully you enjoyed uh, celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. This is the first time we've seen the public for a, a little bit because we had last Monday off um, to celebrate his life and his legacy, um, as well as a couple of days prior to that. Uh, hopefully, I know a lot of community members got to appreciate Bob Briggs, who is our uh, former mayor pro tem, state rep, County Commissioner, RTD board member, and a various number of other things. Um, I was able to attend his service and celebrate his life. Um, the other thing was uh, inclusivity board. So I was able to attend that and quick update to the council. Um, the main thing that they were talking about was actually meeting with us and what the strategic plan moving forward might look like. Um, they're still working. They'd like to meet with us in person if possible. So they're still working through when people are comfortable to be back in person because I think they think that would be more valuable to meet this new council um, together. Um, and a, a resident mentioned um, in their comments about, I believe they were talking about that meeting because I was asked about the, the um, move to pause the appointments till after strategic planning. So I wanna give some context that I gave in that meeting since I was asked about it. Um, I think <clears throat> I am still where I was as far as it's a good practice for us to have something moving forward to touch base with people when they're reappointed. That's not something we've done in the past, but I think that would be constructive for both parties. And that's not to say that's because the council would get rid of you. It's a good touch base for to hear feedback, uh, maybe check attendance, because I know we've had that, that problem in some boards and commissions in the past. So I think it would be a constructive thing to make sure that those boards are operating on all cylinders. Um, I do also think that it makes sense to align with strategic planning. Um, however, since this has always been the practice that we just would reappoint, I had heard a considerable amount of feedback from the community on it. So I have spoken and pulled individually different council members and let them know that I was going to be asking for this to be back on the agenda because I think um, my preference now is um, after hearing feedback that we still do those things, but we reappoint people and allow them to continue the great work that they're doing, um, but be able to move forward. Um, so I wanted to give that update because I shared that in the inclusivity board. So I think it's fair my colleagues know that I shared that with that group when they asked me about it. I mean, I look forward to voting on that this evening. Thank you. One thing from the community, um, City Manager Andrews, um, today I was on live with the Westminster Chamber and some comments came up how tough it is to find the agenda 
link. And so the only suggestion was, can the current agenda be moved up to find the link when you're looking for agendas and let the archives be at the bottom? Instead, you have to go through the archives. And I know I always thought when I was trying to find you guys and when I was at home, I'm going, where are they? And um, they just thought maybe that simple little thing. And I said, since I was coming to council tonight, I would share. The other things, the meetings I attended in the last two weeks were transportation. Uh, the Northwest mayors and commissioners are working on, they're a group that started in 1999 and have held strong. And that is how we got the, uh, the express bus lane on US 36. And we are now looking at the diagonal that goes from Boulder to Longmont and 287 from Longmont into Broomfield and also Highway 7. I know our residents use those. Um, so we're at, a, uh, at that table talking. They were at the table when they didn't touch any of US 36. So that's the kind of partnership. It's the North region and we work together. There's a second uh, transportation unit that is on uh, along the I-25 corridor. And the piece they're looking at right now is the access with 84th Avenue because they're going to be working on 270 and that goes on to I-25 heading to um, 84th Avenue. And we've done work north of 104th and south of 36. So there's like a bottleneck and everything's sort of feeding in and it doesn't flow smoothly. So they would like that. It was um, studied back in like 2011. And so it is 10 years old. And when things get old like that, then CDOT and uh, the guys in DC want to redo and that's thousands of dollars. So. That's what they're talking about. And then in the midst of all of that, between both groups, uh, we're looking at this summer when our ozone is always bad. So there's one side that thinks, well, how can we alert people? This is going to be an ozone day. So it's going to be a free day on, the, on transportation, whether it's the rail or bus. And people then say, that's going to be a nightmare. And so some are saying, what does it look like if you have June, July, August, um, maybe September as those months that are free for that kind of transportation? Um, the issue is where does the money come from? So those are the talks we're involved in with transportation. Um, and as we get any place where we have some answers, I'll continue to let you know. Um, as far as the strategic plan goes, the one reason why I think it's hard when people just listen for a little bit and they go out on, on whether it's next door or wherever and start blowing things up that aren't even settled yet. Um, we heard so-and-so say this and this blah, blah, blah. Then we have the cleanup to do of what we really did say and half of the people won't believe that. So. It's just an interesting scenario. If you tune in, I hope you stay with it. So you know from beginning to end what's discussed, how we've come together and what we end up deciding. So um, those are just my questions. Anyone else? That takes us to the consent agenda. <laughs> I don't know who said first. Councillor Seymour. Mayor, I move to adopt consent agenda item 8A. Councillor Ames. Um, uh, second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt cons a consent agenda item 8A. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. And Councillor Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 7-0 vote. That brings us to item 9A, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to adopt the resolution number seven, reappointing members and alternate members to the Election Commission, Environmental Advisory Board, Historic Landmark Board, Human Services Board, Inclusivity Board, Parks, Recs, Libraries and Open Space Advisory Board, Personnel Board, 
Planning Commission, and Special Permits and Licensing Board, respectively. Is there a second? Councilor Emmons? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt Resolution 7. Is there any further discussion? Ro uh, sorry, Councilor Baker? Thank you, Mayor. Um, change is always hard. Change is always hard. But I think we need to openly recognize that these are terms. And these are two-year terms. And these are not entitlements. And to make the difficult change, uh, I would say let's step up and make that change. Let's set that priority realizing that uh, it is so difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Councilor Numella. So I just wanted to say, um, I do appreciate this being on um, back on the agenda. I feel like uh, the, the boards and commissions as we go through and, you know, we, we have resumes submitted by applicants, you know, they are chosen and interviewed um, essentially for a job, but it's a volunteer job. And they're, um, they, we hire them based on their merit and their experience. And, um, you know, one of the roles of these boards and commissions is to actually provide advisory service to the council. And so um, based on the experiences that very rich and different experiences that all of our board members provide um, that I think provides us with, you know, something to think about. New ideas are brought in or even contrasting ideas can be brought in. So I think it's worthwhile to staff these boards and commissions um, in the way that we have been by um, interviewing and making the best choice based on experience. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, thank you. And thank you to my colleagues. Um, I, I would just reiterate, I, I think that these boards obviously are very important to the city. I served for uh, many years on the Special Permits and Licensing Board, which is one of the boards, one of is, is the only board actually that doesn't answer back to the city council. Decisions you make on that board, if you're wrong, you get sued in court. Um, so, you know, I understand the, the gravity of what those boards and commissions do for us. And quite frankly, we wouldn't have enough time in the day be able to do all the things that need to be done um, if we didn't have people who step up. So I, I certainly do appreciate what they do, um, but I do believe in diversity of thought. I think that it's very important that we have diversity of thought, and that is by no means any kind of code other than we need people who are in a diverse city that think like all the different diverse uh, thought processes that you have in a city as big as the city of Westminster, if we're to best serve all those different portions of the city. So. Um, no matter which board it's on, um, they should be inclusive and diverse, whether it's the inclusivity board or special permits and licensing, because you want you want those life experiences like you're mentioning. So, um, however, I do think that we have room for improvement moving forward. And I hope my um, colleagues, as we go through the year, that you will agree that we look at a way that we can, uh, when people are up, that we can have a touch point with them, as well as I do think it makes sense for us to align on the strategic plan with all our boards and commissions. And I will say that I strongly heard from uh, a handful of members from the inclusivity, um, both in the meeting and a couple privately, that they were very much in line with that. And they wanted to make sure that we're all moving in the same direction as far as, you know, we have the same kind of goals. Maybe we have different ideas how we get there, um, but that's the way that these boards work well together. So I'm excited to move forward with this. Thank you. Councilor Seymour? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I initially uh, was in favor of this change and an update. Um, I do believe, though, that we caught some of our um, longtime board members off guard. I think we need to put in place um, uh, uh, an interview process, a check-in, whatever we want to call that at the end of each two-year term, so that we're all on the same page in that um, case, too. So I, I will be voting in, in favor of this tonight, which is a change of heart from why, when I initially did that. Um, but I think we can improve the process and look at every two-year term separately in the future. See, no one else wants to speak. Would you take roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. 
Councillor Nermella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. And Councillor Baker. No. The motion passes on a 6-1 vote. The next item on the agenda is a public hearing and action on the annexation of eight acres of unincorporated Adams County, including portions of the right of way for Lowell Boulevard, West 84th and West 88th Avenues, an associated establishment of a comprehensive land, comprehensive plan designation and municipal zoning on a portion of 2.96 acres in the vicinity of Lowell Boulevard and West 82nd Avenue. It's now 8.02. And at this time, we will open the public hearing, which will begin with a staff presentation, followed by a period for questions and comment from the city council. Mr. Andrews, will you please introduce the staff present? Mayor, uh, Dave Downing, Director of Community Development. I'll call upon uh, Senior Planner Patrick Caldwell to do the staff presentation. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, this is Patrick Caldwell. I'm a senior planner with the city's planning division. And this is a presentation for the public hearing and action on the annexation of eight acres of unincorporated Adams County that includes portions of the right of way for Lowell Boulevard and West 84th Avenue and West 88th Avenue and an associated establishment of a comprehensive plan designation and municipal zoning on a portion of 2.96 acres in the vicinity of Lowell Boulevard and West 82nd Avenue. Next slide, please. A staff agenda memo has been created and tonight's public hearing has been properly noticed. The agenda memo and its associated attachments tonight's PowerPoint presentation, the published notice, the mailed notice, and the posted notice are hereby entered into the public record at this time. The West 88th Avenue and West 84th Avenue annexations are public right of way and do not require public notice. A portion of the West 82nd Avenue annexation is privately owned land and public notice is required. A sign was posted on that parcel and a notice of the public hearing was mailed to the 17 property owners within 500 feet of the West 82nd Avenue annexation parcel. As noted earlier, this property also had published notice and that notice was published for five consecutive weeks. The city also posted the hearing date and time on its website. Next slide, please. Here's a map of the proposed Uplands annexations. At the top is the 3.587 acre West 88th Avenue annexation. The 1.481 acre annexation of a portion of West 84th Avenue is shown towards the middle. The 2.96 acre parcel of the West 82nd Avenue annexation is shown in the lower left of the map. Next slide, Mayor, please. Pat, Patrick, I'm sorry to interrupt. Mayor, um, may we take a short pause? Sure. Thank you. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We will take a short break. Okay, Mayor, we're good to start again. Thank you. Okay. Um, 2.96 acres of land that is west of the easterly edge of Lowell Boulevard and north of the West 82nd Avenue alignment is proposed for annexation. The annexation will clarify the jurisdiction responsible for maintenance, police and fire response, snow removal, and related municipal concerns for this half acre section of Lowell Boulevard. As noted earlier, the 2.46 acres west of the Lowell Boulevard right-of-way edge are privately owned and with this annexation, that parcel will have a comprehensive land plan designation of R5 residential, and the zoning will be established as planned unit development. The approved Uplands PDP shows open space for most of this parcel with adjacency to the view corridor. Next slide, please. Section 11.521 
of the Westminster Municipal Code contains 10 criteria that are to be considered when reviewing land use plan amendments. Staff finds that this comprehensive plan amendment generally meets these criteria as outlined in the agenda memo. One example of criteria is consistency with the vision, intent, and policies of the comprehensive plan. The current comprehensive plan shows the land adjacent to the north with a view corridor area and the West 82nd Avenue annexation expands the view corridor area to include most of the annexed area. This is also consistent with the approved Uplands PDP. Next slide, please. Establishment of zoning to PUD is a requirement of city code section 11-5-2 for all property larger than two acres in size. The portion of the West 82nd Avenue annexation parcel is 2.46 acres. Additionally, 10 criteria for establishment of zoning are listed in city code section 11-5-14 Staff finds that establishing the zoning as planned unit development generally meets these 10 criteria as outlined in the agenda memo. Next slide, please. The staff recommendations are that one, city council hold a public hearing and two, pass councilor's bill number four on first reading annexing into the city the 2.96 acres of privately owned property that is west of the easterly edge of Lowell Boulevard and north of the West 82nd Avenue alignment. Number three, pass councilors bill number five on first reading, annexing into the city the 1.481 acres of public right-of-way of West 84th Avenue between the east edge of the Lowell Boulevard right-of-way and easterly to the center line of Irving Street. Number four, pass councilors bill number six on first reading, annexing to the city the 3.587 acres of public right of way of West 88th Avenue between the center line of Lowell Boulevard East, 2,231 feet to near Grove Street. Number five, pass councilors bill number seven on first reading approving a comprehensive plan amendment for the portion of the 2.96 acres of privately owned property that is bounded by the Mead Street Center Line, the southerly right-of-way boundary for West 82nd Avenue, the westerly right-of-way boundary for Lowell Boulevard, and the 1911 southerly boundary of the original city of Westminster. Number six, pass Councilor's Bill Number Eight on first reading to establish the zoning as City of Westminster planned unit development for the portion of the 2.96 acres of privately owned property that is bounded by the Mead Street center line, the southerly right of way boundary for West 82nd Avenue, the westerly right of way boundary for Lowell Boulevard and the 1911 Southern boundary of the original city of Westminster. And staff finds that a recommendation, oh, I'm sorry, next slide, please. Staff finds that a recommendation of approval of the applications would meet the city's strategic plan goal of foster and maintain a beautiful, desirable, safe, and environmentally responsible city by creating new sites for public parks, recreation, and view shed protections in an area which otherwise is primarily private property developed historically under Adams County regulations. The goal to provide visionary, effective, and collaborative government is met by working with the private landowner to annex land into the city to ensure the municipal oversight of planning development and construction on the lands subject to the petitions. The goal to advance the city's long-term sustainability to provide ongoing excellence in city services and a well-planned community that meets the needs of residents now and in the future is supported by enhancing the street network by establishing West Westminster authority over streets surrounding the Uplands development with improved connections, efficiency, and safety and supporting a circulation pattern that promotes multimodal mobility 
and public safety response. Thank you for your attention. There are several staff members with us this evening. We would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And the applicant is with us tonight and they have a brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll ask that questions are held until we hear from the um, developers. So um, at this time, I'd like the applicant um, that has a presentation to share, and then we'll ask our questions. Welcome. Good evening, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council. And thank you, Patrick Caldwell, for your presentation. Bonnie Nijelic, Norris Design, 1101 Bannock Street. As Mr. Caldwell mentioned, we have three small parcels in front of you this evening. And we have a very short presentation to walk through the benefits of the annexation of each piece. I also have a handout outlining the conformance with the Colorado Revised State Statutes and City Code, which we'd like entered into the record. And this document is something that was provided with the initial rezoning and PDP for Uplands as well. So it's not new information, just wanted to make sure it was part of the record since um, it does discuss conformance for the annexation. And I do have a couple of slides, if someone could pull those up, please. I just like to say I hear talking and so if we could if you want to talk go outside the doors continue thanks perfect I'll go ahead um, while those are coming up hopefully they're up shortly um, but the first piece we have is a 2.96 acre parcel that's generally located at the northwest corner of 82nd and Lowell which would be highlighted in a map if you could see it um, the site is bounded by the city of Westminster land on the north west and south and it includes the view corridors and public land dedication that's identified in parcel B in the approved PDP. Annexation of this parcel ensures the carefully located public land dedication and view corridors are within city limits and under the city's purview and control. The second parcel includes 1.481 acres of land that includes 84th Avenue, generally west of Irving Street. This 84th Avenue is currently or 84th Avenue is currently within city limits to the west and east of this parcel. And annexing this parcel of land creates consistent jurisdictional responsibility for the street, which helps clarify maintenance responsibilities, police and fire response, snow removal responsibilities, and related municipal concerns between the city and Adams County. Excuse me, we've got a request to wait until we have the slides okay. correct to, that we're looking at. Perfect. <laughs> It was going to be a short presentation. <laughs> no, it's really fun. Yep, that works perfect. Um, if you could go to the next slide um, where it says requesting compliance. Um, so this is that first parcel that I, oops, sorry. Um, the first, yep, that's it. Um, so this is that first parcel I was mentioning at the Northwest corner of 82nd and Lowell um, in that orange hatch, that's the piece of land that we're requesting being annexed. 
And you can see um, the two green hatches underneath it. That is the view corridor and the public land dedication that was identified in the PDP. So again, um, we know both of those pieces of land are incredibly important for public access and want to make sure that those are within the city's um, review and control um, for design, things like that, public access. The next slide, please. And this is the second parcel. Um, this is 1.481 acres of land along 84th Avenue. So that's generally west of Irving. Um, 84th to the west and east of this parcel are already within city limits. Um, so this creates consistent jurisdictional responsibilities for the street, which helps clarify maintenance responsibilities, police and fire response, snow removal responsibilities, and other municipality concerns between the city and Adams County. This also ensures that the city is the approving body for the detailed street construction documents and avoids unique or differing design standards between the city review and the county review. These improvements include curb, gutter, sidewalks, and tree lawn. Next slide. And the final piece is the 3.587 acre piece of land that includes 88th Avenue, which is generally located from Lowell Boulevard to the east of Grove Street, again, highlighted in that orange hatch. Just like 84th, this annexation creates consistent jurisdictional responsibility for 88th from Lowell going east along the Uplands community and ensures the city is the approving body for the detailed street construction documents. The three proposed annexations are consistent with the urban growth boundary established when this, within the city's existing comprehensive plan and fills gaps in the city's current boundary line. It ensures the city's jurisdiction over all phases of development review, construction, and then site access to ensure public safety response. As noted in your staff report and in Mr. Caldwell's presentation, along with the provided conformance document, all three parcels meet the provisions of the Colorado Revised Statutes and the Westminster Municipal Code related to annexations. Further, the proposed comprehensive land use designation and zoning for the private land west of Lowell Boulevard is in conformance with the standards of approval identified in the Westminster Municipal Code for land use plan amendments and zoning. Finally, it is consistent with the previous approved Uplands PDP. We thank you again for your time this evening and our team is here if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions from council? Councilor Baker. Are we going to have a further request for annexation on 88th Avenue east of Federal Boulevard? Thank you, Councilor Baker. Um, there's not one that we are planning. Um, we reviewed with staff um, any annexation areas in our very first pre-op meeting a couple of years ago to ensure the correct pieces of land um, were annexed into the city. So there's nothing that we are planning at this time. Anyone else? At this time, we will move on to testimony from the public for this hearing. There are now four methods available for participation in the hearing. You may testify in person, submit written email testimony, record a voicemail to be played back during the meeting, or request to speak live via the remote meeting link through the city clerk's office. Welcome everyone. We are dedicated to hearing public input and we want to honor your time. Each speaker will be given five minutes. The applicant's presentation is limited to a maximum of 10 minutes per land use application being considered. We have done the following requirements in order to ensure everyone's testimony is heard. When you are recognized, please approach the podium, state your name and address for the record. All comments and testimony shall be made from the podium. No comments or testimony shall be shouted from the audience. Also, when possible, if your comments have already been stated by another speaker, please approach the podium and state that you agree with a previous speaker, rather than restating the same comments or concerns. Applauding comments or disagreement from the audience during and after a speaker will not be allowed. We are here to honor all testimony. We ask that speakers make their comments in a civil manner and refrain from making demeaning or inappropriate comments. Comments and testimony are to be directed to the chair. Dialogue and inquiries from the, from the person at the podium to members of staff or seated audience is not permitted. 
Inquiries which require staff response will be referred to staff by the chair through the interim city manager. Comments that address the approval criteria for each application are most useful. Council members use electronic devices to access materials relevant, relevant to public hearing before us. Be assured that this is a common practice that is before that uh, of this city council and these devices are not being used for texting, emailing or communicating during public hearings. And here's my cell phone and it's right there. Um, if you, you, it is our desire to give anyone an opportunity to speak and be heard in a timely manner and within an atmosphere of respect and diplomacy, these rules are meant to foster that atmosphere. Thank you for your cooperation. We look forward to hearing your comments. At this time, I would ask the city clerk to please summarize the number of participants this evening and introduce our first speaker. We had no emails submitted, no requests for online speaking, no voice, voicemails, but we do have one in-person speaker. So would John Palmer please come to the podium? Good evening. Uh, a little disappointed in the method of notification to the public on this matter. I believe the city charter, city code states that should be published in the official city newspaper. And I confirm that the Westminster window is the official city newspaper with the city clerk's office this morning. Instead, the city chose to publish it in the Denver Post on five separate Thursdays. Not even one time in the Westminster window. Now as a lay citizen, I don't read the Denver Post. I rely on the Westminster window. I rely on that for all public hearings. How is a lay person supposed to know on these particular Thursdays that, that it was even there? Now, Mr. Downing stated, or Mr. Caldwell, excuse me, stated that it was uh, available to the public online. That wasn't until last Wednesday, any knowledge of the content of what was gonna to happen tonight. I certainly think we can do a better job. If nothing else, this should be postponed until it can be done correctly. But at best, again, why wasn't it adhered to in the, in the city code where it's supposed to be in the city newspaper? Now, the other thing that I find very interesting that the first publication was December 23rd. Councilor's Bill 49 that you approved two weeks ago was long after this. Well, why was this even published or considered before you guys approved Councilor's Bill 49? Seems a little fishy to me, a little suspicious. I, I, I think I deserve an answer as to why this happened and why it wasn't run in the city newspaper as prescribed by the city code. Thank you. Staff have any comments? Yes, Mayor, uh, Mr. Caldwell will address that issue. This is Patrick Caldwell. Um, and um, just briefly, the city follows the um, annexation regulations that out, as outlined in the Colorado revised statutes um, and the notice was published in the Denver Post because of a timing issue. The Uplands item was set for council public hearing December 13th, 2021 and the hearings were continued over a series of days and the final decision was on December 21st, 2021. To summarize the Colorado revised statutes, um, they require that hearing date be established and council set that hearing date on December 13th, 2021. They set the hearing for January 24th, 2022. They set that date by resolution per the requirement in the Colorado revised statutes. The statutes require that the hearing must be held within 30 to 60 days of the date of the resolution that set the hearing. So on December 13th, when the 
resolution was um, approved by council. The hearing for the annexation of the private land was set for January 24th. That's within 30 to 60 days of the date of the resolution. And another item in the Colorado revised statutes um, states that we that um, the notice for the hearing is to be published in a newspaper of general circulation. The statute also requires that the notice for private land be published at least 30 days prior to the hearing date for four consecutive weeks. The first publishing date for the notice needed to be December 23rd, 2021. The Westminster window requires notice information one week prior to the notice publishing, and that would have been December 15th. The City Council approval of the Uplands was early the morning of December 21st. That was six days after the Westminster window deadline. The Denver Post accepts items for legal notice 24 hours prior to the first publishing. The city had one day to get the information to the Denver Post to meet the deadlines set by the Colorado revised statutes for notice for annexation of private land. The Denver Post was the only option that met the criteria for notice for the annexation of the private land. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Question for attorney Frankel. Do I close this public hearing and then we reopen one for the next one? Uh, yes, Mayor, the two items being separate. So okay, yes. thanks. I just didn't want to keep us going forever here. Um, I will close the public hearing on this on, at 828 and ask for a motion. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councilor Bill number four on first reading annexing into the city the 2.96 acres of privately owned property that is west of Lowell Boulevard and north of West 82nd Avenue. Councilor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Passed Councilor's Bill number four. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Baker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, the council has spoken about the Uplands annexation and there's no need to uh, uh, revisit that. Uh, we need to move, we we need to move forward in a unified and consistent manner. So I will be supporting these annexations. I would like to express my disappointment, though, that uh, when we talk about transparency and all this other stuff, uh, we've met all the minimums of posting in this. But it would have been nice if we truly believed in transparency that we had a big sign on 88, even though we didn't have to, because it was right away. And if we had the sign on 84th, even though it was right away and we didn't have to. So in the future, I think we can do a better job. So thanks. Thank you. Oh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I would second to ask to continue what we've been doing through this process and, and improving the signs. I know that staff has done some work and under short time period, there's so much you can do, but certainly anytime we hear learnings from the public that we could have potentially done better, we should investigate that. Sorry, I have a quick question. I know we're past that, but uh, is there anything, I know, uh, Mr. Caldwell, you had mentioned that uh, the deadline for a Westminster window had passed. Is it, um, is it, I guess I'm not sure how to word this, but is it something that we could have posted in the Westminster window for three weeks, knowing that we had it in the Denver Post for four and we would be covered? Um. Yes, that was an option. It's just sometimes easier to make it continuous within one um, newspaper. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to... I'm asking for us to be able to conduct our meeting, please. If you want to speak, go outside the uh, of this room. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I 
would agree with the rest of my colleagues in that uh, we could do better if we've done uh, Westminster window postings in the past. Uh, I think it's appropriate for us to make sure that we cover our basis. Again, I know that it's uh, a lot of work and a lot of changes um, as we move through this. So um, I, I would express my disappointment in that transparency part of it, um, but I will be moving to pass this along with Councillor Baker. See no other um, comments. Would you please roll call? Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmala. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. And Councillor Baker. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. Did, did we go all the way through? Feel like I'm it. sorry. Did I miss somebody? I'm, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now the motion passes on a 6 1 vote. My apologies. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott, Councilor Bill Number 5. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councilor Bill Number 5 on first reading, annexing into the city the 1.481 acres of public right of way um, of West 84th Avenue. Councilor Emmons? Yes. Or second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded to pass Bill. Bill number five. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. And Councillor Emmons. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. It brings us to Councillor's Bill number six. Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, sorry, you didn't. Um, thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councillor Bill Number Six on first reading, annexing into the city the 3.587 acre of public right of way of West 88th Avenue. Councillor Emmons, second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Bill Councillor's Bill Number Six. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Mayor McNally, yes. Councillor Nurmella, yes. Councillor Seymour, yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. And Councillor Rosati. No. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. It brings us to Councillor's Bill Number 7. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councillor Bill Number 7 on first reading, approving the establishment of the comprehensive plan land use designation as R5 residential for both portion of the 2.96 acres of privately owned property that is west of Lowell Boulevard and north of West 82nd Avenue. Councillor Emmons. Second. That brings it, or I'm sorry. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill Number 7. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll be voting no on this portion of it. I want to be consistent when I also voted on the previous change of the designation to R5 on that parcel B um, uh, in, the, in the vote that we took over a year ago. So I'm going to be consistent in that and uh, keeping that. Um, at a lower density at this time. Roll call, please. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. No. Councillor Baker. Yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. No. And Mayor McNally. Yes. The motion passes on a 5 2 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill Number 8. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councilor Bill Number 8 on first reading, approving the establishment of the plan unit development zoning for the portion of the 2.96 acres of privately owned property that is west of Low Boulevard and north of West 82nd Avenue. Second. Councilor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councilor's Bill Number 8. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Seymour. Yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. And Councillor Nirmella. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. The next item on the agenda is public hearing and first reading of Councillor's Bill Number One regarding the proposed comprehensive land plan amendments changing land. 
use designation for Semper Gardens. North parcel, first reading of Councilor's Bill number two, proposed comprehensive plan amendments changing the land use designation for Semper Gardens Center and South parcels. First reading of Councilor's Bill number three, approval of rezoning of Semper Gardens North and Central parcels and approval of the preliminary development plan for Semper Gardens. It's now 836 and at this time we will open the public hearing which will begin with a staff presentation followed by a period for questions and comment from council. Thank you, Mayor. I'll introduce Senior Planner Jacob Kaza to give the staff presentation on this proposal. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Jacob Kaza. I am a Senior Planner with the City's Planning Division. Next slide, please. As a part of bringing this project before you, a staff agenda memo has been created and tonight's public hearing has been properly noticed. The agenda memo, its associated attachments, tonight's PowerPoint presentation, the public notices published in the Westminster window, the mailed notices and the posted notices are hereby entered into the public record at this time. The notices of the public hearing were mailed to 322 property owners within 500 feet of each of the three parcels under consideration tonight. The city has also posted the hearing date and time on its website and sent an email copy of the notice to an email list that staff have compiled from persons that have requested to receive email updates about the project. Next slide, please. Here's a map of the proposed Simper Gardens development. The parcels are outlined in red and labeled North Center and South Parcel. The parcels are located at the southwest corner of West 104th Avenue and Sheridan Boulevard. Next slide, please. One of the development applications filed as a part of the proposed Simper Gardens development is the request for an amendment to the land use designation of the comprehensive plan for the north parcel from residential R3.5 to residential R5 and for the center and south parcels from residential R3.5 to residential R8. Next slide, please. Section 11521 of the Westminster Municipal Code contains 10 criteria that are to be considered when reviewing land use plan amendments. Staff finds that the comprehensive plan amendments generally meet these criteria as outlined in the agenda memo. Several examples of these criteria are that the amendment is consistent with the vision, intent, and policies of the comprehensive plan, that the amendment provides for the orderly physical growth of the city, and that the amendment will not negatively impact infrastructure and city services. For those selected example criteria, staff finds that the amendment meets several of the comprehensive plan goals and policies relating to a balance of housing mix, that the amendments do allow for the orderly growth of the city, and that the impacts of the amendments to city infrastructure will generally be a negligible impact. Further, staff finds that the proposal to change land use designations from R3.5 to R5 and R8 will allow for a larger variety of housing types, specifically townhomes. The other types of housing, single family detached and duplexes are already in allowed housing type under R3.5. Staff finds that in order for the amendments to meet the criteria of furthering a public policy or serving a public purpose, townhomes or condominiums must also be incorporated into the development. Staff have already negotiated with the applicant a requirement in the PDP that townhomes be one of the housing types that they would build. Staff's recommendation for an increase in density is intrinsically linked to the applicant building housing types that are not already allowed under the R3.5 designation. <clears throat> designation, excuse me. Next slide, please. Another development application proposes to re rezone the north and center parcels from O1 to PUD. The south parcel was already rezoned to PUD as part of a prior development application that never proceeded to construction. Rezoning to PUD is a requirement of city code section 1152 that property larger than two acres in size must be rezoned to either planned unit development, specific plan district, or O1. Given the proposed comprehensive plan designations, planned unit development is the appropriate zoning designation for this proposed development. Next slide, please. 
The last development application being considered is for a new preliminary development plan for all three parcels. The proposed PDP would allow for 202 residential units in a combination of single family detached and single family attached houses. The single family attached houses would only be allowed on the easternmost portion of the site between Ames Street and Sheridan Boulevard. The PDP would maintain 102nd Avenue in its current alignment with no direct driveway access. The PDP proposes three new roads that the developer would construct, 101st Avenue, 103rd Avenue, and Ames Street. The new 101st Avenue would connect to the existing stoplight on Sheridan Boulevard and provide much needed access for the existing and future residents to a signalized intersection so they can have a more efficient path to turn north on Sheridan Boulevard. The PDP also designates 6.2 acres of land on the north side of the site that would be dedicated to the city to meet the public land dedication requirement. Next slide, please. Section 11514 of the Westminster Municipal Code contains 10 criteria that are to be considered when reviewing rezonings and new preliminary development plans. Staff finds that the rezoning and preliminary development plan generally meet these criteria as outlined in the agenda memo. Several examples of these criteria are that the PDP is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all city codes and policies, that the PDP is compatible and harmonious with existing public and private development in the surrounding area, and that the PDP will not preclude future public land dedications. For those selected example criteria, staff finds that the PDP as proposed meets the applicant's proposed comprehensive plan amendments, that the PDP is compatible with existing developments in the surrounding area, and that the PDP will not preclude future land dedications. Next slide, please. Staff recommend that one, City Council hold a public hearing, and two, approve the comprehensive plan amendments, the rezonings, and the PDP. Next slide, please. Staff finds that the approval of the applications would meet the city's strategic plan goals of foster and maintain a beautiful, desirable, safe, and environmentally responsible city and advance the city's long-term sustainability to provide ongoing excellence in city services and a well-planned community that meets the needs of residents now and in the future. <clears throat> the plan provides, the plans provide for additional city open space and expanded trails and will increase the housing diversity throughout the city. The applicant is with us tonight and has a presentation to share with you as well. Thank you for your attention. There are several staff members with us this evening and we would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, I know that we have the applicant that wants to present. So would you come forward and introduce your team? Welcome. Thank you. I'm uh, Jeff Willis, president and owner of Berkeley Homes, 3033 South Parker Road in Aurora. We are very happy to, uh, to present to you the first step in what we believe is an exciting new Westminster neighborhood. We have a short presentation for the three actions that are before you tonight. Um, the process to get here tonight has taken nearly four years. Extensive thought and effort has gone into developing our plan with the input of city staff in the adjacent neighborhoods. As you can see, the plan presented tonight includes three separate properties. There is a long history of this land with some of Westminster's oldest families. What's called the center parcel was originally purchased by the storied Semper family, hence the name Semper Gardens, in 1889 and sold to the current owners, the Hudsclaw family, in 1919, over 100 years ago. Similarly, the North Parcel has been owned by the Han family since 1955. Each of these families has done, been wonderful stewards of the land over the years, but have now decided it's time for new future for these properties. Each of these properties has had various development proposals over the years, but to my knowledge, this is the first time all three properties have been commonly planned and brought before city council. We believe this is a huge benefit to the city that we'll discuss later. As you can see, there's a brief uh, look at our agenda tonight. Next slide. Who we are. Uh, Berkeley Homes is, uh, is the company I'm with and the developer of this property. 
Uh, also on our team is the Pachner Company, uh, PCS Group, and Core Engineering, some of which are here in person and also available online for any questions. Uh, next slide. Berkeley Homes is a privately owned local developer. We have been building in the Metro Denver area since 1985 and have recently built three new communities within Westminster. The first Skyline Greens at 88th and Lowell, the second one Schoenberg Greens at 73rd and Sheridan, and Connections at 88th and Yates. We are very part, proud of this great working relationship we have developed with Westminster staff and the community over the past decade and look forward to working with staff and the neighbors in the coming years as well. Marcus Parkner will go through the details of the planning process, but to begin the presentation, I wanna highlight a few things about what this plan is and what it isn't. Next slide, please. First off, what our plan does not have. Our plan does not have apartments. Our plan does not have homes taller than two stories. Our plan does not have attached homes adjacent to existing neighborhoods. And our plan does not have large water intensive use lots. What our plan does have is a diversity of different housing types meeting a wide variety of housing prices, preferences, and city staff requests. Our plan also has 6.2 acres of public land dedication that is contiguous with existing city open space. Our plan has a four-way lighted intersection at 101st Avenue in Sheridan, providing a much needed northbound turn onto Sheridan for the existing Waverly Acres neighborhood and future Semper Gardens residents. Our plan also has a cohesive integrated plan of three separate parcels with associated benefits for PLD, park space, and traffic circulation. And finally, our plan has the recommendation of staff and the Planning Commission. As you are likely aware, the Planning Commission gave their recommendations with two recommended conditions. The first, the overall density of the project be limited to 195 units or five dwelling units um, per acre across the entire project. And two, that townhomes should be prohibited within the P PDP. We believe there are two very viable and desirable plans here. The first being what is presented tonight and what is recommended by staff. And two, a similar version that incorporates the Planning Commission's restrictions. As the applicant, either of these plans is agreeable to us. With that, I will turn the rest of the presentation over to Marcus Park. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. Thank you very much. I'm Marcus Pockner, 130 Rampart Way, Denver, Colorado. I'm a land use and community outreach consultant at Berkeley. Next slide, please. I will go through the planning process. Yes, thank you very much. This is the uh, philosophy, the kind of op the process that we went through to really build the framework for collaboration with the neighborhood. I do want to say here, we did something very unique on this and the way we handled the outreach. And I'm actually going to walk you through a number of conceptual site plans. As you all know, a site plan is not before you tonight. But for our neighbors to have certainty of what we were planning, we've actually gone through a very extended over almost four years process to show them what the land use plan, what the comprehensive plan and the PDP would result in. This shows the philosophy that we use. You see, most importantly, the adjacent neighbors, Waverly Acres, Highland Meadows, which is just to the south of us, and Highland Greens, which is actually a number of neighbors are here tonight, which is across Sheridan and to the east. We then went to the broader community outreach as well. Next slide, please. This shows that unique community outreach and really how we've engaged with the community over the last four years. We did something, we hosted 14 different group meetings, and you'll see in 2019 and 2020, that we did focus group meetings. We actually met with the immediately adjacent neighbors to talk about specific issues and how we transitioned from their properties to what we were planning and what resulted from the comp plan, comp plan changes. As you will see a very rich history in your backup material, most of the objections as Jeff brought up earlier were concerns about townhomes and how that would impact the existing neighborhood. And I'll go through some of the plans and the changes, really the evolution of the site plan. Next slide, please. Folks, I'm gonna be very brief, uh, as Jeff said, to just kind of go through this and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Again, these are just conceptual land use plans, not before you, but this is what we started with, the 2019 plan. This is the first meeting we had with about a hundred neighbors. We had large lots to the north and you see that kind of burnt orange color at the south of our site, which was all townhomes. 
We talked about the uses and what that meant in the site plan. We got a lot of feedback from people about where they wanted those townhomes. They wanted only single family attached adjacent to their existing single family attached. So what we're trying to do is basically wrap the site plan into the comp plan. Next slide, please. This shows the evolution then from 2019 to 2020. And you can see there in the middle all the feedback that we garnered. They wanted to see the townhomes conversions to single family there in the south. They wanted to exere that existing edge of the single family. They wanted better trail connectivity. As you see that plan on the 2020, and you can actually go to the next slide, you start to see that we really start to focus on 2020. Again, four more, next slide please, four more focus groups to talk about the layout, to see as you see now emerging, all single family attached, uh, excuse me, detached next to the adjacent neighborhood, really looking at that north-south layout of the homes to the north to 104th, and repositioning the townhomes only along Sheridan, only along that major arterial, really moving that away from the neighborhood. Lastly, you see the transition from 2020 to 2021. I know this is painstaking. I know there's a lot of detail, but these are the concepts and the discussions that we went through with the neighborhood. Next slide, please. This shows that evolution of the plan. Again, now we've moved the townhomes only along Sheridan, and you see them transitioning on the right, north of 102nd. People did not want to see that as a transition. They wanted to see an internal park. You start to see the parkland really coming in and as a buffer to the existing community, and most importantly, what was happening on the northern edge on the PLD. Next slide, please. 2020 was focused on PLD. This is the final plan that we showed to the neighborhood where we had only 20 neighbors in attendance. It shows those smaller lots, concentrated PLD there at the north with an internal park that also acts as a buffer. Very consistent planning, only a 202 unit development, which I will show you is exactly the same number as the existing neighborhood. Next slide, please. This is the result of that community planning effort. We have all attached uh, single family uh, detached homes against existing neighborhoods. You see the larger lots there on the north. You see the smaller lots just to the north and east of the existing community. Only north of 102nd along Sheridan do you see the townhomes and then you see the paired complex. So you see four different housing types, but really honoring the feedback that we received from the neighborhood. This allowed us to put two-story product everywhere and to maximize the buffers and the setbacks. Next slide, please. This shows you then as we transition to the land use plan amendments, what Jacob focused on. This is the comprehensive plan changes. I want to show you this is the context, the regular slide that you also see. So you all see our parcel one and parcel two. Before we go further, I want to point something out. Parcel two there, the reason there are two parcels here is because 102nd is existing right away. You cannot have a different comp plan designation go over existing site or uh, city right away. So we had to have two parcels and it's actually led to our R5 and R8. Next slide, please. As you see this, we really went into great detail about what this meant. As you know, in a lot of older city zone districts, it was actually built more dense than is in the plan. So as you know, the existing neighborhood is zoned R.35, but as you see here, it's actually built to 4.1 dwelling units per acre. If you look at our site, we're actually the same density that we're proposing as a blend. That's the blend across the whole site, but again, we have to use different land use designations because of the right of way. Next slide. This actually shows in even more detail kind of our study of how we looked at that. Again, looking at the existing Waverly Acres, and then really understanding what was happening on the south. So we're again mirroring as much as we can to have better housing variety, but also honoring the existing density. Next slide, please. This then shows, you know, all you see are these complex that we're changing to R5 on the northern and R8. But you see what we're proposing here is to blend the density across the entire site to really honor the density that already exists. Next slide, please. This shows you in a lot of detail. I know it's kind of an eye chart, but if you look at it today, R3 and a half, if you look at that column, that's what's allowed today. And we are proposing R5 and R8. Just to show per year code, we are honoring all of those things, except you get down to the R8, you see that we have, we have taken out townhomes in the PDP. We did that specifically at the request of the neighbors, and we have been kept, kept the city updated on that. 
So there is not townhomes. Uh, townhomes are not allowed in the southern parcel. On the side, you see all the comp plan compliance, all the guiding documents, 27 housing, 2017 housing needs analysis, all the things that led to why this is the proper planning methods. Next slide. This actually shows, as Jeff mentioned, the planning commission recommendation. We tried to do this just so it was orderly and kind of what happened. So you see R5 and RR8, but then you see the planning commission recommendation and what they said. They said in the R5, we'd like to strike the, they recommended removing the townhomes as well and in the R8. And then you see that yellow box in the corner. They said, we want a maximum count of 195 units, which is five dwelling units across the entire parcels, right? They wanted that blended approach. We didn't want to have more density than the existing neighborhood. So we wanted to put a cap, they said, of five dwelling units across the entire site. Next slide. Mayor, council members, you certainly understand what is in uh, the rezoning and the PDP. The rezoning is being requested here for a PUD as is required. The PDP itself, the plan development, uh, is really a bubble diagram. So I just showed you all those plans that all that de detail, but this is actually what is before you in the PDP. It includes the bubble plan, the trails, the roadways, and infrastructure. But most importantly, on the right there, it does codify these things. Four different housing types with a variety of housing prices and segmented prices, the full PLD land dedication, and no townhomes in the southern price parcel. Next slide. Council members, these are the three community benefits that we have derived from this planning effort. First, I'd like to focus on the PLD and open space. We are dedicating 6.2 acres of PLD, all in land dedication. We also have additional open space. Overall, we have 40% open space on the proposed site plan. We think this is a very important benefit for the existing community and the future residents. Next slide. I didn't want to come back to this council or mayor without a full PLD, so I wanted to spoke, speak a little bit more on this. Um, this shows we're doing a land dedication of just over 6.19 acres. That does not include detention area. So when you see there, there's two detention areas. You all know this. This is such an important area. It adds to the Middle Highlands Creek uh, trail system. We will build those trails you see in the PLD, and this will connect ultimately to the Farmer's Highline Canal. Next slide, please. This shows you just kind of a couple of clicks through what that means. This is such an important view corridor there at 104. So this is the PLD that we are at adding and giving to the city and also improving with the trails. You can see the key map up on the right, looking to the west, you see that remarkable view across Middle Highlands. Next slide. This then shows that internal parkland that we will be building as part of that. So you see the amenities for the entire community. Next slide, please. Again, another view of the additional playground that's included in that. That's actually that small private park that's accessible to all. Next slide. As you all know, in the comp plan, there is a protected view corridor on 104th. This actually shows that the city had us do a view shed. And the next slide shows how we comply with that. You see maybe one home coming to that image right below that stoplight. So we are protecting that existing view corridor. You will not see homes coming into that. Area. Next slide, please. As we did on the comprehensive plan, we did the same analysis of the existing community. We are almost to the acre of the exact same percentage of PLD and open space as what's there today and what we are proposing. Again, really trying to marry the two communities. Next slide. Lastly, I just wanna show, Jeff mentioned why some of the benefits of planning this, of course, to get a complete plan, but also actually with the three parcels combined, you get more PLD than we would if we did them individually. And you also get the ability to place that PLD all on the Northern parcel to result in really the addition to the trails. Next slide. The second public benefit, I'm almost finished here, is on water efficiency and what we're proposing. The key change that we are requesting is the change from 3.5, the comp plan R3.5. And the reason for that is, as you all understand, it has a minimum of a 7,000 square foot lot, a minimum. It is required. So we have to do that in order to address housing diversity and water efficiency. These are the four plans that we are proposing as part of this. And you see the third one only has a little turf, artificial turf. The fourth one, which is our larger lot, is the only one with actually irrigated turf. We are proposing a plan now that has 26 lots with irrigated turf versus 137 lots 
over 7,000 square feet in the existing comp plan. A much more water efficient plan. As you see the comment from the city staff there that we have analyzed this impact and then find it is not a major concern. We will also meet EPA water sense requirements for our parcels. Next slide, and maybe the best for last as far as community benefits, the transportation, the infrastructure improvements that we are bringing into the site. On this slide, the blue is existing. That's 102nd that's there today. We are adding all of that infrastructure for the existing neighborhood and the future neighborhood. Most importantly, you see today that blue line, which is 102nd. What the neighbors do today is they come out to 102nd. As you know, there's a median there, so they can't go north. They go down south to 101st and flip a U-turn to go north on Sheridan. That's what happens today. Um, so we are proposing a full movement interchange there that will allow the existing neighbors and future neighbors to actually go north on Sheridan. It's a remarkable improvement for safe passage. The other thing I want to be sure and note, there's a number of neighbors here from Highland Greens across the street. They are very concerned that there will be cut through through their neighborhood. We wanted to just kind of uh, illustrate this, what happens today. The yellow line is where that cut through can happen and does probably happen today. It shows the length of that, which is certainly much longer than the direct connection. And those exits, X's are three speed bumps that are there today. The thing I want to mention is that there is a three-way there at 101st. Everybody does that today. So if they want to cut through, that already happens. The only connection we're making there is to the new residents, right, to the west. So we think that that movement is really to move north. They want to move north on Sheridan, not cut through the neighborhood. But we will work with city transportation to monitor that, to do anything. We certainly know that that's an issue. I will say that our traffic study showed that there was no additional cut-through traffic based on this site plan. Our last slide, please, next slide, is just a summary of what we're proposing. Again, respectfully requesting approvals for the comprehensive plan amendments, the rezoning, and the PDP. Folks, we did it in unison. I know it's a little bit out of order, but we did it to provide certainty to the neighbors to see what they were actually going to get. The community benefits, if you go through the slides here, this shows the PDP. The first, we used an inclusive comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. This resulted in the conceptual land plan that is before us. I think if you just click through this, it'll go through it. There you go, thank you. It shows three public benefits. The full public land dedication, next slide please. It also shows increased water efficiency with our housing typology on the next slide. And then the final slide again shows those enhanced transportation infrastructure that we're adding. We would respectfully request your support. Staff had a very detailed analysis of the two sets of approval criteria. We certainly believe we meet all of those and we respectfully request your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I've been asked before we start questions and then go to public um, hearing, if we could take a five to seven minute break. We're on break.
You need my address or just my name? Sure. Sure. You need the whole address. There's 4811 West 102nd Avenue. Cool. And it is. It's Highland Greens. And then my cell is. City Clerk, are we okay? We'll come back to order. And let me see where I am on my agenda here. Um, at this time, we'll move on to testimony from the public for this hearing. The rules and procedures from previous public hearing are still in place. And at this time, I would ask the City Clerk to please summarize the number of participants this evening and introduce our first speaker. <laughs> We have 10, or I'm sorry, 15 speakers in chambers. We have 10 virtual speakers and six voicemails. So the first speaker I'd like to call the podium is Karen Calavity. Oh, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. 
Thank you. I had already crossed us off because I didn't know we were taking a break. <laughs> Do you have questions? Okay, so now we can Councilor ask Baker. questions mm -hmm. of both the city and the applicant. Yes, and then we'll come to you public. Great. Okay. First of all, to the city, how long has the R3.5 uh, comprehensive plan designation existed? Uh, if Jacob doesn't know that answer, I know Andrew Spurgeon is listening in. Yeah, Councillor Baker, um, the R3.5 designation for this property or in just the designation in general? I'm sorry, I wasn't clear enough. For this property? Well, we know Andrew. it has at least from 2013, but how far before 2013 does it go? Sure. Um, Andrew, if you have the answer offhand, uh, I'll go ahead and let you answer. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, yeah, the, the land use designations in the comprehensive plan, uh, some of the nomenclatures changed over the years, but, but generally it's equivalent to the R35, and that has existed at least since our 1997 comprehensive plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I've always viewed the comprehensive plan as a promise to the neighbors of how the property would be developed. Is that a misunderstanding on my part? Councilor, I'll, I'll attempt to answer that one. Uh, I suppose you could call it a, pro a promise in that as the applicant is doing tonight, it requires council action to change the, the designation. Right, and so people, people make decisions based upon that, 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 that what that property is gonna become. Uh, and if I understood the testimony correctly, uh, this change would basically change from allowing 137 homes to be built in this property to 202. Is that correct? Councilman, uh, just based on the pure zoning of our comp plan, excuse me, of our three and a half, that right now would allow 137 units of 7,000 square foot minimum. Right. Lot. And that's what the R3.5 zoning is. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, if, if I could impose upon you, uh, why doesn't 103rd connect? 103rd uh, connect, sir, it does connect from our side. It's a right in, right out to Sheridan. It does. Do you mean into the no, existing? No, into river? the Waverly Acres, because yes. there's like a cul-de-sac there, and you have a cul-de-sac there. And You have a very good of, eye. Yes, sir. That was feet. actually a, um, I'll say it respectfully, a request, perhaps a demand of the neighborhood, that that not connect into the existing neighborhood. I believe that's Easton, if I remember right, or Eaton Street, that little cul-de-sac. They did not want that to connect. As you notice, all of our new traffic does not go into the neighborhood. Only the existing neighborhood traffic goes through the new proposed development. So they didn't want that loop to happen. Sir, there is an EVA, EVA emergency vehicles only there that is can happen. They can go through that. So that's the only connection, but the neighbors did not want there to be a connection. Thank you, I understand. Uh, and uh, um, the way I see, uh, if you only had 137 homes there, yeah. then you'd only have a PLD of about four acres, right? That's right, sir. 3.9, yes, if I okay. remember correctly. Okay. Uh, but the PLD you're offering, it appears to me is mostly a gully. Well, I think it's actually a trail. It's the south side of the, of the Middle Highlands, as you know, and we're actually building a trail. So for the existing neighborhood, one thing that's hard about that site, you know that open space well, sir, but 104th and Sheridan, those are arterials. It's hard to get to that, right, from a pedestrian experience. So we're actually making that connection, and then it goes on to the west there, ultimately to the Highlands. So that, I think, is a very important trail connection. Actually, looking back to all the memos that people have tried to develop this through the years, that was always the request of the city is to consolidate that open space there at PLD. Uh, it just, for most PLDs, because it's public, sure. can be used more by just then the residents of that. I mean, you have private parks for your residents, but generally PLD has a wider audience 
And yet I can't see how this trail would be used more by just then the residents. I'll defer to maybe staff on that. I think it's a very important connection. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, if it interests you, I'd like to call on our parks and open space team to, to speak to the value of the public land dedication that's being uh, requested by staff. Great, I, wonderful, because because as I said, I don't see this valuable at all. Certainly, uh, and John Dan uh, from Parks, Recreation, and Libraries is on the call now. Good evening, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm John Van. I'm one of the senior landscape architects in the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, this this site uh, and open space was a strong consideration from us for several reasons, as was also made in the presentation. First of all, um, we currently own the center line of the creek to 104th. So we don't we do not have any riparian area. Uh, buffer uh, to the creek uh, that is, so with this open space dedication that will give us we 150 foot buffer that will be very important to that corridor for both natural and riparian reasons um, it does connect to the highline trail which is heavily used by residents uh, going towards the south towards the uh, and forgive me the highland ponds area excuse me and also along 104th towards Legacy Ridge and Highlands and the, uh, excuse me, Farmers Creek Trail as it goes to the east towards North Glen. Uh, so the trail in that area will be highly used, not only by the neighborhood, but we expect a lot of use from surrounding areas and uh, trail users. Um, one of the other things that was pointed out it helps us also to continue the visual buffer. Visual buffers are one of the key features of open space properties uh, when the city acquires those. Not every open space can be used as you know, a typical park type setting. They are passive uses. A lot of those passive uses can be visual. Um, there are many open spaces that we have that you really couldn't do much with except let nature do its thing. And uh, we preserve those areas throughout the city, and we have been continuing to try and find those. And this is a nice match to an existing piece we currently have. Okay. Uh, I have not walked the intersection at Sheridan and 104th, but it's my recollection that the uh, pedestrian passageway is on the north side of 104th under Sheridan. That is correct. There is a... It so how would trails on the south side of 104th and the west side of Sheridan connect to the existing trail? Okay, it's it's very confusing, quite frankly. Um, so there is an underpass for the Farmer Highline Trail about a quarter of a mile west of Sheridan. And it, it comes underneath Sheridan Boulevard and comes up on the west side of the existing homes. Uh, that trail then continues southward to Highland Ponds. Uh, and Jacob, you can correct me if I got the name of, of something there wrong. So you are correct. There is not a direct underpass at Sheridan. The reason that can't happen is we have major utilities under the intersection at Sheridan. Along that ditch, we have a huge, I believe it's a water line, not sanitary line, maybe sanitary too but there's a large water line that would prevent any kind of underpass in that corner, uh, which would be the north, uh, be the southeast, southwest corner. Uh, be very difficult to try and do a trail. Right. I, I do really remember us working on the 104th water line for a long time, it seems like. But, it was uh, a big hole. That goes back <laughs> oh, to my question. <laughs> How does the east end of this PLD connect to the existing trail system? The east end of this PLD. So like the Sheridan termination of this PLD. Okay, so you would, to, to get to the trail system, you would either cross Sheridan using crosswalks and the pedestrian lights, or you would proceed west on the main trail along the south side, go underneath the underpass, and then come back up 
on the farmers, because the actual farmers Highline trails on the north side of 104th, if you look at the trail maps for the city. And so this crossing, uh, it would be a crossing of 104th uh, to get to the north side of 104th. Where does that end on the uh, south side of 104th? You said it's west, a quarter mile west, a half mile west? About a quarter of a mile west, right where the existing homes end, um, along the Highland Creek, there's an underpass. It goes from the south side of 104th to the north side of 104th. So in other words, it really connects from the west end of this PLD, not the east end. Correct. Okay. And where does where does the east end of this PLD connect to the south? The east end of the PLD would be yeah. bumping up in here. Okay, like you said, it went to Highlands Ponds, or were you talking about the west end of the PLD? The west end. All of, all okay. of our main... So in other words, if I'm west. visualizing this correctly, and maybe the owner or the developer can jump in, this whole PLD is just a dead end. So I, I just provide our answer there from the west side, sir. That the, the, so go through our site. So our east side is Sheridan. Correct. So we're providing trail connections all along there as shown in our plans. And we take it the entire length of our property. I just want to say that we can't do trails off of our site. But the western edge of our site is actually public land to that. Right? That's part of the city trail system. So during the ODP, if we move forward, we will bring trail connections that show that. So it is not a dead end. We are making a very important trail connection that heads to the west and then can cross under 104th and join all of those trails that you mentioned. So this is actually the missing link that we're providing. It provides it for all along Sheridan and across 104th to the existing trailheads. Sir, there may be a slight gap, I do wanna say that, right, from what's there today, but that's PLD land that you all own, so we wanna to work together to try to close that. But everything on our site, we are building trails to have that connection. Okay, but again, it goes back to my observation that these are gonna be for the residents who live here, and generally there's no way that the bulk of the population of Westminster is going to get this. You don't need to beat a dead horse. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have is, aren't there three exceptions being asked even under the R8 and R5 designated? There are three exceptions. Jacob probably knows them better, but I'm happy to go through any questions. Well, have. Jacob can do them, that's fine. Yeah. Jacob, will you speak yeah. to the exceptions? Sure. Um, so there are three requested exceptions um, right now from the developer. <clears throat> And the first um, is requiring, uh, sorry, let me pull them, pull them all up here. So the first exception is one that can actually be approved administratively. So we're just marking it on the PDP um, as a way of keeping track of it being approved administratively. And that is on parking um, and under the city code, the planning manager has the authority to reduce the parking requirement for neo-traditional um, developments. And so they're seeking a, a alleviance on the parking requirement for uh, single family detached homes. And this would only apply to the alley loaded homes um, so they don't all have to have driveways. Um, city code requires two driveway spaces and two garage spaces for every single family detached home. The second request um, is to remove the requirement Why to can interrupt. Sure, Councillor. Why did we think that was a good thing to do? It is consistent with other um, applications of that uh, administrative uh, a, a, a approval that we have made for both previous R5 and R8 developments in the city. So that's connected with the changing to R5 and R8, because I see that as a net very negative value, a very negative value. We have a lot of car thefts in the city. We have a lot of thefts of cars. We have a lot of thefts from things in cars. And if people have really garages to park cars in, 
or at least driveways in their front of the yard, I would tend to think that's going to limit that. Plus, it also gives visitors a place to park and stuff like this, where all these alley loaded product would have to park in the public streets. And it looks like a lot of these uh, alley loaded ones are sort of, uh, instead of the front yard facing the street, the, the front entrance faces the side. So you'd have to park in the street and then walk however many units well, down to get I, to I want to be very clear. Every one of these units will have two spaces in a garage. So nobody's changing that. Okay, so but we you're not have, having any other spaces. So, so it's an alley load. So as you know, on an alley, you don't tradition, traditionally have a driveway, right? Because it's an alley. You're pulling into the garage. We still, sir, have to provide guest parking and meet all the code requirements for that. The only thing I would say, and I, I see your point about kind of the way they face, that again is actually pretty specific to the neighborhood. The neighbors actually want to see the side of a home, right? So they're only seeing one home instead of a number of homes against them. So actually we've laid that out in coordination with the neighbors that are just to the west of us to really look at protecting their view. So that's a specific thing we work through with the neighbors. Okay. Really, Mr. Kaza, you can go to number two and three. And sure. The um, the second requested exception is to remove a requirement to construct earthen berms in the setbacks adjacent to existing residential uses. Um, staff is supportive of that exception because we do not think earthen berms would serve the same purpose that they were intended to. Um, this uh, requirement we don't think necessarily was really intended to be played out in this scenario uh, with the homes. And we also believe that with the change in grade that's pretty drastic on this property that the earthen berms would not actually achieve the screening effect that they that the purpose is intended for. Um, the third uh, ex requested exception is to allow uh, for limited grading within the PLD area as shown on the P PDP and the ODP. Um, that it would allow the developer to both construct the trails that this this PDP would require them to build. Um, and I would note that those that trail is actually shown on the city's trails master plan. So it, it is a required city trail um, under our trail master plan. Uh, but the, the allowing grading in that PLD would allow for both the trail connection and then the utility connections, which um, the city's utilities for uh, sewer are inside of the creek and also they'll need to connect across our property and the PLD with their drainage system as well. Um, so this is kind of just a clarifier that um, it, it is okay for them to do that because city code does have a stipulation that there should be no grading in PLD, um, which I think is largely meant to say you can't change the PLD to support your, to, you know, regrade your development and make your place taller or shorter. Okay, and this really grading is because of the steepness of like the slopes of the gully? Uh, correct, so that property does have um, quite a uh, drastic change in grade from the upper end at 102nd to the uh, lower end down in the creek. And so ch allowing that grading um, on that slope would allow for an even flat trail and then the utility connections. Well, I mean, you are really speaking of the east-west change in elevation. I was, I was thinking of the north-south change. And doesn't it go up almost 30 feet in, uh, what, what, about 100 feet? Doesn't it go up nearly 30 feet in it, a it, lateral run it of does. 150? It, it does. They're making up a lot of the grade by doing uh, walkout homes as their proposal. So they'll have walkout um, basements there that make up for a large change in that grade. So their grading isn't um, in on the PLD is not to allow for those walkout homes. It's it's uh, about the trail and about the utilities. Okay, and really where would the berms have gone according to city code? So they would go in the setback area along the Western property boundary and then the Southern, the two Southern uh, property boundaries adjacent to um, a hun adjacent to the existing Waverly Acres and Highland Meadows neighborhoods. Okay, so in other words, instead of have in 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 other words, instead of Waverly Acres having a berm behind their house, Waverly Acres will now look at the side of a townhome or a 
Don't call them counts. So the berm would have only been three feet or four feet tall. So it, it wouldn't have even gone above their existing fence. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Uh, when we talk about, well, the diversity, I've always viewed of diversity of housing as a citywide thing and not squeezed into any individual neighborhood. It's like we generally don't have neighborhoods of uh, single family homes and duplexes and triplexes all run together. We generally have one in a neighborhood, sure. one species of home, and then maybe in the next neighborhood over we change. So, sir, that's actually why we did the comparison of the existing neighborhood. Waverly Acres has lots as small as 3,000 square feet, and they are over R3.5. That was just the land designation, so they're actually over four. Immediately south of us is Highland Meadows. It is R8, and it has lots down to 3,000 as well and has townhomes there. So that is all one neighborhood showing that. So we're actually exactly matching the context of the neighborhood. It is not a single-family neighborhood only. It actually has a variety of housing typology. The only thing I would say to you respectfully is that we have to look at these infill sites. Respectfully, sir, these three sites were annexed in 1970. They have not developed because they won't develop as R3 and a half sites. Sheridan has changed, 104th has changed. Large lot single family won't develop there. You actually want a buffer for that existing neighborhood. We're actually providing a better housing variety to protect the existing neighborhood and still allow all the transitions. They only see single family or detached homes. So they have the same product they see, and then we buffer the traffic on shared. So I actually think your plans say this is how we're supposed to orderly plan the city. And we're trying to follow that guidance. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and what do you, and what do you expect the prices of these homes to be? Sure. Um, I might have to have Jeff and I think, sir, at least we have, other neighborhoods, right? To look at that again, we want segmented. So we have a number of housing types. Jeff, I don't know if you could give a good answer. Uh, I can attempt to, obviously, as we know, construction costs and everything are increasing quickly here, but our intent at this time would be townhomes probably starting in the 400s and then going up in staggered steps based on the different housing types from there. Okay, and so what were the single-family homes on the north end of the property? Right? Those are probably in the eight to nine hundred thousand. Eight to nine thousand. And if you had built all, if you had instead of building two hundred and two, some at eight hundred thousand and some at four hundred thousand up, if you had built one hundred and thirty-seven single-family homes, what what would those have sold for? That's difficult to answer because I don't think this project. A lot of the things that are being accomplished by this project wouldn't wouldn't be feasible with that. The PLD, the traffic signal, some of the traffic connections. So it, it, it's hard to come up with a hypothetical plan that when there's one that can't exist today. Okay. And how does this compare to uh, the homes on the east side of Sheridan? Um, I, I know that the zoning there is an R, is an R three and a half. Um, so I'd assume they're okay. they fall within that. And how does the neighborhood compare uh, with your neighborhood of mostly non-existent lawns or artificial turf lawns and a few homes that have a lawn? I'm not sure I understand your question. So. Well, it's my memory that all the homes on the east side of Sheridan have beautiful landscaped lawns. I, and I, yours wouldn't have really any of those at all. Well, I think be it's more... important to differentiate, though. That what we're saying is on the on lot that we're limiting the landscape to either uh, hardscapes, artificial turf, zero scape. But there are common areas, too, common front yards. The way these homes are developed are it's, it's really a shared front yard that's maintained by the HOA, irrigated by the HOA. Um, that gives them, um, one, a better water efficient use because you have one water provider. It's not everyone having their own separate irrigation taps. Um, so it's not, I don't want to give the impression that it's a, a, a concrete jungle or something like that. It'll still be a very nice uh, landscape community. It's just who is maintaining that landscaping and how is that water efficiently used? Okay, thank you. Welcome. Mr. Mayor, that takes care of my questions. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Sarah or Councillor Nermella. Thank you, Mayor. Um, okay, so I had some questions that I did submit to staff prior to this, but I also have some additional questions that came up with the um, applicant presentation. And so I, I'm going to, since you're standing up there, Mr. Pockner, I'm going to ask you a few of them. Um, with respect to, so I'm just trying to understand the, um, the, the graphic that you showed, I think on slide 44, where you were kind of building up the slide, the comparison of densities um, between Waverly Acres and the, um, and the proposed development, you said they were both 4.01 DUs per acre. Um, was that, um, if you could show that, I'm trying to, because yeah. I'm thinking, but what, uh, Planning Commission asked for was five units the acre of the whole site. So I'm trying to figure sure. out. Council, I think it's actually slide 11. So we had a number of them lay over it. So oh. this slide are like the pure districts, if you will, right? The R3 and a half and then shows R5 and R R8. The next slide shows the blend. And Council, uh, I think, sorry, I think that's like a slide you just have to click to go over that. Go back one, please. So then okay, go forward, next slide. <laughs> there you go. And then just hit next slide. It should show kind of the evolution of that. I think you have to put it in, uh, in PowerPoint mode so you can do that. But Councilman, I'll answer it. So it what we did is a further analysis of this, right? What I showed is that it actually didn't get built at four, three and a half. So the existing Waverly Creek is at 4.01. And the existing neighborhood to the south, Highland Meadows, is over seven. And I'm sorry, I don't have it right in front of me, seven point something. So what we're showing is that ours is, our combined two plot, our two parcels right now are at 5.18. Okay, so, so when we work through that, that's at what we're our 5.18 dwelling units per acre. Planning Commission came back and said, we'd actually like to cap that at five, was their suggestion. So we're... But you had a graphic that showed they were four point. They were both four point oh one. Yeah, Jeff can talk to it. Sorry, we're gonna find it there. <laughs> we had done an analysis that also included. I think your question, Councillor, was how did we show something of four? I think it said four point oh one. Yeah, I'd like to correct that. It should have said four point five eight. But we had included the area along one hundred and fourth. That previously was condemned by the city, and uh, I, I forget what year that was condemned to show sort of historically, if you went back and looked at how you would calculate the combination of Waverly Acres and Highland, Highland Meadows together as one, as it wrapped around us and we wrapped around them, to give sort of a context of what this would look like, apples to apples with the similar math, and that brought up a blended density between. Um, Waverly Acres and Highland Greens of 4.01. I think if you look at them independently, Waverly Acres is about 3.7 and um, Highland Meadows is about seven point something. So that was really um, an exercise we were doing that apparently has managed to confuse everyone more than clarify, so I apologize for that. And then as Marcus mentioned, the, the, the plan, the, the planning commission recommended would bring our proposed unit count from 202 to 195. And that was five dwelling units per acre over mm -hmm. the three parcels combined together. Okay. I'm hoping I answered that and not so confusing. Yeah, I'm just gonna disregard that slide. Okay. Okay. Um, what, uh, does anybody know what the density of the, you know, the little portion of the southern, southern portion of the site that had already had a PUD on it, what the density was on that? Um, Councillor Anamella, I can answer that. Um, it was built under the R3.5 designation. Um, so it, it was 13 um, dwelling units planned on it. I can run the numbers really quick if you want the density. No, it's, I mean, sounds like 3.5-ish. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, Okay, one question for um, the applicant too is, I see, 
I see your, or I heard you were trying to respond to the community's desire for more park space. Um, I'm wondering why the park, the private park is located kind of not in a very accessible place for the community to be able to access it. Um, like if I would assume it would be more accessible if it were off of 102nd. We can go to slide 10, please. Um, so Councilwoman, I think that our response to that was trying to consolidate that internal park there. Neighbors wanted to have that as a buffer, right, that's there. I think I, I understand your comment that kind of made that transition to have the interior buffer to those existing neighbors to the west. And really, our 102nd that's there today, that's a pretty highly traveled road. So we wanted to have that park a little more. So yeah, I, I understand your comments. I think that was just, again, reflective of what the neighborhood kind of requested. Okay, so the neighbors didn't want it off 102nd? Okay. Just seeing, we, we, Council, I don't know this, I'm sorry, in the PDP, as you know, we have to bring back a master ODP. So mm -hmm. we certainly can look at some flexibility if that's not designated as such. So I just want to say it's so hard to show you all a site plan because we really planned it with the neighbors, but that's not before you. So if we can make those changes, we understand it and hear you about making that a little more accessible for all the neighbors. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the... Uh, other thing that I noticed about the site plan, which sorry, I looked at it, um, <laughs> is the connections to the trail, uh, not only the one that would go west towards into the public open space, but um, also the separated sidewalk that kind of ends at the PLD portion of the northern parcel. Um, can you connect? Would you look at connecting both of those to the trail that you're proposing? Yes, I think that's the thought. We're looking at ways to do that. Again, Councilman, there is such a grade change there, as you know, sloping to the north there. Mm -hmm. So the grading and a lot of that is really to be determined how we can make those connections. So you're right. We were just looking for existing additional access points to that trail. So yes, we will certainly. Look at that. Okay, because I would imagine, you know, if I were just trying to get down to the trail, which is an amazing connection. You know, if I'm coming from the south, I wouldn't want to have to go through another neighborhood to get to that. A completely that fair point. Yeah. You see it here, Councilwoman. Mm -hmm. I think what you're suggesting is make that connection, right, but also along Sheridan. Yeah. Right? How important that is. We couldn't agree more. And then back to that cul-de-sac question, you can see one thing we did do there is actually make a trail connection for that existing neighborhood. So although our cars can't connect, they can walk through it as they should to connect to that trail as well. And don't get me started about the cul-de-sac because that is the worst planning ever and it is not indicative of good planning. Um, I really would recommend that we don't do that. Um, it is, that was, yeah. Okay. I understand. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go to my questions that I had asked of staff. Um, in the agenda memo, um, I thought I saw that city staff negotiated specifically to have townhomes on the property. Is this true? And what was the reasoning, if so? And why did the planning board not support having townhomes? Jacob, will you address those questions from earlier today? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, so, Councillor Novella, that's correct. We do have um, a requirement in the PDP to construct townhomes. So, that's on the second page under general design standards, project standards, um, and that's attachment five of the agenda memo. <clears throat> Um, and that's the that's where the the requirement is for four types of housing, and we spell it out there. So one of the main reasons staff is supportive of the comprehensive plan amendments um, is that R five and R eight allow for a greater variety of housing types, specifically townhomes and condominiums. Increasing the variety of housing is both a common topic in the 2013 comprehensive plan and a goal of the affordable and workforce housing strategic plan. The Affordable and Workforce Housing Strategic Plan states on page 23, make the city's balanced housing intentions known to the development community and build these goals into PUD negotiations and approvals, end quote. So um, that's similar to analysis or similar logic that we've applied on other comp plan amendments in the past. Um, in, in this instance, we're actually getting a guarantee out of the developer that they will construct um, a diversity, a, that diversity of housing in their, in their development itself. Um, 
So uh, one of the last things is on the planning commissioners. It seemed that they really only made that choice based off of either trying to get other planning commissioners to come from a no vote to a yes vote because the vote on the PDP was and the, the vote from the planning commission was four to three recommendation of approval. Um, that so I so some of it was the people who wanted to vote yes wanted to see if they could convince other people to vote yes as well. And then the other portion is the neighborhood, um, largely the, the neighborhood who's vocal is not in support of townhomes. There's townhomes right along Sheridan, right? Just to the south? Um, yes, yeah, so Highland Meadows has townhomes and um, High, uh, Highland Village also has townhomes. Okay. Um, so and there's also townhomes north on Sheridan and there's also townhomes east on 104th. Okay. So there's also townhomes west on 104th too. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. I got the question regarding the overall density on the project. Uh, if you were to combine the north and south, um, so the applicant has said that they would, um, they could work with the five units to the acre. Is that right? Um, the site plan and PDP are a little hard to discern whether 101st is a through connection into Waverly Acres. Can someone clarify that? Sure. So 101st is a little confusing today, right? It's a three-legged intersection, right? It goes south, north, and east, right? So we'll make it a full movement. So it will go west into Waverly Acres, right? So as you know, that connection doesn't happen today. So that'll come through into the existing neighborhood and into our site plan. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it looks like, oh. Can I add on to that to just to explain? I, Cause I, I understood what you asked in your question. Um, so it, 101st will stop at Ames, take a north at 90 degrees and then take another 90 degree turn west and then 101st will continue. And so it jogs for a little bit and that's mostly to make up for grade on that portion. So that, that way the uh, 101st is not super steep all the way straight down into Waverly Acres. So it does have a slight jog and an offset, but it will connect to Benton Street. And, and then is it aligned with 100th Court or is it does it jog? I know sometimes yeah. those alignments can cause accidents if they're not. So um, it's current in, in this PDP and in the um, site plan they're showing you, it's offset. Yeah. Not, so not directly aligned at that street you're asking about. I would have our streets folks just look at that and evaluate whether that's um, the best choice. Um, okay. Um, okay, I, I had shared a, a rant, my rant on the lack of connectivity on the north side between the neighborhoods. I live right next to a connection between two neighborhoods. It works. It's great. Um, <laughs> it's what we should be doing in all of our neighborhoods. Um, I saw a community concern in the comments regarding a special tax district. I'm assuming there are no special tax districts, districts proposed for this site. There are not any proposed on the site. Okay. Um, Sorry, these are not, not any particular order. <laughs> I'm concerned about the distance I'm seeing between the units. So um, particularly those facing on the Paseos, my, um, I'll just, you know, this is one of my pet peeves is when houses are just crammed right facing into each other. Um, what guidelines will the project use? Could we, since you're, you know, benefiting from the city's, um, allowance for um, more small lot types of parking solutions. Can you be looking at using TMUND design guidelines as they pertain to small lot homes? Yes, I think in, in the three communities we've done in Westminster, we've, well, it doesn't necessarily fit TMUND to a T, we've used that as sort of the guiding principle uh, and use that as the reference point for things just like you're talking about. So as we mentioned, this, this is just a context plan right now. As we get into more of those details, we will be looking at those guidelines as we go through that. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Councillor, if I can add on to that. So this development would be regulated by the single family detached design guidelines and the single family attached, de sorry, design standards and the single family attached design standards. Um, we can apply the TMUN design guidelines um, if that's the direction from city council. It would come in the form of basically a PUD negotiation and those those separate standards or guidelines would then be built into the P PUD, into the PDP and the ODP and um, would be up for review again as well. Yeah, I just think that the single family design guidelines as they are do not address some of the things like homes facing onto Paseos. And so um, that livability factor is, is addressed in TMON. So I just wanted to make sure that's thought through. Um, okay, I, I saw multiple concerns from community members and Highland Greens regarding 101st and cut through traffic. Um, I will admit I tried that once and I got completely lost. Um, so, but I know that other people do that. So um, I'm just curious to hear what can be done to mitigate speeding through the neighborhood, particularly adjacent to the uh, Hampshire Park that was mentioned. Uh, Dave Downing, Counselor. Uh, I believe during the applicant's presentation, not only did they show that that's a longer distance to travel uh, if you're going north to 104th and east, but there's three existing uh, speed tables uh, that were installed 20 something years ago, including one at the park, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so there's already three there. I'll also add this, Counselor. Uh, you know, I, my my personal observation over the decades has been that there might be one hour of the 24-hour day when people might be tempted to cut through that direction. That's the PM peak hour mm -hmm. when traffic backs up from the signal at 104th, uh, and that could be an issue at that time if the destination is somewhere east from that point, but I think it's one of those it's one of those situations where if it's not that kind of congestion, people will try it once and never do it again because it's much easier to go up to 104th and uh, go east from that point. Thank you. It's true. I was deterred, but um, I think yeah, having the intention to um, just to make sure that it, it it is not increased and maybe you know if they're 20 year old speed mums maybe they're they've been paved over enough where they're kind of you know speed suggestions um so maybe we could look at how well they're functioning um and finally i saw some comments regarding the bald eagles that reside on the property uh what <laughs> yeah. where are they can we just like save their tree or no, I don't know what, are, what can be done there. Yeah, Councilwoman, I know that there are a number of old, um, uh, unfortunately dead trees that are on site. You can probably think of them there. Um, we've uh, agreed and work with staff that we will do as we go through the ODP in the analysis. But what well, we said, they're not nesting there at all. They actually come there during the day. So we've all kind of watched that. So there are, they come there, they are not nesting, but we've gone through that analysis and we'll continue. Have you done a sort of a biological um, study to? We we will per the ODP. We will do that. Okay. So we've had that discussion. We've and actually a bunch of the neighbors have said no. They come during the day. They're not nesting there. But we will do that per discussions with city staff during the day. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Izadi. Thank you, Mayor. So I love a lot of things about this plan. And Marcus, you know where I'm going with this, I think. <laughs> there, Terrific, thank there's you. There's one obvious, very clear question that it's a leading question, but I do want to give you some affirmation there that I am open to a logical answer to this. I'm open-minded to this, but the range of prices. Sure. I think I heard 500, 900. Thousand. My very leading question is, who is this neighborhood for? Sure. 
Sir, I would tell you, Councilman, and I so respect your question. We are doing everything we can in appropriate zone districts to make housing more attainable. As you will have heard and will hear in public testimony and have seen in all the backup, people are really reacting to the townhomes. That's actually the most attainable product we have on site. We need more density to make them even more affordable. So, sir, I think we are adding more attainability into this neighborhood to the extent that we can that honors the underlying comp plan and makes reasonable changes. To go to full, more affordable, statutory affordable housing, I think we'd have to have even more density there. So a direct question is, we think this is actually for missing middle housing for people to move up to maybe buy their first home. We think we're actually providing equitable housing and equitable transportation. Um, we think we're really starting to add to the housing variety where it's appropriate. So I wish we could go further, but we're going, I think, honestly, as far as we can. And we've gotten a lot of pushback to go to that most attainable. Product. Thank you for that logical answer. Um, that's, that's where I, my head was going with that, too. There's not a single unit of affordable housing in this plan. Um, however, the, the supply is still necessary across the spectrum of real estate to eventually lower the prices across the board. Because the bigger question here for all of these developments is how are we going to address our, our housing crisis, right? This neighborhood is not, from what I've heard, it's not for millennials. It's not for fixed income. It's not for our elderly. It's not for low income. It's not for our homeless. It's there's a very specific price range, a high price range that this is for. And quite frankly, you know, I'm extremely disappointed in that. Um, but I do understand that from the rest of the plan, it's the traffic mitigation is great. The trails are great. Um, the placement of this is great. It's just wrapping my head around this lack of care almost to even try. And you've, you've mentioned neighborhoods, um, I'm sorry, neighbors, right? My last question here is just, is there, and maybe city attorney can help out, is there actually something preventing you, for example, to bring some neighbors here to actually tell us? Because a lot of your explanations were neighbors, the neighbors told, told us to do this. How do we know that's true? Yeah, sure. And I'll just say, I think as you saw in the backup uh, letters and commentary, actually every time we did a neighborhood meeting or a focus group, you all got very specific letters about that site plan, right? So I think you see that evidence. And actually those studies, we made submittals to the city during each of those processes. So Councilman, it would be reflected in those staff comments, what we heard. I get it. We don't go do public charrettes, right? We still do planning, but infill is hard right and infill against an adjacent community is hard so i think we've tried to really guide be guided by the neighborhood and still honor those underlying planning documents to get the best plan possible hey thanks sure mayor pro tem uh, maybe council councilor Adler. Uh, just a couple of quick questions a lot of them have been asked um, uh, there was examples of townhome locations and condominiums in Westminster, uh, and this probably is a question more for staff, um, but of those locations for zoning, um, how many of those, if we know, um, have changed to accommodate a development such as that? You may have to repeat that question, Councillor. I'm not. I, I didn't wrap my head around it. I'm waiting. To, I'm waiting for a volunteer from my staff to jump in. I, I can answer the question. Uh, uh -huh. Dave. Uh, makes I'll sense. On, it makes sense in my head. I, I, meant, I meant to say I'll call on Jacob to answer that question. Sure. Sure. So that that's attachment nine of the uh, agenda memo packet that I believe you're referencing, Councillor Emmons. Um, I that was put together uh, largely to address. Uh, comments that we had heard about the appropriateness of R5 and R8 in adjacency to R3 and a half development. 
um, for that analysis. And I will admit it was about a half day quick analysis on my part to come up with 30 some odd locations where we have this as an existing condition. Um, I did not do an analysis to see if those had been changed. Most of those developments pr actually predate our 2013 comprehensive plan. Um, and we have since uh, at least 2017 only processed uh, one amendment to increase density to either R5 or R8, and that was for the Uplands development. Um, so a lot of these were built pre uh, the 2013 comprehensive plan and possibly even before the 1997 comprehensive plan. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, 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 other quick questions. Um, does any of these locations that proposed have ranch style homes? We don't currently show any ranch style homes. Um, I think that we're looking, the one thing we do have is a maximum height, right? We wanted to be sure everything is no more than two stories. Um, we're uh, again, kind of looking at the design as you can, as you know, how popular that is. And some of those views looking, I will say that walkout basement, you know, they talked about that on the north and looking to the west, there might be some opportunities there. So we're keenly aware of that. And Berkeley certainly does have that product. Okay. And forgive me, I probably was taking notes and you probably have answered this already, but the, uh, the townhomes are included in this proposal, correct? Yes, uh, Councillor. The townhomes are included in the R5 portion. Okay. Um, and I just, I'm sorry to make it so confusing, but we had already taken them out of the R8 uh, section. So south of 102nd, again, in coordination with really the planning efforts and the way, but so they're proposing that uh, the staff recommended our site plan shows that there are townhomes allowed in the R5 zone district. So north of 102nd. Okay. And there was a condition in the, uh, Planning Commission vote that said no more than five dwelling units per acre and no townhomes. So I'm curious as to why we're not following that if that was a condition proposed. Sure. Uh, Councillor, the uh, I guess to put it very simply, staff's opinion is different from that of the slight majority of the Planning Commission. Jacob, could you uh, shed some more light on that, please? Uh, sure, sure, Dave. Um, so, Councillor, um, so city staff's recommendation and the original PDP as proposed by the applicant are under consideration for city council tonight. Um, that condition is a recommendation by the planning commission that this is their recommendation that you should adopt or you should approve the PDP with these conditions. So that's only a recommendation by the, that body. You are the approving authority. So it's ultimately your decision as city council to decide um, approval of the PDP and your decision to decide whether there should be that condition. That's, that's, their, uh, that's the planning commission's um, a, a pin, a, you know, their recommendation, it's not staff's recommendation. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all my questions for now. Mayor Pro Tem. So question for the applicant on the <clears throat> um, recommendation of the uh, Planning Commission. Did I hear you uh, mention that you would be willing to meet those requirements of City Council? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, we are um, willing to meet either either one of those proposals. Okay. Um, couple, one other question for you and then a question for staff on the, you mentioned, so there's going to be HOA. Is it one HOA for the whole thing or are there going to be multiple HOAs between products? I'm looking at Jeff, so I might as well let him answer. You haven't really got to the details of that yet, but the intent, the hope would be it'd be one HOA for the entire community. There may be a differing due structure based on, you know, the needs of a particular housing. Structure. We're probably too early to even judge what that might cost for I, I can tell you in similar communities that have alleys and common open space, they tend to run about $125. Okay, great. Um, so then a question along the lines of what Councillor Zadi was talking about. So um, understanding that missing middle sometimes is uh, affordable to working families that don't qualify for what is considered affordable and, and federally backed or subsidized product. What is kind of that medium pricing that we're seeing today in the in the Denver metro area for single family and potentially townhome single family or however you look at that 
I'll ask any of the planning staff who might have some insight onto that if you could step forward, because I don't. Um, Andrew, if you happen to know those uh, numbers, I do not know the median price for a single uh, townhome. Uh, I don't have that information. The only thing I can add, and it's just adding it if it helps, is we all talked about how Shaw Heights is now averaging over $500,000 per sale. We think that 400000 that starting point on the townhome, is uh, probably the neighborhood, existing neighborhood is in that price point or a little higher. So just as a scale, right, of kind of what's there. But again, we think that, I know, sir, like attainability, right? But that's to get that segment at price point, that certainly is the most attainable we think we can get on the site. That, that's helpful. What I'm, I mean, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at, yeah. understanding like the neighborhood. I live in average starts around mid fives now, which you know, 10 years ago, they were 170. So trying to understand how this fits into what the current market is. But it sounds like it's kind of that entry level home for- I family. think that's right. And we're really looking at that kind of move up, right? I mean, there's duplexes, paired homes, as we call them, the smaller lot and the larger lot. Jeff was really kind and didn't give a full answer. If this was all large scale, they would have to be well over a million dollars to make that work, right? If it was just 137 lots. So we think we're adding four other price points below that, which we think is really important for Westminster. And last question on this, um, and I, if it, I'm sure it's in the packet and I missed it, school districts, have they been reached out to and do they have, a, have they weighed in or not answered on this proposal? I'll defer to say, I know they were part of the referral agency. We've worked with them. We've not had any specific comments come back to us with any concerns. So, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Demott, I can answer that question. This is Jacob Kaza again. Um, so, yes, we did reach out to the school district. This would all go into Jefferson County School District um, for there. They have adequate capacity. This is what they stated in their letter back to us. They have adequate capacity for both uh, primary education, middle school, and uh, high school education at all of their facilities for the presumed population of this development. Great. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Some questions I still have sure. with the two right turns in or out. After watching a neighborhood have to escape, and this is around um, open space, which sometimes has tall weeds. And if they people had to go to the north to get away from, or however they had to escape, and you, only, you have two accesses that can only take you south, you can't go north. I don't feel good about that. So I know the furthest one is closer to 104th, so that's probably not good. I couldn't tell if it lines up with Sunrise because I'm sure those people would love to be able to get in and out of Sunrise. Um, but can there be another stoplight? at one of those locations? Oh, good, you showed up. Uh, our transportation engineer, Heath Klein, can, can speak to that item. When he's finished, good evening. Also. Yeah, good evening, council, <clears throat> and thank you, Mayor. So I guess the question of regarding whether an access of <clears throat> like a hundred and, second or 103rd Avenue could be a signal. There's always, you can always build a traffic signal. Now, will it meet requirements for spacing to keep progression along Sheridan uh, moving? Now that's where it comes into a question. So our standards on a major arterial is that we do not have a signalized intersection within a quarter mile of another signalized intersection, <clears throat> unless there is a large demand, which along this corridor, we have 104th and then we have 105th going into our rec center. And so that, that was a, a primary driver. At this point in time, it, the side street, which is 103rd, would not meet the warrant for another traffic signal at 103rd Avenue. So you've got 400 people having one place to get out. I just think so that's crazy. But we, that's we have four. 
I apologize, that there's actually four accesses for what would be proposed. If this, if this development was to move forward, there's a new access that's a right in, right out for 103rd. 102nd is, a, is right in, right out. So that's our second point. Then 101st would be signalized, and that is a full movement. So you could go north or south. And then we also have the 100th Avenue uh, that was on the south side of Highland Meadows. And that right is a full movement access as well. So you can turn and get north if you needed to from there as well. But the people that are living the furthest north have the furthest to try to get out of there. And there's only one main street to get out of there. So, uh, and you've got the people from Waverly who have to come out their one way. I, it just looks like a nightmare to me. I just have to say it on record. I don't like it, but um, so to move forward, oh, to move forward and I'll get to your questions. Um, do you need direction from us about T-Mund and townhomes? Or are you just going to go with what you want? Mayor, and I'll, I'll see if the city attorney agrees with me on this one. Uh, what we would need tonight would be either affirmation or not of the conditions. This is assuming a, a positive vote from council. We would need affirmation or not to the conditions that the planning commission placed on, uh, on their approval. Does that answer your question or not? So the planning commission said no townhomes. So you'd go with that because that's what they recommended or that we have to say that we go with, concur with the planning commission's vote. Is that what you're saying? Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the proposed action tonight would be to, uh, approve the development proposal with the townhomes. So if council wanted to uh, exclude that, they would specifically have to designate it that as a condition of their approval. Is that correct? Um, that's correct. If if the city council wanted that condition, they would have to make that condition their, uh, yourself. And what about t -Mund? And I know um, they so said they don't follow it to the nth degree, but there's parts of it that they would like to use. Um, I think an informal uh, straw poll uh, vote to say that you would like this developer to incorporate TMUN will give staff the guidance that we should start our, our negotiations and review incorporating some of the TMUN principles. Um, we still have some questions. Councillor Emmons. Yes. So wrapped around the townhomes, why did we go townhomes versus condos? Because there's there's a distinct difference, and especially with price point. There is, I, I think, just construction defects, to be honest. So uh, town, town or condos are not prohibited, right? Uh, I don't know that anybody made that distinction at all. We just haven't, unfortunately, been able to do condos because of construction defects. Thank you. Councillor Baker. Thank you. Uh, just two more questions. One is, uh, are you going to require owner-occupied properties or could these end up being rental properties? I think that's one of the beauties of having an HOA is we can enforce things like that. These are all for sale properties. Um, Jeff, I'm sure you have restrictions today that limit the number if there could be rentals or other people occupying those. I know that's what you're asking, so. Are, are it? Certainly, our intent is not to rent them ourselves, but it, but there's not, at least we don't anticipate something that would preclude someone from buying and renting years down the road. Now, the HOA, as Marcus said, they self-police that themselves further down the road, uh, but typically we don't put that in place. And what was the square footages of the two, two classes of, or Classes of property, the square footage range of the homes. Yeah, the homes. Um, they're, I mean, they're not designed yet, but I would say the townhomes probably range in the thirteen to sixteen hundred square foot range, 
um, and then sort of stagger their way up from there, the paired homes, um, probably in the 16 to 1900, the smaller lot, uh, single family, probably just over 2000, and then the larger lot above that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, so let's see where everybody is. So whoever's gonna make the motion knows what to include or not include. Mayor, if I could. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. I, I recommend- I'll put this away. Yes, we'll when, come back when to it. the time comes for council deliberation, <laughs> absolutely, council has authority to consider conditions right. or not. Um, but first I would recommend opening the Perfect. public testimony. <laughs> and we will do that. We will now open um, public testimony and the rules from the previous public hearing are still in place. And city clerk, would you tell us who's first up? Yes, I, I think that I was told she left, but is Karen Calavity still in the off, um, audience? Okay, the next speaker is Sharon Seiler. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council. My name is Sharon Seiler. My husband and I have lived in Highland Greens for over 30 years. I and others had a partition drive regarding the rezoning of the subject property. We obtained 700 signatures of residents in Waverly Acres in Highland Greens in opposition affected by the rezoning. And I have all of the signatures here. Are you all aware of these signatures? Have, have they mm -hmm. been made a part of the record? Mm -hmm. okay. Among our- Ma'am, ma excuse me. Could you lower that microphone? People are texting me saying they can't hear what's being said. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll speak right into the microphone. Thank right. you very much. Okay, is that better? Among our concerns is the traffic light at 101st and Sheridan becoming a four-way traffic light, which would allow residents of Berkeley Homes and Waverly Acres to head east through the intersection, cutting right into Highland Greens, making it a shortcut to uh, get to 104th because of the congested traffic that's already there at 104th and Sheridan. I'm sure many of you have been there when they, when it's been very congested. That intersection was never intended to be a four-way intersection, nor a thoroughfare or a shortcut through Highland Green's neighborhood. This is a traffic issue, safety issue, and a safety concern for the 500 plus families that are in Highland Greens and negatively impacts the property values of our homes on 101st and the rest of Highland Greens as well. During the last Berkeley Homes presentation, the inch issue of through traffic was presented and the Berkeley Homes response was, any through traffic going through Highland Greens would probably be minimal. And while admitting at that time that there was no traffic study that had been prepared that he was aware of, Prior to that statement, he acknowledged the already congested traffic on Sheridan Boulevard, as well as the intersection of 104th and Sheridan. Highland Village and the uh, new Senior Home Center, the downtown Westminster project has added to the increased vehicle traffic. The Berkeley rezoning would add an additional 400 vehicles if they have 197 or whatever 
uh, residents, and there's an average of two vehicles per family. The spe specific to Highland Greens, the neighborhood was laid out 45 years ago. And that's when the traffic on Sheridan was very light. Um, it was very light 32 years ago when we moved here. The main street going through Highland Greens is a one lane street each way. Traffic on 101st, and it turns into Wolf Street, has increased exponentially. And there are so many cars cutting through now that they had to, the city had to add speed bumps several years back, actually three of them. The increase in people speeding has been very noticeable and the situation will only worsen with the higher density housing that Berkeley is requesting. Also, per the city of Westminster, there are approximately 1,000 housing units scheduled to come online with attendant increased traffic vehicle, vehicle traffic prior to the Berkeley property breaking ground or shortly thereafter. And ma'am, your five minutes are up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Clegg Williams. My name is Clegg Williams. I live at 3413 West 109th Circle in Legacy Ridge. Uh, I am so in favor for this project. Uh, the Just what uh, Councilman uh, talked about earlier, that the, the means for a single family house now is right at $653, I think is what it is. And our six, 600, yeah, $650,000, excuse me. And this brings the property value, uh, gives a diverse neighborhood of, a, of an entry level, which I have three kids uh, that would, you know, love to be up here by us and they can't afford anywhere. Uh, but, you know, outside of Denver, for the most part, and you've, you're dealing with a local builder you've dealt with, you know their reputation, you know they stand behind what they do. It's not like a newbie coming in or it's not like a, a national builder coming in that just wants to turn the dollars. They really care. Uh, you know, the one of the uh, vice presidents of Berkeley lives in Westminster. He's a Westminster resident. I trust him uh, to make the right decisions for our community. He lives here. He's a neighbor. Uh, and it just, it just, the, the, the traffic flows. I've seen people come out of Waverly and make, I go up and down Sheridan four times a day. And those people come out and make U-turns on there. It's dangerous for them. It's dangerous for the other oncoming passenger uh, vehicles coming both north and southbound. Same as people come out of Highland Green on 98th and they make a right-hand turn and then they make a U-turn right there. That used to be blocked off and they had U-turns blocked. They lifted it and now we've had a couple of deaths there. So... You know, they having a four-way stop there for everyone makes it safer, not only for the people coming in and out of those areas, but for the people traveling through those areas. But it's time that this is a major planned community that has a lot of diversity in the housing. And there's not been a project in my recent memories. I've been Westminster resident for 20, I was first third homeowner in Legacy Ridge. So 27 years. And uh, since Legacy Ridge, and this is uh, going to be a great asset to the community. It's good for the neighborhoods. It's good for the city in every respect. Uh, it also protects 104th because the only way you're going to, and the, and the visual sidelines coming down 104th looking toward our mountains, which we all love. 
Uh, but if you just let other people go in there and and build these 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 huge uh, developments and stuff, it's just not they they can't make it affordable uh, to build those houses, and that's not going to solve any issues for them. So I would appreciate the uh, consideration to let this go through. Thank you. Thank you. The next next speaker is Tom Pringle. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Councilors, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to speak to you guys. I am Tom Pringle. I live at 1648 Wanaka Lake Trail in Lafayette. I represent the whole 12 family as a realtor. And uh, we've been at this project for quite a while. So, um, and the Holtz Clause, they own the property, the central the centerpiece of the, the three properties that we're trying to put together. And that's what uh, hopefully we can get this uh, comp plan uh, passed. And so we've been working many years with the city staff and uh, I've worked with many builders, uh, but so far we just haven't been able to get anybody to, to make it work at 3.5. I mean, I've probably a couple of national builders and several smaller builders as well. So we're hoping that, you know, given the opportunity to have a well-planned and uh, well thought out product and development that we might be able to get something going here for you. And uh, I think it's really good. And Berkeley has worked really hard and uh, they tried, worked hard to meet all the different issues that the neighbors have brought up. The city has brought up uh, some requirements that they want. And uh, I know they've worked very hard. I, I attended several of the neighborhood meetings and uh, I, I sometimes, you know, feel for the neighbors, but on the other hand, eh, pro progress is going to happen. At least we, we hope good progress is going to happen. I think this is good progress. So uh, we would hope that you would give us good consideration and uh, pass this. On. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Kurt Rosen, Ronson. Kurt Ronson, I live at 4655 West 99th Place. And uh, two things I'd like to talk about. The first thing is um, just piggybacking on the concern about the traffic coming into Highlands uh, Greens. I think what we'll be facing is a lot more traffic than even the speed bumps can handle. Basically, we're going to have a clog, and that's going to happen maybe during those hours of morning and night that somebody mentioned, but beyond that, maybe a lot of times during the day. When people are going to come out of Waverly Acres and post development, turning left, they're gonna go on to Sheridan, which is always clogged. It's a lot easier and I would do the same thing. I would just go straight across and cut out there and go on to 104. That's the way I do my kind of uh, traffic patterns anyway. I'll avoid uh, areas that are clogged, and I think people will do that. So that's just piggybacking on that comment. One other thing is in respect to the property itself. Somebody mentioned a lot of dead trees. There have been many dead trees and large uh, uh, trees that uh, have died in recent years. And uh, the question in my mind is, has there been any kind of environmental assessment what is affecting those trees. I did talk to Jacob and he mentioned the city forester said uh, perhaps it was lack of water. And uh, you know that possibly could be the case. But beyond that, in terms of potential groundwater contamination, trees over it, on our side of the road, on the east side of Sheridan, as you come into Island Greens, about four or five old large trees died on our side of the road. Um, and those are irrigated. Also, by um, the care center, senior care center, um, Sunrise, uh, a number of trees along there died too. 
So my question with this property would be, is, is there some kind of uh, groundwater contamination? I'm not an expert, I just rely on what I see. But if you'd ask anybody who uh, lived in our community that would come uh, getting to make a left turn or a right turn onto Sheridan, coming out of the development, looking at these dead trees and as many as maybe 20 of them, uh, and some of them have been cut down recently, is there something going on with the groundwater? So that's something that should be resolved before any development happens. And hopefully there's nothing there. I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm just uh, raising the issue that is something to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Howard Akrish. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Pro tem counselors. Uh, I have some issues to talk about regarding the development in particular and just some higher level issues uh, as well. You know, you know, people in generally in general, you know, focus on their own life and issues that are important to them and they put their trust into city government for doing the things that improve their quality of life. They would prefer, prefer to focus on you know, raising their families, hanging out with friends, traveling, doing their hobbies. Uh, and I felt that way <clears throat> when I first moved to Westminster over 40 years ago. I thought the city government then was very responsive to the citizens. And I never felt a need to have to come to a meeting like this because I felt my needs were being handled in an excellent way. Uh, unfortunately, I don't feel that way now over the last 10 or 15 years. I think a lot of decisions have been made that degrade the quality of life in Westminster. And um, now I feel I need to be here and say something to share my perspective. Uh, recently, I attended, <coughs> attended the City Planning Commission meeting regarding the Berkeley Home application. And uh, I came away unimpressed with the process and the depth of thinking and, and analyzing and thinking about this project. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, you know, when I attended the meeting, there was a PowerPoint presentation similar to the ones we've seen tonight. There's a lot of high level, uh, criteria that we're looking to meet. I think they're all great criteria, but they're still high level. Uh, I didn't see a lot of depth in thinking and taking the high level criteria down to a more detailed level. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, that the process I think needs to be made better. Um, Several people from the neighborhoods raised legitimate concerns about the impacts of the new development on their quality of life, mainly about traffic on Sheridan and through their neighborhood and water usage in the city. In both cases, city experts opine that the effects of water usage and additional traffic, additional police, fire, and emergency service would be, quote, negligible. Like negligible. On the traffic concern, through Highland Greens, the city traffic manager said it would be negligible because it's faster to stay on Sheridan, which goes at 40 miles an hour to get to 104th than cut through Highland Greens, which is marked at 25. That might be true at non-peak times, but at peak times, traffic moves on Sheridan from zero to 10 miles an hour, while the traffic through Highland Greens still moves at 25. And concerns about the water usage, uh, it was also considered negligible as a drop in the bucket. If you consider this project by itself, maybe, but there are a lot of projects going on and it doesn't seem to me that accumulation of all these projects is considered because pretty soon one drop in a bucket here, a drop in a bucket there, pretty soon that bucket's full, then you fill up a barrel then a pool and a pond and so on. So I have a lot of concerns about long-term water usage. 
Uh, everyone can see that our region is getting hotter and drier. Colorado River flow reduction has been listed as a concern. The Nebraska governor just announced he plans to dig canals and take more water from the Platte River on Colorado land. Uh, Lake Mead and Lake Powell, which derive a lot of their water from Colorado, are at critically low levels. And hydroelectric power at one location had to be shut down because of the low water level. Um, on concerns about police, fire, and emergency services, crime in the city and suburbs has gone out of control. We have car break ins, theft, car thefts, catalytic converter thefts, porch pirating, burglaries, scams, and more. There doesn't seem to be any deterrent, deterrent to committing these crimes and criminals becoming more brazen in their activities even in front of video cameras. The public is getting very frustrated about all this crime and building more and more housing units isn't going to decrease the level of crime, it'll only increase it. Most comments during the in-person public portion of the meeting were against the project because of the negative impacts it would have on the adjoining neighborhoods. And sir, your five minutes is up. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jamie Chavez. And I would ask the speakers to speak directly into the microphone. They're having trouble with the broadcast. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, my name is Jamie Chavez. I live, live at 9751 Eaton Street. Um, today I'm here to request council support for the simple Semper Gardens project. Um, as a newer resident of Westminster, I've really enjoyed this city. Um, two years ago, we moved into the Highland Village neighborhood uh, with my family. Um, as a mom of small children, I chose Westminster because it stood out for safety. Uh, family-friendly activities, high-quality parks and open spaces, and good schools. Um, I also chose it because it offered uh, many of the things that I could not find in neighboring cities and towns. Um, my husband and I had very different requirements that we were looking for in a home and a city. And after a very long six-month frustrating um, home search, uh, we found a home here in Westminster that checked off both of our lists for everything that we were looking for. Um, the Semper Gardens project, I believe is one that meets a lot of those attributes that we were looking for uh, and that other people are looking for in a home. Um, Semper Gardens would be just north of my home. Um, as I leave home throughout the day, uh, my most traveled path is on Sheridan. Um, even during high traffic times, I have a safe and timely way to access Sheridan and to join the traffic there. Um, and I think that the plan for Simper Gardens shows um, that it would be similar to my experience in Highland Village. Um, I'm also a strong supporter of the open space as well. Um, I moved here from Windsor, Colorado, which has a lot of um, empty land, um, but that's really not usable. And so um, the opportunity to be able to use the grounds for parks and other types of activities and trails is really appealing. Um, additionally, uh, a few months ago, I sold my small business. And as a former small business owner, I know the importance of welcoming newcomers into your community um, as uh, a source of revenue and traffic um, and sustainability. Um, and so I know that local business owners in the area are definitely, um, you know, especially two years into COVID, would appreciate, you know, additional people here in, in Westminster to, to support their business. Um, so I hope that council considers that there are many residents of Colorado and outside of Colorado um, looking to make a place like Westminster their home um, or just looking, you know, people around here just looking to upgrade their current living situation. Um, and I would ask for support for the project. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Doris Weiss. Welcome. Uh, my name is Doris Weiss. I live at 4402 West 100th Avenue in Highland Greens East. So I'm not directly impacted uh, um, in, with the cut through of the traffic as the people in Highland Greens are. 
However, I've tried to go to the rec center at 104th and Sher 105th and Sheridan, and I've had to go through three lights when it's nine o'clock in the morning to try to get to make the turn onto Sheridan to go to the rec center. And adding more development just means that the light is gonna take a lot longer. And it's, even if you have a light at 101st, that's gonna slow traffic down on Sheridan as well. And I'm still gonna have to wait, you know, those three lights to go through. It's really pretty crowded during um, rush hour traffic. My other concern is the water issue. I thought there was a development that was refused because of lack of water um, from Westminster. It was at 112th and Sheridan. There was a whole big complex. I don't know the details of it, but I remember hearing that the council had not approved that development because of water constraints. Yet we're now approving uh, the Uplands development, which I think is a lot of homes, 2,500 homes, something like that. And now these two additional 200 and something homes. So like Howard said a moment ago, I agree with what he said, that uh, you, know, you keep adding and adding on the demand of the water supply and we're gonna have a problem, I think. And I'm also concerned about the rate structure where you guys uh, voted to uh, eliminate that third tier and use $750,000 of reserve money to fund any water uh, issues that come up. It's very concerning to me that uh, water is, is going to be the new gold of the future and we are not considering conserving it and being careful about how we, how we use it. So I, those are my concerns, traffic and uh, our water use. And I want to express that. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Kathleen Dodero. Welcome. Welcome, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilors. Thank you very much. I have just a couple of things to say. I was with Sharon Seeler when she did the signatures. Those people were adamant. They do not want this. In Highland Greens, this will be devastation. We don't approve the rezoning. There's no need to change this zoning. The comprehensive plan has been changed so much, it's pathetic. Westminster's become a stack and pack, and that's what this will be. What are the benefits to Westminster? What are the benefits to Waverly Acres, Highland Greens? The first child that gets killed crossing the street at Hampshire Park is not gonna be good. The answer is simple. It's economically beneficial to Berkeley, to the developers. If the current zoning for the property is not profitable and necessitates a zoning change to make this project viable, then maybe this is not the best project for us to do. We've just approved uplands. We've got the downtown area. We have Highland Village that is not finished. We have people living with electric boxes to the, to the south side of Wishbone. That's never been finished. Westminster starting to look like a city in decay instead of a city that I was born and raised in. I think that we really need to look at this and look at what is the plan for the city? What is the purpose for this change? Who's going to benefit from it? The city has not defined what, if any, benefits will the city accrue. What are, what are the costs to the city for the infrastructure that will be required to help this development? Are we going to exacerbate an already overly congested intersection at 104th and Sheridan, which you've heard repeatedly tonight. And you've heard repeatedly about 101st Avenue and Sheridan being becoming a thoroughfare through the neighborhood, which was designed 45 years ago. This neighborhood, Highland Greens, was designed 45 years ago. That street was never constructed to be a thoroughfare. And it is so bad now that the speed bumps aren't even effective anymore. 
all of the benefits for rezoning will go on to developers. Developers leave and the residents have to bear the consequences. With all due respect, I ask you to please take these things into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Brian Dias. Welcome. Hi, Mayor and Councilors. Thank you um, for taking so much of your time to listen to what we all have to say. My name is Brian Dice. Um, I still live down the street, Highland Village, and uh, I am the chairman of the Westminster Chamber of Commerce this year. I also am a residential real estate broker here locally in Westminster. Been doing that for about 25 years now, and the majority of that time here in Westminster. I won't make you uh, endure everything I had to say last time. I think you probably remember my perspective on the problem that we have with not enough housing, not just here, but all over. The only thing that's changed since a few weeks ago when I was here is we lost uh, over a thousand homes nearby um, in the most horrific fire that I have ever seen. And that just puts more pressure on. It's not here in our city, but it's in our region. And we all know that that has a ripple effect um, in all the cities around them. So we've got people, some people will be looking for a home to buy until theirs is rebuilt, probably be two or three years before that happens realistically. And a lot will be looking for a place to rent. Um, I have some clients actually um, and good friends who fortunately didn't lose their place, but it was damaged. And so they're living here in Westminster down the street, the residence in until their place is repaired. A lot of stories like that. I have a client who is, uh, will be moving here in a couple of weeks from out of state, single mom, uh, two teenage kids, and uh, she's taking a job in Boulder. She figured out pretty quick she can't afford to live there. And so like a lot of people, they come a little further out and we're one of the great destinations that those people you know, decide on. So she decided she wants to be in Westminster. I'm trying to help her find a place to rent here. Um, need a place with a backyard for their two dogs. It's tough right now for a lot of people, even tougher than it was already. I went on the MLS before coming here today. There are currently, out of every category of home that we have, condos, townhomes, single family, 22 homes available in all of Westminster in the city of, I don't know, about 116,000 people, I think. There are 114 homes that are under contract. So that gives you an idea of the demand and, and the shortage that we have. So again, we need to uh, maximize what land, we don't wanna give up our open space. So the property that we have that can be developed, we need to maximize the use of that property, in my opinion. I've been driving by this particular uh, property for years and uh, wondering when something would be done there. Um, from what I've seen so far, it's not really being used other than um, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott's campaign signs when it's uh, election season. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but I, this, you know, this builder has, as it's been said already, has built three great communities here. Um, this will be their fourth. They've done a good job. I do not know them personally, um, but I can tell you I've never heard one bad thing, either from the new construction or resale of any of their communities. That tells me something about who they are as a builder. It is tough that, to answer your question, question, um, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott, that medium now is in the 625 to 650 here in Westminster. The low end is what's hard to wrap our minds around is 
in the upper 400 to 500,000 is now a starter home. So these prices sound ridiculous. 900,000 I'm sure is on the far north end where those larger single family homes are. And again, to give perspective, like I mentioned before, up at 128th and Huron in Tanglewood, those homes are now in the 800,000s, 800,000s. So if you want a larger home with a bigger lot and more of a yard and a full driveway on in every home, that's the price range you're going to be in is the eight or 900,000. Anywhere you go in the metro area, especially in the interior in cities like ours, where homes have already been or where there isn't a lot of area to build, we have to go higher density. And a lot of them are higher density than what this community is projected to be. But in order to maximize that use, there have to be compromises. I feel like this is a good project and it's something that our community, it adds another 200-ish homes, but we need those. Thank you for listening. Thank you. The next speaker is Julia Abdel. Welcome. Welcome. Good evening. Juliet Abdel, 8860 Northwest Minster Boulevard. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council. I am here today in support of the Semper Gardens project as both a resident and in my professional capacity. Our organization has provided a written statement to you all already, and my presence this evening is to add to the statement with a few additional details. Over the past few years, we have stood up, supported, and worked toward trying to find solutions for the housing needs in our area, supporting projects and encouraging policy at the state level aimed at addressing shortages we face. As a chamber that seeks to build a better business economy, we would be remiss if we did not speak to the value this project has the potential to bring, highlighted by recent natural disasters like the wildfires in neighboring communities. The Semper Gardens creates a range of diverse housing in our city. Berkeley Homes has had a history of working in our community with completed projects like the Schoenberg Greens, Connections, and Skyline Greens. And since 2018, they've worked with staff to bring this project to life. There are always concerns with development, including obstruction of our beautiful mountain views, a concern addressed with no apartments proposed, and a max two-story build in this project. We boast our open space preservation in this city. And this project incorporates 40% of the open public land dedication to open space. Construction projects like this add temporary jobs to our economy and long after completion house the workforce that contributes to our area businesses. These residents invest their time, talent, and resources to keep our city thriving, not to mention their ability to create generational wealth through home ownership is significant. Tonight, we urge city council to vote in support of this measure. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Sarah Keith. Sarah Keith in the audience. Okay, the next speaker is Sandra Oyarzun Jasnik, and I apologize if I really missed the mark on that name. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, I'm Sandra Oyarzun Yasisen, and I live at 10250 Benton Street, which is in the Waverly Acres neighborhood. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not a very good public speaker. Um, I have lived in that neighborhood for 23 and a half years. Um, and I, back to the piece of property. Um, <clears throat> my biggest concerns are the increased traffic that, you know, at least 400 more vehicles, if not more. I know I have kids that drive, so we have more than two cars at our home. Um, driving on Sheridan, because it 
is quite frankly kind of a nightmare. Um, trying to turn into the rec center, as other people have said, awful. Um, I'm also concerned about the water impact. I know at the planning commission hearing, it was talked about and the water person, I'm sorry, I apologize because I don't know people's titles, but the person who came to speak about water, um, like the gentleman talked about with the bucket. Yes, it was, it, it will have an impact. It wasn't a huge impact, but if you take into consideration, I, I'm not sure what the uplands numbers are, but that's adding a huge amount of water. And so this would just tack onto that. Um, I also, after seeing the horrifying fires and the, from the, Mar the Marshall fire and the homes burning down, to me, I'm like, if we're zoned at 3.5, we should stay at 3.5. We don't want more density in the, you know, God forbid there's any kind of fire here. And then that, that makes it, I, I don't want that to happen again. Well, I don't want that to happen anyway. Um, I, my feeling is if, obviously, I mean, as a resident there, do I want anything built there? No, but is that a reasonable request? No. Um, I would just <clears throat> urge you to please keep it at 3.5, not increase the density. Um, I will say I'm one of the vocal people don't want townhomes. Um, I would prefer if something does have to be built there, that it's just single family homes, um, detached or, or attached or um, just not townhomes or condominiums. I know that was talked about before also. Um, and then my other thing is, I know people talk about the whole, we need affordable housing. I, I mean, I bought my house 23 and a half years ago. So it was, I think, 160,000 then. I don't think I could afford to buy my house right now. Um, and so it's probably, I think I went on Zillow and it's marked at about 500,000. Um, so to me, 400, a $400,000 townhome, you know, affordable, I guess, is um, a relevant term because I couldn't afford a $900,000 home either. So at any rate, thank you for listening to me. I just strongly urge you to please leave it at 3.5. Thank you. The next speaker is Greg Jasnick. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Uh, following my wife, I get no respect. Uh, all right. Oh, shoot. The clock started. Okay, here we go. Greg Yassis in 10250 Benton Street. And thank you again for listening today. Uh, thanks for your attention and your consideration as we review yet another request for an increase in density of this residential development. Um, we are asking that you please keep it at R3.5 uh, for these properties under review. Um, based on the agenda tonight, the presentation, uh, made by the city manager conflicts with the recommendation of, of the planning commission. You brought that up. The re removal of townhomes was a primary concern of the existing neighborhood, and I'll try to get to that very quickly here. Um, for it to be glossed over does us a disservice. Um, get my finger where I'm stopping. Uh, the desire to meet that term of mixed housing seems to be more of a feel-good, right? And I understand, uh, Councillor Izzati, your concerns about affordable uh, housing across the across the city. Um, while we're speaking about terms that affordable housing must be discussed, as she said, we bought our house. It's now worth five hundred thousand dollars, and that's just crazy. Again, goes back to really looking at wh where the planning commission is going to come into play here, and what our actual plan is for the city. Um, the older established neighborhood of Waverly Acres represents about eighty five percent of the homes. They are within that R3.5 uh, designation. Uh, the smaller neighborhood of Highland Meadows, which is, represents about 33 houses, 
is, is again, and that I think has been very clearly uh, denoted here, that it is the larger piece, and that gives you that overall average, which raises it, right? Again, our hope, 33 houses out of the additional 130, 130, 140, 160 that we have, um, it, it makes it, uh, you know, there's a lot of houses there. <laughs> Adding an additional almost 200 homes does have an impact. Uh, our neighbors, again, to the east have expressed that concern. Um, there's room for reasonable development at that R35 density. Uh, I have no doubt that it would require a lot of work on Berkeley Homes uh, or another developer to pivot to redesigns of older layouts uh, or new architectural strategies, but that's the job. Uh, they had already created alternate options prior to the Planning Commission's removal, uh, and they adapted to that very well, I think. Uh, the property owners have every right to reap the rewards, as, do the de as does the developers. Right, but uh, and I would strive to do the same if I were in their position. Absolutely, I'm not on the clock here. Right, writing this email, making this statement, and the citizens' president uh, presence and those who live in the immediate area aren't on the clock. They're here to make comments. They're here to make comments to you uh, to protect our neighborhoods that we live in from negative or damaging changes. Not from change, but from negative and damaging changes. Uh, I believe that most of us understand the importance of tax revenue for the city. Importance of resources, however, must weigh heavier than tax revenue. Planning Commission did address some of these topics individually, and this again is where it lays to you to look at all of this together. Councilor Baker, you, you brought up the fact that we need to look at this more of a city, of a city level, right? And Councilor Azadi and Nirmala, you both had, had mentioned the importance of townhomes in this, but in this area, and how many townhomes are you gonna add here? At most, I believe is the number may be 30. Uh, maybe it's 20 townhomes. That, again, at a 500,000 price point, 400,000 price point, is not doing anything for mixed availability. It really isn't. Um, and I hate to say the name of the city here, but, you know, Broomfield. Ah, Broomfield. Um, they've managed to keep spacing, right? They have taken advantage of areas and developed entire communities that are more specific to townhomes and condominiums and built communities around them. Found a place to do that, Westminster Mall. We have that area. We have an area to do that sort of work in a very comprehensive area, right? Comprehensive way, take, take good planning, take some time and do it right. Um, and running up the street, uh, Westminster, as I believe you had said you had done, yes, there are townhomes at, and there are apartments and we thought about moving into that neighborhood at a $700,000 price point and it's now not $700,000, right? For the single family homes. Um, it's rough, um, it's rough. Uh, I will just answer two quick questions. I'll try and get these in. The question about the cul-de-sac, I know it's a pain in the butt. Uh, the reason that that came up, uh, we have about seven or eight families who live in that cul-de-sac bought houses with a cul-de-sac. I grew up in a cul-de-sac. It is a special thing to live in a cul-de-sac where you don't have to worry about your kids. Um, to lose that was a piece that all of us as neighbors felt we needed to support. Um, uh, and then quickly on the downhill, I wanted to mention for 101st, and I know I'm out of time, uh, on the downhill going into Highland Greens, I coached at that soccer, uh, coached soccer at that park there. The concern for the neighbors there is not that there are it's not speed bumps. It's that there is a significant downgrade from Sheridan down to that park. And as we all know, going downhill, you just choose to gain speed. So that's the your time. That your time stretching. is up, sir. Thank you so much for your time. I do appreciate it. And the next speaker is John Shields. Well, welcome. Trying to stay awake, right? <laughs> um, I will speak very briefly, and I actually wanted to comment on something Councilor Numella brought up earlier. I live in Highland Greens, and I was actually part worked with the city about 19 years ago to have the traffic calming installed in that neighborhood. At the time when it was done, it worked very well. However, about five or six years ago, the city came in and they repaved 101st as it went through from Sheridan up to um, 104th. And unfortunately, during that process, the repaving basically mitigated the traffic calming they put in in the first place. And that's why you have traffic going through there so fast now. 
In fact, the reason I had worked with the city to have it installed in the first place is that before the traffic calming went in, um, traffic was so bad and so dangerous. At one point, someone was on their phone and they hit my wife's car and hit it so hard, it blew it up off the sidewalk onto our street, onto our yard. And so it is a true dangerous area. And unfortunately, now that the, the, tra the road was repaved, that danger is maybe not quite as bad as it was when it was originally put in, because you still have signs that tell people their speeds, but it is definitely very bad again. I mean, so much so that fortunately my kids are now older, but it is dangerous to have little kids on that road. And so what I would ask is, in addition to all the concerns you've heard from everyone else, which I actually agree with, especially the congestion and things of that nature, I came back to the city two or three times after that road was repaved, asking for it to be looked at. And people went out and they looked at it, but they would make no change. And those speed bumps are now mitigated. If you're going to proceed, please consider the holistic issues that need to be addressed with the project. And I would ask, and no one on this council did that to me, I didn't talk to you, but a little bit more than lip service of, oh, we'll take a look at it. We think it looks fine because it, it is going to be a very dangerous place because people do cut through that neighborhood routinely and at very high speeds. And because of the grade changes you heard and things of that nature. Um, and I won't reiterate anyone else's point. Thank you for the time. Thank you. That's the last speaker we have in chambers. We had 10 virtual speakers sign up. I only see five online right now, so I will start to call the virtual speakers. The first virtual speaker is Mike Byrne. Mr. Byrne, I've unmuted you, so go ahead and unmute yourself and begin your comments. I'll go back to Mr. Byrne. Um, Dina Pitternese. Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, I'm, my name is Dina Pitternese. I live at 8846 Yates Drive here in Connections. And I'm here to speak on behalf of Berkeley as a homeowner and as a real estate agent. I purchased my Berkeley home in 2019, Connections neighborhood. I didn't know anything about Berkeley at that moment. I liked the area, I liked the floor plan options, proximity to highway, shoppings, and restaurant. Our whole building process was very smooth. They were very nice, accommodating. And if anybody had built the house lately, um, that's not that common to do that. And they were able to change any last minute um, wishes, if you will, um, that resulted in a very great home. And we love the home and we love the quality. Um, as an agent, I have helped many homeowner, homeowners with the new build purchases. And of course, each builder is different and many factors affect the outcome in the building process. However, my experience with Berkeley was one of the smoothest transactions that I have done. Um, I hired a third party inspector prior to closing on my home. And even he admitted that over past 22 years, this was one of the better new builds that he has inspected. Finding a good quality in today's world seems like it's getting harder and harder. Builders build homes as quickly as possible to make the profits. And in any case, they cut the corners. Quality work you can find only in a handful of builders right now. And I believe that Berkeley delivers it. And as gentlemen mentioned before, as a real estate agent, we desperately need more housing. We're currently at the lowest levels of inventory we have ever seen, spe specifically in the last two years. And with the pandemic, builders slow down just like everybody else that caused the, the even further shortage for our inventory. And with all, all that we know that our market is competitive and just the give you a little perspective, we have about 3.5 buyers per house. And that number is just going to continue to go up as we approach spring market. So that's what's driving all these bidding wars and bidding way over the list price in order to get a house. Because just like everybody else, they need a place to live and they want to have their own home. And of course, it's driven by the high demand and very, very low inventory. Um, we're going on the ninth year of a strong seller's market and 2020 is already shaping to be even more competitive than 2021. 
the only thing that can help with the uh, more inventory is new, new build opportunities um, that would offer new housing options. And this community would provide the variety of new build options and housing that we so desperately need. And I couldn't recommend a better builder than, than to do it than Berkeley. It's a local quality builder and the homes are gonna look good and it's gonna be nice quality in addition to Westminster. Thank you. Mike Byrne or Byron, I've unmuted you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. I see some people shaking their heads. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Byrne. Uh, I live at 2391 Ranch Reserve Ridge in Westminster. I've been there for, been in Westminster for over 40 years. Uh, I'm former chairman of the Planning Commission and I uh, was on the Westminster Legacy Foundation Board for, uh, for many, many years. I've been involved in the city. My professional background is residential and commercial development. And uh, I know some of you uh, know some of the projects I've done uh, in Westminster. I did the Ranch Reserve Residential Subdivision. Uh, I've been working with the uh, the landowners, the Holtz Call family for probably five years and the Rubens family on the South Parcel for about that long. And more recently with the Hahn family to try to figure out what's a, a, a good development for these parcels. and. Uh, I've worked with a number of builders that tried to, to make a project happen here. And it's it's a challenging site to to do as an infill. And you, when you add all of the costs of Sheridan at 104th and and uh, giving 40% of the land to PLD and so on along the hillside there where the valuable sites are, it's a, it's a challenging site. So we were very pleased to get Berkeley Homes to come in and, and uh, uh, work with us, all three landowners. And I, and I think from a city council perspective, that's a big advantage versus you having to sit here and look at three different ODPs and PDPs on, on all three different sites. So, so I think that's something important. Uh, I've got some reasons why I would encourage you to consider supporting this. Uh, it meets all of the, the PDP and the company, I mean, all the city's requirements um, as indicated in the staff report. The proposal really does meet that that housing diversity uh, issue that the, the staff has, has worked with Berkeley on. And there's, you know, a, a minimum of three types of, of uh, housing types, the traditional single family, the courtyard single family, paired homes, and possibly townhomes, depending on what you decide. But even with the three products, if, if you decide not to do townhomes, you've still got some good diversity there that, that I think hits that missing middle, those those small business people, and their, their employees and the government workers and a lot of them that, that can't afford million dollar homes that, that aren't going to be able to, to do that. And if you lower the density, which I know some people have talked about in the planning and zoning meeting in here, I've been involved in doing a lot of financial analysis for residential developments. And when you, when you look at this parcel and if you lowered it to the 137 and you do the thrive, 3.5 inches to the acre and you do 7,000 square foot lots, um, it just drives the price of the housing up. So you end up with million plus homes on this site. Um, number one, that doesn't meet our missing middle that we're, we need in Westminster. Number two, I don't think I can find a builder or could find a builder that would be willing to put million dollar plus homes on that entire site. He might want to put some main our homes on the hillside, but the city wants a big part of that hillside for the PLD. So you really need a builder like Berkeley that will come in and, and create as, as, as reasonably priced housing as you can. Um, can they get under 400,000? I don't know. The, the cost of everything, whether it's lumber or utilities or whatever it is, has gone up so much that builders are having a tough time keeping the prices into that quote reasonable category and uh, whatever however you want to define that also this plan the the five units to the acre works a lot better from a water standpoint you're you're really you get seven thousand square foot lots and you're using up more water there's water studies that berkeley's done and and uh you know i know water is a sensitive 
uh, issue in Westminster. I live there and I talk to my neighbors about it. So this project is, is pretty good from a water standpoint. Um, The only reason that it shows R8 uh, on the south parcel is that you can't move, transfer the density on, on both sides of 102nd Avenue. And, the, and Dave Downing and the staff can describe that uh, to you a little bit more. But overall, this is what you're really approving is just approximately five units to the acre that allows this diverse housing. Uh, so you're not really approving R8 because that's Berkeley's willing to agree that they'll only do about five units to the acre. You just have to do that because the city staff has said, and, and rightfully so, they want the hillside um, next to 104th for PLD. And this, this builder, unlike a lot of other builders, is giving 100% of the PLD in land. They're not doing cash and loop. Another advantage to the city. Uh, I think finally the uh, uh, key issue is safety for the, the traffic signal. Uh, I think that's a, a big plus. They're going to put in a traffic signal. Um, would it be nice to have more traffic signals that, that give you full movement? Yes, but it just it's difficult to do 103rds off of close to 104th. Mike, out this is Mayor McNally, and yes, you're out of time. Okay, thank you all. The next speaker is Tish Parado. I have unmuted right, you. Can you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Hello, um, City Council. My name is uh, Tish Prado, and I am a resident of Cambridge Farm, 7460 West 93rd Place, which is about under 10 blocks away from the proposed development. And I'm also a proud graduate of Random High School. I'm here to support the development for Semper Gardens. Um, I have my own family, extended family, lifelong friends, which I can call family that have lived in Westminster for 40 plus years. And a huge concern like everyone is having affordable housing for our, for our generations and so that we could still live close to each other and our families aren't having to move way out, further, further out, out of the city. So it takes longer for us to gather and be with each other. And as someone said, there's not that many houses available in Westminster and those housing prices are just very, very high. And so this project really puts hope, you know, for some of our generations that grew up here that can finally have enough, you know, <laughs> they can have some hope to be able to buy a house where they grew up. And so we're kind of really excited for this plan and all of the mixed use housing that it's providing. And we're really actually concerned about density as well. I think everyone who lives in the metro area is concerned about that, but you know, really it's just a fact of life. Um, cities get built uh, bigger. Um, they get more dense as it moves out from a center. And I feel like Berkeley has really, you know, taken the time to listen to the neighborhoods and to the concerns of people. And you don't always get that from developers. And I think that um, they're doing just a really great job at listening, trying to, to uh, address all those concerns we are really, you know, looking at that intersection in Sheridan, and I feel like that full movement intersection is going to allow safe access along um, North Sheridan. So I hope you all unanimous, unanimously support this proposal, and I thank you for your time tonight. The next speaker is Lorraine Ortega, but Lorraine does not look like they're online with us. So the next speaker is Grant Michael. I've unmuted Grant, if you will. Unmute Hello, yourself. can you hear me? Yes. Thank okay. You. Hello, my name is Grant Michael, and I will keep this quick and to the point. 
I'm a lifelong Westminster resident and grew up just blocks away from this site in North Park, very close to the Westminster Rec Center. As a recent college graduate, I am looking forward on embarking on my career and adult life and hopefully can remain a resistant resident of Westminster. I am supportive of the infill development, which provides a great range of opportunities for individuals like myself to obtain housing. I want to live near my childhood home. We grew up in a community and I love the place and neighbors. I would like to continue my family tradition. Finally, I'm also appreciative of the time and hard work provided by the applicant and providing for a significant open space. The proposed plan will provide 40.5% open space throughout the project, including a privately maintained park, which can be utilized by the entire public. Anyway, thank you for your leadership in showing that the door isn't closed in Westminster and that we do it better here. Thank you and I ask for your support, Grant. The next speaker is Linnea Nichols. I've unmuted you. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Yes, I, I'm Linnea Nichols and I'm the personal representative for the estate of Ruby Holtzclaw at 10115 Sheridan Boulevard. And I actually live in North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm coming to you from there where it's now 1.30 in the morning. So you guys have got to be tired too. Um, so I represent the center parcel of the three parcels we've been talking about tonight. And I hope you don't mind me sharing just a little background on the property. My mother was actually born on that property in 1920, and she lived on the property her entire life. Uh, moved off for a little bit when uh, my dad was in the military, but she lived there her whole time. I was raised there. And this property actually has a lot of historical significance for Westminster. Uh, the very first owner was the Denver Pacific Railway and Telegraph Company. The first deed was in 1869. And yes, I have copies of the deeds. My parents kept all that stuff. Jefferson County doesn't even have them. I have them. Um, in 1889, it was incorporated into the Semper Land Company, which is very historic for Westminster. You're probably familiar with the uh, Semper Farm open space at Pierce and West 92nd. That's the house that once belonged to Charles and Julius Semper where all these names came from. My grandmother actually knew them and she ran the Semper Cash store for them while in the 30s. My mother attended Semper school. So Semper has been big in this area. My grandparents bought the property in June of 1919. My grandfather died in 1924 of tuberculosis, leaving my grandmother and my mother to continue to farm that the rest of the time. Um, after my mom and dad married, they continued to help with the farming and then they eventually built that second house on the property and they continued to farm it until they died in 2012. And I don't know, I think Nancy might be the one old enough, but I just wondered if anybody else was old enough at the council to remember them. And I knew Nancy would take that the right way, I hope. <laughs> Linnea, um, you know, they've remodeled the the inside here, but I know that we should have two seats towards the back, Leonard and Ruby Holtzclaw. So maybe when they name a park, they will consider keeping their name alive. <laughs> I, I wish you could see my smile through the, through there. In fact, I've asked Berkeley if by any chance they could put a bench, if, if this gets approved, they could put a bench in and at least put the names on there. But yeah, so they were very active. Um, I have to say that this property has had contracts on it continuously since we put it on the market in January of 2013. We had a contract 45 minutes after it was on the market. But Berkeley has been by far the best to work with, even from my end. I have to say it hasn't been without all the challenges. You know Sheridan's a major road. I saw it go from a dirt road to an oiled road to a paved road. Most people probably don't even know what that means. Widened to four lanes, luckily right 
after I left home because it was only 14 feet from my bedroom is how far that road was. And then they widened 104th and made it the connector to 36. So the traffic just became a nightmare. So I have to agree that with that amount of traffic, it doesn't make sense to put large lots, single family homes right up next to the road. It probably makes a lot more sense to put townhomes in there. Um, the existing 102nd is already city right away, so that's a, not a problem. But I can't believe, I would think the neighbors would want access to, from Waverly to get out of there. My parents hated it. It was always so hard for them to try and go north. And even when they came home, they had to turn early, drive all the way around. It was a mess. Um, I've been very interested tonight listening to the discussion about the light at 101st because I don't think people are aware that this has been a requirement of the city for maybe at least 20 years. I know my parents were upset about it. They told me that the city of Westminster told them that whoever bought and developed that property had to extend that light and extend 101st, make that a four-way light, which Berkeley is planning on doing. So it's not new news. This is something that the city has been looking at as a requirement for a number of years. Um, I have to say I was encouraged when Berkeley wanted to put the three parcels together because we just have not had a developer that can do it with that R3.5 designation with the open space and the setback requirements that have to be done. Um, I like Berkeley because they worked with the city on other projects. They're used to working with you. The city has worked with them. I'll try and quicken it up because I'm looking at eyes. They're getting real tired. I like and, the houses they're going to build. You've gone, Linnea, you've gone over five minutes. Oh, can I, can I just say one last thing? Yep. Real quick. It hurts to see this land developed. I'd love to have it stay a farm. But my dad, right before he died, said he wanted to have it sold and developed. And the people who move in there are going to love those views of those Colorado mountains and Long's Peak and be part of the history of Semper Gardens. Thank you. Thank you. We had two additional speakers, neither of which are online, but I would like to mention Kelly Crossan and uh, Julie West. So that's the last speaker. We do have voicemails. How many? Six. Might as well keep going. Okay. Can you please play the voicemail? This is Jackie Bursch, and I'm grateful to have my small voice heard by the appropriate person. Thank you most kindly. Back in uh, 2019, I lodged a concerned objection to the proposal for the Berkeley Homes development on the west side of the Sheridan from 101st to 104th, et cetera, for the Planning Commission. And that thought, at that time, uh, my concerned objection was based on the precious, ever-shrinking, and fully non-renewable greenbelt resources that we have within our Westminster community. The events of the intervening months have only served to highlight and solidify our community's need for those spaces, and I wish to submit a fresh objection to the Berkeley Homes development for today's meeting. I'm a mother of children who have struggled to find affordable housing in this city, and I'm quite aware of this need, but the Berkeley Homes development is not going to fix this problem. Taking away the uh, rare and few undeveloped lands is not the solution, at least in my opinion. Um, I agree with uh, Mr. Lefcourt, uh, who made this assessment. He said the problem uh, is not nonstop, uh, with nonstop growth, is that it never pays its own way. We all get burned with the demands for more water, sewer services, expanded police, fire, health care facilities, schools, the increase in crowds, traffic, due to the in inability of the road system to accommodate more vehicles. Um, and I agree with that. Uh, I, I agree that new transplants might love the change from their former homes, uh, but most long-term residents of Colorado would agree that the rapid growth has done more harm than good. So I respectfully ask the 
Planning Commission or whoever needs to uh, hear these words to halt this development as, uh, in my humble opinion, it's not the way forward and uh, doesn't represent the true needs or desires of our dear Westminster. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, my name is Dave Wake. I live at 5244 West 100th Court. That is Highlands Meadows. Uh, I am calling about the hearing for tonight. I'm unable to attend because we have sickness, but I need to put my comment in about what's going on. Uh, we get wrecks up here on the corner of Hunter and Sheridan all of the time, and the speed on there is ridiculous. I know the police can't be everywhere, but we, we never get it. Anyway, if you start building houses on that southwest corner of 104th and Sheridan, it's going to get out of hand already. We already have an excess of 22,000 cars on Sheridan already. We need to not have this thing built. If those guys want to go, if your developer wants to build, go up to Superior, where they need des help, desperately help, really bad. So let's look out for people who need the help instead of just building this because we need the more revenue here. I think that's what we're talking about. I uh, appreciate your time. Have a good day. Hello, this is Shannon Farley. Uh, address is 10260 Benton Street, Westminster, Colorado. Uh, my house backs up to the fence to the north parcel of Semper Gardens and Waverly Acres. I'd like to request to keep the area zoned R3.5 uh, with no townhouses. Townhouses would add uh, too much traffic, lower property values, and use too much natural resources. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Cindy Riedel. I have been a resident of Westminster for the last 10 years, living at the Westcliff Apartments uh, 9820 Westcliff Parkway. I would like to um, express uh, my support for the plan um, relating to Semper Gardens. Um, uh, the Berkeley team um, has really spent a lot of time reaching out to the to some of my neighbors actually and to the residents in Westminster and I just think that this project will be an amenity for all the people who live there and others um, all around the city of Westminster and so we really appreciate the efforts um, and the transformations to the plan that, that create the community compromises that are needed. Um, so I hope that this project gets passed because it's really hard um, to find good housing with um, different price points. Uh, I would really love to get out of an apartment and be able to live in a home and able to afford a home and I think this project is is heading in that direction and so I'm just really excited and hopeful that um, it gets approved tonight. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Jen Rue. I am calling in today to show support for the comprehensive plan amendments and the PDP for Semper Gardens located along 102nd and Sheridan. As an active North Metro community member, I appreciate the developer being transparent and showing us their site plan. Um, I understand that many developers don't usually show the site plan or spe plan specifics before submitting uh, comprehensive plan amendments. I appreciate the fact that the site plan is buffering all of the single family homes with similar products while pushing the denser products more towards Sheridan. This project was first brought up to us in 2018 and since then the site plan has changed drastically due to community and staff input. Um, I believe the developer has really listened to the voices and concerns of the residents in this area and has provided compromises to address those concerns. In the end, this will result in new housing with community amenities and connections to a regional trail, which is awesome. Uh, none of the new traffic will drive through an existing neighborhood and that is successful infill. I urge you all to please support this project. Thank you, bye-bye. Good morning, my name is Lucy Sieber and I reside in a Waverly Acres development, which is adjacent to the proposed Berkeley Homes upzoning. I vehemently oppose the upzoning of the properties under consideration 
at tonight's city council meeting. My advice to city council is quite succinct. Don't do it. The developer Berkeley Homes claims that they cannot build at our 3.5 zoning designation. They state they require R5 to achieve a profit. Newsflash, by what stretch of imagination <clears throat> excuse me, is our community obligated to support their bottom line? No obligation whatsoever. Additionally, there has been much controversy over our crumbling and taxed infrastructure. It is best to address those issues than f add 500 new best friends and their respective vehicles to our area. At the rate Westminster is going, we are not building any type of sustainable future. Additionally, one can refer to the 2020 community survey regarding <coughs> the residential growth, which was viewed as negative or somewhat negative. 57% of the respondents cited too much growth in the community in the 2020 survey as compared to 31% in the 2010 survey. There's also the concept of community perceptions. Three of the candidates posted pre-election signs <clears throat> on the northernmost property, the horse property. You are now voting on this measure. I highly doubt that any of you scaled the fence to post your signage. This says to me that there is a personal or professional connection to the landowner. In my view, it definitely has ethical implications. Thank you for your time. I implore you to do the right thing to deny this upzoning request. That was the final voicemail. Thank you. Any further com comments or questions from council? I will close the public hearing. Councillor Emmons. Okay, I wasn't clear whether or not, I know it was sent uh, to various entities. I'm assuming that our police and fire department have reviewed uh, the proposal on this. That is correct, Councillor. It's been referred to our public safety with no comments from either. Okay, thank you. And then for, can we go back to the water usage? And I know that um, our slide looked a little different than the one that you had up here. So can you walk me through the lot sizes and the water use on, on each? Sure, I, I don't know if somebody's out there, but if we could go to slide 20. Uh, which is the community benefits water efficiency. So what we showed, Councillor, is we did uh, four, we have four proposed uh, housing types, right? And so is that the one you're asking about? Yes, I'm, I'm looking at four different uh, lot size sizes. Um, the first one says paired home, then town home lots, single family detached home alley loaded, and then the single family detached front loaded. Perfect. Yes, that is the slide. And sorry if it's not going to come up, but those four, what we're showing there is that only the third one has, this is just on site, right? We show that as artificial, artificial turf and only the larger 6,000 foot plus lot do we show actually irrigated turf. So our uh, comment on that is we are proposing 26 of those larger lot homes. So our irrigable lot uh, open sp space is much, much less than what is proposed there today if you did it at 3.5. That would result in 137 lots that are over 7,000 square foot. Okay. And then do we have any kind of indication what indoor usage would be like? Because it, I'm assuming these are um, outside, right? Outside water use. Um, so to try and do apples to apples comparing Right, more townhomes for more indoor use versus less watering outside, if that makes sense. I'm going to say, Councilwoman Emmons, just to say it for the first time. So there we go. Yes, you're absolutely right. As you know, indoor and outdoor is about 50-50% usually of water usage. So we have done a preliminary analysis. I want to say that because we're not yet to the ODP. I want to be very clear that because we're going up to 202 units, we are proposing that we're going to use more indoor water, right? There's more units, so you're going to use more water. 
We think that is offset. Our our analysis, our, and we went very detailed through that, is offset by the savings on the outside of the home. So we actually think these are basically exactly the same water usage from an acre foot from the original comp plan, the today's comp plan of 3.5, and what we're proposing here. Again, we'll know all those details, but we are showing that that is the same water demand for both of those projects. Okay. Um, and then can you, I know it's been discussed um, in some public comments, but could you walk me through um, trying to understand that parcel, the northern parcel is R5 and the southern parcel is R8, but we're not really developing R8. Right. We're, yeah. yeah, it's uh, we were trying to be helpful. I don't think we were when we showed the blended. Um, I think the biggest challenge is, is that because of 102nd, right, we can't have a different, we can't have R5. So I want to be clear, south of 102nd, we are approaching, uh, it's over seven dwelling units per acre. I just want to state that, right? And then north of there, we're under five dwelling units. So what we're saying overall for our entire site, we're at 5.18 dwelling units per acre. So what we've said there is that actually reflects almost exactly the blending of Waverly Acres and Highland Meadows. You blend those together, that's just right at five. So we're trying to honor that as well. Planning Commission, as you said, take it all the way down to five. We said, great, if that's what you want to do. So that's what we're showing, but that R8 is actually important to us to get enough density to still meet that overall kind of combined 5.18 uh, density. So jumping on what you just said as far as get it down to five, are we yeah. saying get it down to five overall? Exactly. Is it you're at 5.18 or are you looking, or is that to answer the question of R8 to become R5? We would still need, respectfully, we would still need the R8 to stay R8 but we would absolutely agree to a cap over all of the parcels at five dwelling units for across the way. That just allows us to average the two parcels together, right? So we'd like to keep it at R8, but we're perfectly fine going to a cap of five dwelling units per acre. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Councillor Numella. I'm so sorry. I did not, I just had to state artificial turf well, it's an idea. I think we're looking at, maybe that's a bad one based on the way you said that. I think um, we're looking at creative landscaping that is not turf. I think she's giving you this turf. stink eye. <laughs> so I wish our planner was here. We will not do artificial turf, but we'll do uh, something that's not high water usage. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, so I need to know... Whoever's going to make the motion, if we encourage the developer to look at TMUND, uh, and I need to know if you want townhomes or not. Everybody just doesn't want to get to the things. Does anybody have any closing things? It isn't but, in my written comments, so but, I'm headed straight to going to. I'll try to be quick. Get out here. of here. <laughs> I'll try to be quick. Just two things I'd like to add here. There, of course, there are lots of public comment about 101st Avenue, the the intersection, and potential cut through traffic. I, I think council is clear on this, but I want to say it one more time. Right now, northbound traffic on Sheridan could cut through Highland Greens if people felt like doing it. There's nothing about this proposed development that causes that cut through to occur. Staff does not believe that the cut, cut through would uh, be a significant uh, detriment here. We, we, again, our observation has been there's uh, not a whole lot of the day where traffic is backed up from 104th that would cause someone to take a longer circuitous and uh, speed bump laden route as opposed to staying on Sheridan uh, up to 104th. The other thing I'd like counsel, you know, and, and if you wanted me to quantify this, I'll call Mr. Klein onto the, onto the uh, screen here, but you got to remember that uh, there's a traffic distribution here that would cause traffic to go south from this site traffic to go north, 
traffic to go north and then west over to US 36. So the northbound to eastbound traffic uh, is just one component of the traffic distribution that we're talking about here. And again, if you want that quantified, perhaps Mr. Mr. Klein could do so. The other thing, Mayor, I want to say is if staff thought that council would be making a horrible mistake to not allow townhomes in this project, we would tell you that. We're not telling you that. We're telling you that our opinion is that townhomes should be part of the mix, but we're not going to tell you it's a horrible mistake. And I'll just leave it at that unless you have further questions. Thank you. Councillor Numella. Thank you. Um, so we all are experts in our own neighborhood, right? Um, so I would just ask maybe um, similar to how we've heard from other residents regarding like Independence Drive and the traffic and the speeds, um, can staff follow up with Highland um, uh, East and, um, you know, look at and seriously consider the um, conditions there because obviously the perception and probably the truth is that there are people that are going through and it may be just during that one peak, one hour of the day, but um, something can still happen during that time. Councillor, we'll, we'll be following up. I, was, I appreciate the gentleman who talked about the paving, the, re, the, the, the overlays on 101st and Wolf. Uh, regardless of the outcome tonight, we will be checking on that to make sure that those speed tables remain effective. Does, do you guys have any last comments for us? <laughs> okay. Councillor Baker. Really, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to remind us all what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about changing the comprehensive plan from what it's been for probably 30 years to something else. If we don't do that, we haven't taken anybody's rights away. We haven't harmed anyone in any way. We just think that we don't think that this meets all of our requirements our self-imposed requirements, okay? We, it's not about Berkeley homes. Everything I've heard from Berkeley sounds like they're really fine people, okay? This isn't about, this isn't about, uh, it's not the city's job to step in and help a project when the free market doesn't seem to want to let it go forward. We're not here to lower the bar so a project can economically succeed. That's not our job. Our job is for the citizens of our city, both the current ones and the future ones, is this going to benefit them? Is this going to be benefit the city overall? Okay, that's what we, re in my opinion, that's what we have to decide in it. And as I walk, through the uh, criteria of 11.5.14a, number one, did the plan unit uh, zoning and the proposed land uses associated preliminary, preliminary development plan are in conformance with the city's comprehensive plan? And of course, right now, unless we change the comprehensive plan, they're not. They're not in conformance with the plan that exists, which the plan that every participant in knows that's what they were buying into when they jumped on this, okay? Uh, uh, sub number three, are any exceptions from the standard code requirements or limited, warranted by virtue of design or special amenities incorporated in the development proposal and clearly identified on the preliminary plan? No, they're still asking, even if we change the comprehensive plan, they're asking for three more ex exceptions. So we're not meeting that one. 
I don't think we're in meeting number four. Is the PDP compatible and harmonious with, with existing public and private development surrounding? No, I think this is significantly different not only in their uh, extremely thrifty use of water, but in how dense the project is compared to Waverly Acres and to uh, Highlands Green. I think this is going to, in the end, even if we get rid of the uh, turf grass, not turf grass, the uh, artificial turf, it's still going to look significantly different. I think it's going to stick out like an eyesore. Okay. Uh, I don't think it meets uh, uh, number five, provides protection of development from really potentially adverse influences and for the protection of the surrounding areas from potentially adverse influences. There we get the whole traffic thing, and, and I'm not sure exactly where that stands. I think they're both advantages. But again, and then <laughs> if there was a case where this council should take money in lieu of a PLD, to me, this is the case. Because I think the offered PLD, even though our own rec department may want it desperately, I think it's terrible. I don't think it adds to our parks and the public usage at all. I think it's a gully. And if there was any a case to take cash in lieu of that, this would be the case in my opinion. So I'd love to kick it around farther if you want to probe into my reasons or anything else like that or whatever your pleasure is. Thank you for listening. Councilor Emmons. Thank you. I wasn't quite done with my questions. So I would like to ask, um, I think it's been thrown around in some uh, record items that we have in our packet um, about expanding Sheridan and what that looks like. Um, could you or Heath speak to that three or I guess more or less six lane instead of four? More like there, yes. I could wing it, but I'll let uh, the transportation engineer answer that one. Good evening, Council. <coughs> Heath Klein, transportation engineer. And yes, Councillor, the city is continuing to look at the volumes that we have on Sheridan for widening to be consistently a six lane facility from, you know, basically 88th Avenue once the Sheridan multimodal improvements are completed up to 120th. So we have a couple of pinch points where we cannot get the full six lanes uh, without reconstructing and <clears throat> looking at it. So right now on our adopted budget in the year 2025, we have a, some money set aside to study and start to do the design for widening of Sheridan Boulevard. So we are looking at it. So for all of the, my neighbors here in Highland Greens, when we do that, it is going to get rid of that kind of tree lawn that we're seeing for northbound Sheridan from Highland Greens Golf Course up to uh, Sunrise and all the way up to 104th. For southbound, there's already existing three southbound lanes. So for this development in particular, they are adjacent to the full th six lane or three southbound lane facilities. Okay. And would that change then the nature of the left-hand turns because now they're crossing three lanes and not two? Uh, <clears throat> yes, if you're, if we're talking about for, if this project were not to move forward uh, and the city does develop and push three northbound lanes, the southbound U-turn that is currently occurring at 101st Avenue will likely not be allowed because we will have now three lanes that can travel northbound. Currently, if there's an acceleration lane coming from far the Highland Greens neighborhood to go northbound. And so that is that allows the Waverly Acres and Highland Meadows residents to do the U-turn there and then start going northbound. If the city uh, is to widen Sheridan Boulevard, 
that we will need to turn the southbound movement <clears throat> to be a fully protected. So you would only be able to turn when there's a green arrow. Okay, and then would that warrant then a traffic signal? Because I can see that becoming a problem. <laughs> uh, it, it could be a problem. We'll continue to study. So uh, I believe there was a gentleman that left a voicemail that it lives in Highland Meadows. It is uh, has been requested by both Waverly Acres and Highland Meadows to have a traffic signal at 100th Avenue and Sheridan Boulevard. The problem with that is, as I've discussed to council before, we follow the manual on uniform traffic control devices. And so there needs to be warrants that are met. Those neighborhoods are existing. There has been no additional development, no additional trips coming out of that uh, subdivision. So it has never met the warrant for a traffic signal at that location. So what we could do would we would evaluate when we're going to the the six lane facility for northbound, we would have to look at elongating potentially the southbound left to make sure that there is that possibility that people can either continue to do a U turn or Highland Greens residents can turn left and go into their neighborhood. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Thoughts on team month? Mr. Baker, I mean, Councillor Baker, sorry. Uh, no, I would be against that. Okay. Councillor Seymour? Uh, not in favor. I think we can control that otherwise. Not in favor. Councillor, I mean, Mayor Pro Tem? Not in favor. Of course, I'm in favor. I'm <laughs> sorry, Zadi. In favor. And I was in favor, but the no's have it. So you're not structured to that. Um, townhomes. Councillor Baker. Councillor Seymour. Prefer not. Well, this is interesting because I live in a townhome. <laughs> right, because uh, my first home that I could afford was a condo off of 119th and Federal, and um, it was, you know, single single woman buying their first home. It was all I could afford. I couldn't buy a single family home uh, in Westminster, and so um, I'm impartial to it. Uh, I think townhomes, especially if they're owner occupied, are very valuable. Um, they're very different than uh, condos. I know that the, we have, um, uh, what did you say? Um, condo defects um, for construction defects, not condo defects, <laughs> let me correct that. Construction defects, thank you. Um, and so townhomes, and I will say that when I uh, sold my condo, my first home in 2020, uh, it was very difficult to find a townhome my next level up in Westminster. And so townhomes themselves have a value add uh, to owner occupied because you're not owning the owner. And so um, I'm, I'm for townhomes. Um, you know, I, I'm still working through all the ins and outs of the conditions. Um, so yes, I'm impartial townhomes. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, along the lines of I really have been an advocate of having a wide mix of um, the missing middle and things that people can start and work their way up. Um, I actually like the townhomes. I grew up in countryside where I still live and it used to be you'd have the smaller single family homes and then the medium size and the bigger and that's really the way that um, countryside has developed over the years. So I'm actually in favor because I think it's product that we need in the city. Councilor Namel. I too was a townhome dweller, um, but I do um, I do struggle over. I, I understand um, the community's desire to not have uh, townhomes, um, but my greater conscience conscience of um, wanting to provide to the greatest degree the diversity um, of housing stock in um, Westminster. 
just hearing folks wanting to be able to buy in to Westminster, I would support townhomes. Councilor Yazadi? Yes. And I'm a yes. I, what you have presented um, and the different concepts, which we know they're all concepts, we have, we're not agreeing to anything on that side tonight. Um, you've been trying to listen. You've been trying to hear what community has said and you keep changing. So that tells me you're trying to be a good neighbor um, and, and do the best with, and with three, three owners of different properties and a road going through that changes different things. Um, it sounds as if it has been a challenge just to look at this property. So um, you've taken time to do that and you've heard what the discussion is here and the, and the city has. So do we have, uh, I will, let's see. Do I have to close anything else or are we moving on? Yes, ma'am. So capping at five, are we gonna? Oh, capping at five or is it 5.18 you said? It's currently 5.18, but it was proposed by uh, Planning Commission to cap it at five. Um, Councilor Baker. Do you want to cap? Do you want to cap it at five, Councillor Seymour? Well, it's gonna. It could be a moot point, but um, what what is the differential between five point one and five? Half a house, five total, and that seven houses. No. Councillor Emmons? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Councillor Numella? Yes. Councillor Yazadi? Yes. Houses have it. So, five. Um, anything else? Yeah, do we, how do we add the conditions in our, in the motion? Um, thank you, Mayor, for the question. Uh, Dave Frankel, City Attorney. Kristen Decker, the Deputy City Attorney, is uh, remote and participating. So I'll ask her to chime in. Um, my thought is that the um, condition of approval, if desired by City Council, would be applicable to the PDP which is the fourth motion on your sheet that's before you. So the three initial motions would not reference the condition, but the fourth would. And that would be that the preliminary development plan would be subject to the condition that um, there would be a cap of five dwelling units per acre over the site. Uh, Ms. Decker, would you mind uh, weighing in? Good evening. Nice to be joining you a little bit after midnight. Um, I completely agree with you, <laughs> City Attorney Frankel. I think that's absolutely correct. Okay. Are we ready? That's the only condition we have to add, right? Because the other things we all lined up. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, I believe that was the one condition that council um, had consensus on uh, in that the polling suggested that the T-MUN standards were not supported by a majority. Um, a restriction on townhomes was not supported by a majority, but that the five dwelling units per acre cap over the PDP was supported by the majority. So that would be the one condition of approval okay. that would be attached to the PDP. And then on B5? Yes. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. If, if we're ready, I'll read, I'll give this a shot. Move to pass Councilor's Bill Number 1 on first reading to approve the proposed comprehensive plan amendment for Semper Gardens North Parcel 
It requests to change the land use designation from residential 3.5 to residential 5. This recommendation is based on finding that the amendment generally meets the criteria set forth in section 11-5-21B of the Westminster Municipal Code. Is there a second? Councillor Namella? Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill number one. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Seymour? Uh, just a um, uh, thought on this and, and why I, uh, carrying down to the changes, I will not be supporting any of the zoning changes. I, I wanna be consistent no matter what part of town this has to do with. It also has to go with uh, earlier this evening that uh, my consideration on parcel B where I did not wanna change that from 3.5 to five. I wish to be consistent no matter what part of town the vote comes in. Um, I've said this before in other land uses. We have we have rules. People develop based on those rules. So I think we should maintain those. Councilor Namella. Um, I just want to say, you know, uh, I don't know how long ago was it? Nine years ago, I mapped the R35. Um, you know, in in conversation with our, um, you know, with the rest of staff and, um, you know, bringing forward the the designation that was mapped back in 1997. Um, and as the city has evolved, um, you know, there, there are also, um, as I think about just our region and our community and the needs of our community. I think about um, what can we be doing to accommodate um, small changes that actually make a big impact and um, that are though appropriate and fit into the surrounding context. And it's not everywhere. Um, I think, I, you know, I completely respect maintaining um, and the decision to maintain and desire to maintain um, designations throughout the community and keep them um, in keeping with the comp with the surrounding context. Um, in this case, I believe that the surrounding context is more of a mix and that this diversity where we can get it, we have now in addition to the comp plan, our housing strategy um, an economic development strategy to diversify our housing stock. Um, I think this is a place where we can achieve those goals. Um, so that's why I would be voting in the positive for this. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you to the applicant staff and my colleagues for the and the public for the discussion tonight. Um, I will be supporting this. And I'm kind of on the other end of what Councillor Baker said. I think that you make a lot of sense with your discussion points as far as what it's zoned as. However, we have flexibility within zoning, which are really, to your point, rules that we um, put both on ourselves but also landowners. So I think that the code is set up in such a way and we have a duty in such a way to be able to adjust where it makes sense. And I feel like this development is consistent with the surrounding area. So it's not just a matter of somebody's bottom line or somebody's uh, uh, vision of what it should be. It's consistent with the surrounding area of a property that a landowner has and wants to have developed. Um, so I do see there are times where you could go the other way if it's a drastic change where I voted against things. And I think that the, the idea of consistency also comes into mind. There have been times in the past where I voted against changing something from R3 to R5 because it was too far away from the main road. This is right off of off of Sheridan. So to me, um, in the same light, I would, I'm following the same kind of consistency that I have in the past by approving this. So I'm excited to get more missing middle um, product. I do hope that the uh, applicants hears um, more of the, the concerns that the community has and the, the community understands this isn't a set plan we certainly have opportunity to uh, look at the density and, and the actual product that's going to come forward. And I would expect um, Berkeley Homes and the team to think about that when they bring the next leg of this forward. Councillor Emmons. Thank you. 
you know, going back to the, the thought of townhomes, um, you know, I, I mentioned that that was a point of uh, first time buyers, but it's also a point of last time buyers. Uh, I, the community I live in right now are, is majority are seniors um, as their last home. And so um, I would hope that the applicant would uh, include ranch style homes because I also feel like that's isn't uh, a stock in Westminster. Uh, so first time and last buyer homes um, is certainly a consideration. Uh, and then when I look at these land use hearings, um, looking at the consideration of our residents, the surrounding area, um, and then most importantly, our core services, um, our fire, our police, our um, ability to uh, serve water to our residents. Uh, this, each development is taken with consideration of that water usage for me. And so with the understanding that this is within the means of the water usage as a, a 3.5, even though going to a five, um, it's within the means of uh, what we've already allocated for this, this area. And so um, along with consistency of my colleagues, um, 3.5 to a five is negligible. And with that, I think partly too, we need to look as a council on our comprehensive plan when that comes forward as far as uh, what that actually means. Because I feel like 3.5 and I feel like five are really restrictive in a lot of way, ways. Our 3.5 for 7,000 square feet of single family homes is not adequate anymore. And so that is then putting our people that have an opportunity to work with us um, in a really hard position to make it look like we're hardcore increasing from a 3.5 to a 5 to an 8. Um, and I will say that going from uh, when I first read the application, I didn't realize until tonight through the discussion um, that we weren't going to a full three point or yeah, 3.5 to a full eight because that was, I was a hard no on that. Um, and understanding this is a project as a collective, um, understanding that is a 3.5 to now a hard five um, is more in line with my thoughts on being able to approve it. Um, so I will be in favor of this tonight. Anyone else? Um, to you folks, I, I just know looking at what you had to deal with, um, and again, with three developer folks that own different pieces and parts of land, um, you've come up with four different types of things. And I just have to say to the, I have where I did the townhomes vote and I have yes, five and two no. Is that not true? That, that we, that they could do townhomes. Yeah, I thought you said we said no, they, no to them. Mayor, I, I meant to, and I, I think I, so that there would not be a condition limiting okay. the townhomes. Right, thanks. Because I, I, I counted <laughs> I a just majority wanted to, support of I found my homes. notes here and I'm going, I don't think I heard that right, but it's late. So and, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, and to clarify, the, the way that the motions drafted and the staff report is drafted, townhomes are part of this project. If council didn't want the townhomes, that okay. would have to be a, a new condition of approval. Right. And the um, the planning commission didn't they say there should be or there should the, the planning commission was not supportive not of town supportive. Homes, okay no I hadn't put the no next to that so sorry about that I just wanted to, before we got too far I wanted to be sure I was okay but again with everything that Councillor Emmons said with the water and, and that and going to across because I understand the different pieces. I understand that road caused problems with what the city said you could look at things for the different densities coming up with an R5 across the board um, and being able to offer four different kinds of housings. 
I agree with ranch. Any place we can, if you have a ranch style that we can throw in there, there is, I hear that all the time from the seniors that want to stay in place and live in the city. That's a need. So anyway, um, I will be voting for this. And if there's nothing else, let's call the roll call. Councillor Baker. Oh. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. No. The motion passes on a 5 2 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill Number Two, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councillor Bill Number Two on first reading to approve the proposed. Comprehensive plan amendment for Semper Garden Center and South Parcel, a request to change the land use designation from residential R.35 to residential R8. This recommendation is based on the finding that the amendment generally meets criteria set forth in section 11-5-21B of the Westminster Municipal Code. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Councillor <Nubella>. Second. <laughs> um, is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. No. And Councillor Baker. No. The motion passes on a 5 2 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill Number Three. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councilor Bill Number Three, amending the zoning of the property or subject property, a 34.2 um, acre parcel generally located at the West 104th Avenue and Sheridan Boulevard. The parcel is currently zoned O1. The parcel or the owner is seeking to rezone the property to plan unit development. This recommendation is based on the finding that the rezoning is generally supported by the criteria. Set forth in section 11-5-14 of the Westminster Municipal Code. Councilor Numella. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councilor's Bill Number 3. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councilor Numella. Yes. Councilor Seymour. Yes. Councilor Baker. Oh. And Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. The motion passes on a 6-1 vote. That brings us to move to approve the preliminary development plan for Semper Gardens. I move to approve the preliminary. Wait, wait. If I may, apologies, no. Mayor Pro Tem. I've drafted um, a motion for your consideration and emailed it to all of City Council. Oh, if that is I was going to wing it. I have language for your consideration that would cap density at five dwelling units per acre over the entire site. I'm sure, it's a lot more than what I was going to come up with at this time tonight. Give me a minute. All right. I move to approve the preliminary development plan for Semper Gardens subject to a condition of approval capping density at five dwelling units per acre over the entirety of the project. This recommendation is based on the finding that the preliminary development plan is generally supported by the criteria set forth in section 11-5-14 of the Westminster Municipal Code. Councillor Numella. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the preliminary development plan for Semper Gardens, subject to the condition of approval capping density. Um, is there any further discussion? Councillor Seymour? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Roll call, please. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. No. Councillor Baker. No. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Yes. And Councillor Emmons. Yes. The motion passes on a 5-2 vote. That brings us to motion to adopt resolution 5 amending the 
20. Mayor, if I could just, just to close out the, um, the hearing item, um, if the applicant uh, would uh, be willing on the record to accept the cap of five dwelling units per acre over the entirety of the site as a condition of approval for that PDP, um, that would, I'd appreciate just having that on the record. For certain, yes, thank you. Thank you. That brings us to a motion five amending the 2022 police sworn pay plan. Council or Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to adopt resolution number five amending the 2022 police sworn pay plan. Councillor Seymour. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass resolution five. Is there any further discussion? Mayor Pro Tem. I just want to take the opportunity to thank the police officers who serve the city and who are here tonight late, um, as well as thank city manager Andrews and uh, Chief Halbert for working hard to uh, make sure that we address um, retention and attraction of police officers. And I know this is a piece of that overall work that you're doing, and I truly appreciate it. And thanks for being here so late, Chief, <laughs> and your troops. <laughs> Anything else? Roll call, please. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nurmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. And Councillor Azadi. Yes. The motion passes on a 7-0 vote. Thanks. That brings us to resolution six, urging public uh, health agencies to support rights of individuals and businesses to be free and to choose how to protect themselves. Councillor Seymour. Mayor, I move to adopt resolution number six, urging public health agencies to support the rights of individuals and businesses to be free to choose how to protect themselves from COVID-19. Councillor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt resolution six. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Seymour. Just a quick point, Madam Mayor, just because of the late hour, um, this is based on science. We, we have actual data that is on the Tri-County Public Health site that shows three counties side by side. And if you would look at the differentials between November 24th mask order between Adams County and Arapahoe County and compare it to Douglas County, the differentials are the same. So we have an incubator, we have the data, we have facts. Any, oh, Councillor Nermella. I have a, a question on interpreting the language. Um, so it says, that we would give both businesses and individuals the choice to mask. And um, how does that weigh in if a business says you need to mask and an individual says no? This is asking the public health officials to rescind their mask order. Businesses always have, a, there are several businesses in our city that I know that during um, the period where there was no mask mandate for a year still ask their um, customers, thank you, can't even think of the word, to, to wear a mask. And that is the right of every business to do that. Personally, I feel like businesses should not have the ability to mandate anything that, that would in, um, impact our fundamental right to um, you know, make choices, medical choices for our own body. <laughs> Um, and I would prefer to um, add to the urging of Tri-County Health Department that they remove the ability for businesses to require vaccine mandates. That's a topic for another day. Honestly, this is about this is about mask and the and and when you when you get into differential data on that, when you start looking at the hospitalization data, you get too many data points. And, and there's not as clear of a message on that, but the masking data in our suburban similar counties is, is absolutely shows that masks do not create a differential. So vaccine or unvaccine, that vaccinations is another topic. And I did not want to make this any more convoluted than it is. Okay, thank you for your answers. Mayor Pro Tem. I would be remiss to miss the opportunity. I, I heard some of the folks speaking in DC on some of the freedom um, for mandates, which I know it's a different topic, but however, 
um, the amount of personal liberty that we've seen taken from individuals in the last two years is, is um, frankly to me is appalling. I mean, it was the late great Martin Luther King Jr. who said, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. The government works for, for us. Um, the bureaucrats and the health departments are supposed to work for the elected officials. And what we've seen over the last 24 months um, is my kids being forced to wear masks to school. It's hurting um, them socially. If you look at the anxiety levels in young people right now because of all the things that we're mandating on folks, it is disgusting. The amount of suicide, both in teens, kids, and above. If you do not believe that this is not affecting our young people, I, I challenge you to prove that to me because I see it in my four teenagers. It is very difficult on them. And I do think that the health departments need to look at this, realize it didn't work. Just like we've been hearing the CDC say the cloth, cloth masks don't work, yet we still see people doing it like it's, it's making a difference. I mean, it has not made a difference. Um, I've done all the things that I personally could do, and I urge other people to do what you can do to keep yourself safe. But each person in this country should be able to decide what that is for themselves. So I gladly support this this evening. Councilor Emmons. Thank you. I do want to thank my colleague for bringing this forward and having the courage to do so. It's uh, not obviously a most popular thing to bring forward, but um, I think that this is important. I uh, wanted to talk about this a little earlier um, in November, but we had just had an election and uh, had onboarding with the rest of council and lots to cover in the first few weeks of our council. So I'm glad that this is finally coming forward um, from Councillor Seymour. So thank you. Um, and what what else bothers me and, and much to what Mayor Pro Tem has mentioned is a recent news article uh, in NPR had mentioned uh, the effects of the pandemic on our youth. And one of the quotes um, from the article was that young young adults are disp disproportionately suffering high, higher levels of pandemic-related depression and anxiety, substance abuse, and suicidal thoughts. And I can tell you firsthand, um, while coming from a father pers perspective, I'm coming from a volunteer perspective, uh, working with uh, foster, foster children, and it's <laughs> as a court-appointed special advocate, and it is damaging and very saddening to see um, so many cases being pushed just because um, that we're not following true TATA levels. So um, it's it's something that I support wholeheartedly. Um, and Councilor Normella, if at one point you want to go a step further and <laughs> work with me on your thoughts on uh, what you brought forward with the vaccine, I will gladly work with you on that. So um, thank you for also bringing that to light. Um, again, it's not always uh, popular and not always easy conversations, but I will be supporting this tonight. Councillor Yazadi. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to say, I've, I've said my thoughts on this before, um, but it's important that it's said up here, I, I, I believe. Masks do work, vaccines do work. They prevent, they have prevented deaths, countless deaths. Um, this new strand of COVID is extremely contagious. And yes, many folks are getting COVID that have been vaccinated or are wearing masks, but lack of evidence is not evidence of lacking. That doesn't mean that um, just because the numbers are going up doesn't mean that masks don't work. I just wanted to say that for the record. Um, it's important that we set an example for the city to do the right thing and to prioritize public health. And I'm all for individual rights, but I'm more so for the collective public health. Um, so just wanted to say that. I suppose I'd rather be dead than not have access to my fundamental rights. And, you know, it's not about science. It's about ensuring that we do not let go of our fundamental human rights. And 
So the, I just want to make that clear because the precedent we set now as a government in, this, in the United States is that we are letting our rights be diminished and by, by the need for, you know, what science tells us right now, what are they going to tell us tomorrow? And so we need to hold on to our capacity to make decisions for ourselves, whether that's abortion or whether that's getting a shot. And so I just want to make, I, I, that is where I'm coming from and thinking of the long term, what is this impacting for our ability to maintain our own human rights? So, long story short, um, I, you know, honestly, I, this, <laughs> with this particular um, uh, urging for Tri County, um, I'm not for business. You know, I won't be supporting it because I'm actually not for businesses being able to um, tell people how to live their life. And primarily, it's um, you know, it's for when we talk about the other measures in the first recital of this, and I construe that to be. Um, a vaccination mandate, and um, I just so there's some pieces that I I don't agree with on this. So thank you though for taking it forward. Okay. See no other discussion. Um, roll call on a, a resolution six, please. Councillor Nirmela, no. Councillor Seymour, yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Demott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. The motion passes on a 5-2 vote. That brings us to move to authorize the reallocation of $328,000 and some change. Councillor Seymour. Move to uh, authorize the reallocation of $328,203 from the Westminster Urban Renewal Project, WERP investment parking and other account to the WERP Harlan Mobility Plan implementation accounts. Councillor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass um, the authorization reallocation of the Westminster Urban Renewal Project. Any other discussions? Councillor Baker. Uh, both this and the Harlan Street are absolutely terrible. We've reduced the volume Harlan can carry. And I think that was a terrible mistake. And I think we are squandering funds on these projects. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Numella? Um, just to, this is E, right? Yeah. Um, my question on this one was when um, was the development agreement approved for the townhome project. <laughs> Sorry, I don't remember. Um, and just curious to know why wasn't the Harlan project cost increased at that time? <laughs> I could ask uh, John Burke to uh, join us and answer that question. Thank you, John. Good morning, councillors, and thank you, Councillor Nella, for that question. And uh, yes, the uh, the second reading of the development agreement for downtown Westminster residential was approved by council. It was uh, May 10th of 2021. Uh, the construction drawings were then being advanced by the developer at that point in time. And then the Harlan Street project was currently under construction. That took a pause, and we know that we are going to be uh, top lifting Harlan Street uh, this coming spring uh, with the uh, asphalt uh, reinforced fiber asphalt on that. So we want to make sure that we are able to get this uh, the water tap connections done prior to that top lift payment. So all this was uh, in play and now is just the right time to get that done before that work is uh, started back up on Harlan Street uh, to clean up that roadway and make it a better uh, surface for uh, both pedestrians and vehicular traffic. Go ahead. So, but the idea that we would um, pay for this portion of the public improvements, was that already in the development agreement? And we just hadn't, we just chose not to update the Harlan contract until now? 
Yeah, the timing was such that, yes, yeah, Section 2.4 of the development agreement specifically identifies that the city would be constructing these particular water uh, connections in the Harlem Street because of the complexity, the age of the line, uh, the depth of that sewer, the water line uh, as well. So, yeah, it was just a timing uh, thing for us to actually get the construction contract priced out and through final design. That final design wasn't completed until uh, August of 2021. And so that was why we had a change of the same uh, after the contract was initially filed. Thank you. Any other discussion? Councillor Baker, I have to say, when you're coming off of Westminster Boulevard and 92nd and that first light, that is the worst intersection in this city. I have almost gotten hit four times. Nobody understands it. It's horrid. It, it's horrid. A roundabout would have been better. Okay, roll call, please. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. No. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. And Councillor Nirmella. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. That brings us to E2. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Councilor Seymour. Thank you. I move to authorize city manager to execute a contract change order with Jalisco International Inc. in the amount of $296,203, thus bringing the contract total to $2,214,448,000. The purpose of this change order is to include, include certain water line construction in the project scope for the West 92nd Avenue and Harlan Street Safety Improvement Project. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve, um, to, to authorize the city manager to execute a contract. Um, is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. No. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. And Councillor Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 6-1 vote. Councillor Seymour. Move to authorize city manager to execute a contract amend with OTAC Inc. in the amount of $32,000, thus bringing the contract total to $312,961. The purpose of this contract amendment is to provide additional construction management services required for the West 92nd Avenue and Harlan Street Safety Improvement Project. Second. It's been moved and seconded um, to pass this motion. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. And Councillor Baker. No. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. Seeing no other business before us, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded to adjourn the meeting. It is 12 45 a.m. And we move straight into the WIDA agenda, incorporating the rope. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you approve? Do you, you, aye. <laughs> say aye if you want to adjourn. Aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. That takes us to the WIDA agenda, incorporating the roll call from the previous meeting. We have minutes of a meeting from January 10th, Mayor Pro Tem. Move to approve the minutes of the January 10th, 2022 meeting as presented. And then moved and seconded to approve the minutes from January 10th, 2022. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Councillor DeMont. I mean, Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Uh, thank you, Mayor or Chairman. I move to table resolution number 217 to February 14th authorizing the interim executive director to execute a purchase and sale agreement for a portion of lot two, block A1, and a part of track E in downtown Westminster with 4775 holding LLC. Second. It's been moved and seconded to, um, did you say table? Table this um, agenda item to February 14th. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Board Member Baker. Yes. Uh, Vice Chair DeMott. Yes. 
Board Member em Emmons. Yes. Board Member Azadi. Yes. Chairperson McNally. Yes. Board Member Nermella. No. Board Member Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. Is there a motion to adjourn WIDA? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn the WIDA meeting. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That brings us to study session. The presentation. Whatever we're doing at one in the morning. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yes. We'll take a five minute break at least.
Testing, testing. Good morning, everybody. Still here? City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. I'll uh, introduce Max Kirschbaum, our Director of Public Works and Utilities. Uh, They tell me you should be fine now. They muted the microphone. Let me try that again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Thanks, uh, everybody. I'm introducing Max Kirschbaum, our Director of Public Works and Utilities, uh, to present 2022 Water and Sewer Rate Alternatives Analysis. This stems from a proposal um, submitted by Councilors Baker and Seymour regarding a uh, potential reduction in the water and sewer rates and the fixed water uh, meter fee um, and also at the same time, uh, providing additional analyses with uh, other options around that proposal. So uh, uh, Mr. Kirschbaum has a very brief presentation and then we'll open it up for question, discussion and feedback from city council. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, council. If I could have the next slide, Ryan, thank you. Uh, just as by way of a little bit of background uh, in your roundtable discussion, at your November 15th meeting, uh, water was clearly identified as one of your overarching themes. Two weeks later on the 29th, um, there was considerable discussion again uh, in question and answer sessions and uh, uh, additional questions and concerns raised about rates specifically. That, that then was followed by in early December, a proposal from Councillor Baker with support from Councillor Seymour to the interim city manager to evaluate a specific proposal. Uh, for the rest of this presentation that will be identified on slides as option number one. And then uh, staff did prepare a couple of additional alternatives for your consideration. Next slide, please. 
on the 10th of January, uh, council decision was to set the tier three water rate at equal to the tier two water rate. Uh, secondly, um, a, a second consideration is that any additional rate reductions would, would provide relief for uh, some medium and high water users in the scenarios provided. And you'll see specific details on the slides to follow. Since 2019, the utility had embarked on a, an eight year uh, process in which to uh, rebalance rates between residential customers and other classes of customers, primarily uh, commercial customers. As it was pointed out in the cost of service study, residential rate payers were paying less than a, a fair share compared to commercial uh, customers. Uh, next point of consideration as we look, before we look at the numbers is that um, the utility calculates the utility condition index and does so separately for water, wastewater, and then a combined amount. The, uh, uh, the trend line continues on a, in a downward, on a downward path, both for water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, currently the water uh, utility condition index is at 44 and the sewer condition and utility condition index is at 33. Uh, on the sewer uh, side of the utility fund, uh, there are necessary capital improvements in order to meet state and federal regulations as they, and as they are described in a permit uh, that allows us to discharge effluent into Big Dry Creek. Um, those, are, those are the featured projects in the, not only the current year of utility uh, funding for sewer infrastructure, CIP work, but as well in 23 and 24, as they, as they would be planned in order to meet the state and federal mandates, as well as our permit requirements. Slide, please. So uh, on this slide, um, we list the baseline condition, which was already approved on the 10th of January. The numbers shown in red are reductions. So you see the, the uh, in that baseline case, the tier three adjustment that council approved, setting it equal to the tier two rate. Option number one is, as I described, the proposal from Councilors Baker and Seymour. And then options two and three are uh, other options that you may wish to consider that uh, uh, staff has prepared uh, for your consideration. In uh, you, you can see um, all this does is try to restate in a table format what, what those reductions would look like compared to the status quo. Um, Unless there are any questions on that, I can move forward to the next slide. Just, just a real quick question on that. But the proposal from Council. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you go back to that slide? I didn't mean to say next slide. <laughs> um, just real quick question. So I see on their option that you've matched up tier three to tier two. Was that the intent of the counselors was to change tier three or was your intent to Freeze tier three in that proposal where we reduced it to. Uh, no, absolutely. Tier two would be effectively the top rate. We actually talked about just eliminating tier three completely, but we just let it be the same. But yeah, we would reduce tier two and tier three would always be the same. Okay. I just want to make sure yep. that. My understanding was there. Thank you. Unless I missed this, was there um, a comparison to the 2018 or pre water increase rates? But where do, do we have those? That option number one is uh, fairly similar, if not exact, to a, a rate prior to that. So it's close. So we didn't have a third tier in 
2018? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Uh, if you want, I can read off the uh, tier rates in 2018. Tier one was one to 4,000 and it was $3.21. Tier two was five to 20,000. It was $5.32. And tier three, 21,000 and above was $7.92. Okay, thank you. You bet. Uh, I also, well, I've got the whole water thing here, so I could give you any other rate you want to. Like I give you yeah. multifamily and blah, blah, blah. I was just looking for the basic. Um, got you. Yeah. So the option number two would be a, uh, a reduction uh, to $6.35 at the tier two slash tier three rate. Option number three would be to uh, set that at $7. And in both of those cases, there is uh, no change recommended to the, the monthly fixed fee, uh, previously known as the meter service fee and, uh, and the sewer fee. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, then shows what uh, what those changes would mean to the low, the medium, and the high use customers. And just for just for reference, um, as we have as we have used those terms before when we do comparison of rates, especially with our comparison uh, municipalities and uh, district water providers, the the low water user is it is an average of 36,000 gallons per year. The medium water user is an average of 83,000 gallons per year. And the high water user is 150,000 gallons per year. So uh, in the, so what you see here is how does that affect each of the, if, if you read across uh, each of those, the the baseline, the option one, two, and three, you'll see the, the uh, annual dollar amount that uh, that average customer would see, as well as what that percent, <clears throat> what that percent rate reduction would be at, at, in that location where it says, uh, you'll see a couple of cases where it says no change as well, as no change was proposed in options two and three for sewer. If I could make it at this point, just make a case, uh, a statement that is uh, regarding the first 6,000 gallons of water use. And uh, particularly as it may, it, it, it pertains to all water users, low, medium and high, but for the, maybe for the low water user. Since 2013, so that's 10 years worth of data since 2013, the volumetric cost, which is what we call tier one, two, three, the volumetric cost for the first 6,000 gallons of water has increased a, a total of $6. So it's $6 for 6,000 gallons over 10 years. So very slight increase uh, in that, in the, in the rate to the low rate changes in to the low water user. Next slide, please. And this is what each of those, uh, the, the baseline, which we've already talked about uh, as a $750,000 impact to the utility fund. And then what our estimate for the option one, two, and three is in the water fund and in the sewer fund. And again, you'll see on options two and three, no change recommended for the sewer reduction, uh, going back to the, the consideration slide for the mandates for <clears throat> uh, permit requirements, as well as meeting federal uh, EPA standard. Uh, that's the uh, last slide of this part of the presentation.
Um, so we aren't looking at alternatives that are slightly higher as well so that we can look at not losing $750,000 annually? Well, that's a change that city council already approved the 22 rate. Uh, we did not we did not develop a scenario that would um, uh, uh, account for or recover that loss. Right, no. right. But I thought that this this was an interim solution that we would all be presented with information that would help us understand the, you know. Um, pros and cons and, you know, moving forward. And some of that should include, um, you know, higher rates than $8 for tier three. So maybe there's some, um, you know, moderate reduction it doesn't have to be this, even though this is like uh, you know, immediate relief, this doesn't, it doesn't mean it's the right answer. But, you know, I, I thought we were going to look at um, how do we move forward sustainably and that we would be looking at um, staff giving us the information to make the decision as to whether or not it would be higher or lower than what we currently have. This is like, I thought 750000 was bad on an annual basis, but like $2.2 million, pretty significant. Yes, it is. So, I don't know, colleagues, um, would you be willing to look at a broader analysis than just reducing, reducing, reducing? Mayor Pro Tem? Um, when I think of, of broader, there's a couple of things. I mean, I, I am. I don't know if these are the right numbers or not, but I'm not looking to necessarily increase or decrease, but we really need to try to, I mean, I would like to find a way to decrease, but to me, we have to have that whole picture. That's why the, um, the, the options for the path forward are so important to understand um, what are alternatives to 2025. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about that's been one of the biggest drivers of the increases in rates. Um, you know, I don't, it's, it's hard to say if this is the right number if we don't have the long-term plan. I mean, to some extent, we're just figuring out um, a short-term solution. And I, I, I've always approached this as that. Um, what I'm not seeing here is what does that, and I mean, I, there's more information in the agenda, but in terms of when you say we could take a $750,000 hit this year and you gave us good information about what that would actually do to um, capital improvement program. With these, I'm not seeing that same kind of qualifier. Of what does this actually do to our ability for, you know, this year or next year? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of what I want to learn. And I know some of that's not going to be um, ironed out tonight. Those are longer term things. And I hope that's pretty um, quickly forthcoming, especially when it, in uh, in terms of the, the, the site for the, the water 2025. The other thing though, I want to understand. And so like, this just hit me funny. And I, if, you know, we've had so many water discussions in my time. If I'm missing this, I'm, I apologize. But I understand you talking about balancing between commercial use and um, residential use. But I have to imagine that a commercial user is using more strain on the system. So when you when you talk about being fair, are you talking like per thousand gallons? Because you know part of the uh, idea that's always been put forth is that the people in the third tier are using more strain because they're using more water and there's more strain if the more water you use and it's not just it shouldn't be looked at as a per thousand gallon um, thing. And that's why we charge you so much more in that tier on top of it's always been mixed in that there's a conservancy component. So I'm trying to understand, is is that the right thing to do? Or why did we decide that was where we wanted to try to start focusing some um, equability when we look at water rates back in, I think that was probably 14 to 16 time when we started seeing some shift in, um, in, in the incremental increases we saw before. 
Well, in in terms of uh, total revenue, you know, it, it, the the great majority of revenue is derived from the residential rate payer. Uh, but what cost of service study examined and and looked at all aspects of that uh, service delivery. So one of the, the changes that was made to commercial rate also was to set that uh, per gallon rate a little bit higher uh, uh, than the the tier one rate. It was near the tier two rate, and then and any usage over that amount on a monthly amount uh, uh, quantity of use is a was a surcharge. In other words, if uh, using more than the tap fee paid for, it would be charged as a surcharge, or the commercial customer would be offered the opportunity to recalculate the tap fee. So that that's how that was set. So that um, you know they. they the amount and the tap fee were in concert with one another, and they were paying the cost of service for that category of customer. Okay. Um, I guess to me, and this is always one of those things where, you know, throughout the last 12 months, it's like, well, what is your plan? And the public likes to ask that question. And I think I've mentioned this multiple times my plan is to figure out how do we decrease cost and have you guys figure out how to make that work. Because at the end of the day, we, we drive the budget, but I, I don't know how to pull the levers. That's, you know, so really what I want is to have you guys find solutions. I will tell you from my perspective, and I know I brought this up when we talked about the third tier, I think, and I would put this thought out to my colleagues, I don't think that necessarily getting rid of the third tier is the right answer. I question and always have questioned the um, amount of gallons that are in a tier because that's really where people who at certain lot sizes easily were bumping up against that third tier. And I don't have a, a objection per se to saying, here's a punitive measure where if you're going to be reckless with your water, where we're going to say, okay, you know, you could do that, but it's going to cost you more. Because I don't think that's what we've seen is we've seen people who just legitimately have big lot sizes doing things the way they've done them for the last 30 years and then you know, being the ones who got taxed for it. Um, so I would be open to looking at what the tiers actually are um, as far as like how many thousands of gallons per tier. I think that it was a good start when we did that first tier when you expanded that. And I think it was what from 4,000 to 6,000 gallons. Um, I think that made made a difference. So. You know, maybe it's it's not necessarily just a per thousand gallon thing that we need to look at. Maybe we should look at the tiers in conjunction and we can come up with a better mix. Um, I don't know, just a thought to throw out there, but um, at the end of the day, I still, like, when these dollars are thrown out to me, like, well, what does that mean in terms of actually um, fulfilling our obligations as far as the utility? Well, and I see um, Deputy City Manager Doors here. In one, it seems like it was back in March, it was said at a council meeting or maybe a planning session, I don't know, but the $400,000 plus was out there of unpaid water bills. I never heard that number again. Did we get it? Are we, are people paying those off or what? Here's my whole point. We don't have a sustainable city and people able to live here if we have that kind of an amount of money that people can't pay their bills. I know COVID was here. I know people were losing their jobs or lots of things happened. But when we have three to four buckets so people can pay a water bill, we're not a county. And so we don't have money running coming in from different places. That's our citizens' money helping pay the bills for other people. So we've got to figure this out because if people can't pay their water bill, they can't live in the city. And it's not affordable to anybody. And so I don't even know where we're at with that whole piece. And I know it's very late and I don't know how much longer anybody wants to go. 
speak up. Oh, Councillor Simard. I, I just want to clarify some numbers and I want to make sure that I'm looking at these correctly. And this is from the November uh, financial report. You know, those are the latest numbers that, that, that we have. And it shows that um, in the utility enterprise fund, um, and this is, I didn't go to the specific line items, but the narrative is the combined water and wastewater fund revenues and carryover were projected to exceed expenditures by 26.1, I'll round it, million dollars. The revenues and carryovers are actually exceeding expenditures by $30.1 million, which means revenues and carryover expenditures are ahead of projections by $3.9 million. So through November, um, it, does that say to us, that our fund revenues, and, and we have to break out carryover because that's not always consistent either, but um, are exceeding expenditures by 26.1. But what is our budget though? The, uh, I think what you'll see when the books are balanced for 21 is that, that uh, there, we, are, we are close revenues to budget are close. Revenues uh, unofficially are about one and a half percent less than budget amount. And on the sewer side, revenues are within about 2%. So uh, we ended the year pretty close to budget. Um, there, are, there are balances in, uh, there are balances in both the, the capital project reserve and the rate stabilization reserve uh, for both water and sewer that are within uh, city council set uh, parameters for upper and lower thresholds. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna go to specific line items too. Councillor Baker. Right. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I think this is tremendous. I mean, uh, Councillor Seymour and I thought that, sorry, thought that the that this cost was going to be more in the ten to twelve million dollar range, and it comes in at six point eight million dollars. It's like three to five million dollars less than we thought. I mean, with this kind of Wonderful news. I, I was talking to Councillor, I mean, Azadi, and I don't see why we couldn't include a 46 cent per thousand gallon reduction in tier one, because that would only cost about a million dollars more dollars. And I think it would be really helpful if instead of saying how much it's going to cost, I think it'd be really helpful to say how much it's going to reduce what I call profit and what other people call our operating income. And our operating income is after we've paid all the bills, even depreciation. In, in 2019, we set aside over $14 million in depreciation. So those are dollars we can immediately turn around and build new miles of sewer pipe or build new water lines or something else like that, it just gets recycled around. So in addition to all the depreciation, in like 2019, we had an operating income of $14.6 million. And I think in 2020, it was like $20 million, wasn't it, or 22? The operating income? It was 22. $22 million of operating income. So even if we took off the seven or $8 million, instead of it being 22 off our operating income, it'd be 14. So not only would we have 14 of depreciation, but we'd have 14 of operating income that we could put towards any kind of capital improvements we want. So I think this is like fantastic news. I think it's absolutely sustainable. And even more so, I think it's going to allow some of our neighborhoods to water their lawns and trees. Okay, 
Now, so that was the great part. The bad part is at the, at the November 29th meeting, I asked, could you break out in cost when we talk cost of a K gallon of water? And we think your cost was something like seven or eight dollars, wasn't it? And I asked to break out, could you break it out into the cost of operating and the cost of capital we're putting us on? Because in a sense, that's what the operating income is, is capital we're putting aside. Uh, yes, uh, that answer was sent to you late today, just Okay, that's why I haven't prior. seen it. That's yep, probably have not seen it. I haven't looked at my email since probably three o'clock. Yes, there is a breakdown with specific page references for the budget where operating is broken out separate and shows both water and sewer operating and capital. Because uh, when, when I was researching this, it appeared to me that for our little Dry Creek sewer line, which goes to the metro, they're not called metro sewer. It's called Metro Water Recovery. Metro Water Recovery. It looks like we're paying about $3,000, $3 per 1,000 gallons, right? I think that answer was also forwarded to oh, okay. recently. Okay. okay. Because uh, that, amount, the other that one, amount speaks only to treatment. To me too, is in the proposal that Councillor Seymour and I prepared, we put in the caveat of, because... I think water demand is an elastic supply demand curve. So one of our concerns was when we lower the price of water, we'll use more water. So did you get that address too? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Say, would you ask Do you again, understand please? an elastic and an inelastic supply demand curve? Councillor Baker is referring to reduction in price will lead to greater usage. But this is where we 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 have we have a discussion about that is though trying to battle the environmental effect of wet years, dry years too. So yeah, I I, I don't know that that would be true or not. I I can't say that would be true. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I found the uh, line item um, in, in the financial report itself, and, and uh, I knew where that was, too. And I just wanted to clarify, too, that um, with that $22 million that was last year for 2020, correct? And is that inclusive of debt service, CIP? Yes, all of those amounts, though, end up in, e end up in a reserve account. Correct. I mean, that's why we say there is no such thing as profit. It's in the reserve account, either the capital or the uh, rate stabilization reserve. And, and there is a, uh, a hierarchy for how that money uh, ends up in each of those accounts. And um, in, in both cases, but particularly on the water side, um, there, there has been a cash build over the recent years for the specific purpose of water 2025 to have to have the cash balance necessary to be able to issue the appropriate amount of debt to execute that project. So perhaps what maybe what uh, Mayor Pro Tem was getting at earlier is um, you as a council, you did ask for a side by side comparison of the water 2025 project and an alternate scope and location. Uh, we are working on the, the scope and the cost of that assessment. Um, and we'll be able to communicate, we'll be able to communicate what that cost and scope looks like. But it, you know, that work is going to take a few months in order to do a proper side by side comparison. So it's not something that we'll have ready in in a week or in two weeks, it's going to be a little bit of time to get that done properly to give you a proper analysis. Anything else? Well, I would. Well, oh, just a second. I was going to go on down this one. I haven't talked yet. Councillor Yazadi. Councillor Namella. 
Um, am I to assume we're just supposed to be reading random emails and then trying to make a decision from those? Okay. Because I'm really confused about what our process is going to be to get to a decision that makes sense. And um, like three slides with a few numbers on it, uh, like meaningless to me, unless there's something that is outlining the impact to our water consumption and our, um, our projections and the impact to our water quality and our infrastructure to maintain that water quality. Um, I think as a group, it would be helpful to give staff guidance by outlining some really specific goals that we have and want to achieve. And, you know, I hear affordability. Um, can we get a little more detail on affordability? Um, and in terms of defining what does that mean, because that's going to help set a parameter. Um, the second is just our water conservation efforts. I know that all of us don't want to run out of water, and I know that we all support, except for maybe a couple, um, the desire to have to use less water and to conserve over time. Um, and to ensure again that we have a water treatment plan and infrastructure plan that ensures that we can keep our water quality where it's at um, and that we're able to maintain. You know, when I hear about like we paid all our bills, uh, when we talked about uh, the need for a billion dollars or whatever the heck it was of infrastructure improvements, it doesn't sound like we paid all our bills and that we're just swimming in profit every year, I'm assuming those dollars are dedicated to maintaining a really long-term capital improvement program. So, um, and I, I'm, I'm fine with considering different ways to achieve the end goal. And I think that we should have some alternatives to consider, but I think um, as a group, we need to just give staff some better guidance to say, here's what we want you to achieve. Give us some options on how we can get there. And then we, and then, but let us know what these mean. Is it, you know, it, it, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm, I hear, I hear everybody talking about, you know, these different aspects, but we're not, we haven't set a standard. What's our standard? Councilor Yazadi. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, most of my questions, uh, Councilor Miller has nailed perfectly. I just want to add, in addition to process, so what's our process and what's our standard? I'm very curious on timing as well. So I know we won't have answers for the side-by-side -side for the plant, but timing reg regarding these rates. To my understanding, and just had a conversation with Councillor Baker where I think we are now on the same page. So I'm curious if the council is now on the same page regarding the timing of the rate reductions. It was said multiple times, probably over multiple different council sessions, that this is a temporary reduction. We use the word temporary to the public. Are we all on the same page on that? Is this no longer a temporary reduction? Because I'm getting some conflicting. I, I don't ever recall, and I can go back and listen to it. I, there was no conversation about temporary. We voted to eliminate, it, eliminate tier three, and then we were going to have continued discussions on the entire package. So I recall Councilor Namella, I think it was asking multiple times, can we put a timeline, because we said it was temporary, can we put a timeline? And the answer to her was, um, I'm not sure what the answer was actually, but I, but I remember that question over and over again, she asked. I don't know, uh, Councillor Smith, do you remember this? Yeah, because I supported it. Actually. And then we had more discussion 
because it was there was a talk of a temporary um, time frame on it, and then um, even down to I think I think we th said three months um, as far as uh, the temporary stage. However, I've rescinded my thought on that when we had more discussion as far as um, whether it should be temporary or um, moving forward with a vote of what we did, which on the vote, there was no set. Um, I think you're confusing the two, but um, on the vote, there was no temporary on it. It was part of the discussion, yes, but on the vote, no. So I think just to finish my thought there, um, the strategic plan retreat, this is clearly a topic that we need a plan for, a, a, a strategic plan for, and I would advocate for what has been said regarding process, standard, timing. Let's set some goals and let's try to meet those goals and have the city align to those goals because I think right now it's kind of scattered how the process is working. Mayor Potem. I don't disagree, except until we get alternative solutions from the city, we're kind of playing darts here. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we, we need to do that. And I think where you may have heard me say something like temporary is, this is a temporary solution. This is not the solution to me. The solution to um, just address the top tier where people have been really being hurt. Um, is, you know, was an expedient temporary fix, but not a solution. Um, I do think that we need to look at the, the tiers. I would be interested to know, you know, and I don't know, like, so when we talked about this before and you worked through these calculations, um, I think it was Councilor Numerella had talked about like a way to be able to plug numbers in and, and see what the difference is. Is it, is it a big lift? Um, for your team to be able to look at this and say, if you change the third tier to 30,000 gallons, you know, what does that do to, to uh, revenues? Um, because I'm, I'm interested and we have not looked at adjusting the tiers and, and, you, and I think, you know, being here for four years, you certainly have heard my, thought on this evolve um, because before it was just straight, you know, we're paying it's too much of a rate, which I still think that we did too much too fast. However, one of the things that I've heard consistently through the, from the public, especially in the last 12 months is people who were really upset because it was a big increase and percentage wise it is. I can show you, I have a spreadsheet from 2011 when I bought my home to now, and I can show you all my water use and all the rates. And you can see, a two-year gap from, I think it was like um, 16 to 19, where I'm using the same amount of water over the year, but it's about $200 more, you know, in cost for the whole year, which really for me is is doable. And what I've, the reason I bring it up is I've heard from some folks who were upset about it in the front end, who still think it was a big increase percentage-wise, have learned to adapt to it. And where they've, where I've heard from those same folks where they're more concerned are the people who we've legitimately seen have 300, 400, 500 thousand dollar water bills. So like that's, you know, where some of the evolution in my thought has come out of, I think that we part of our biggest problem is that we have the tears wrong. Um, I'm all for conservancy again. I'm all for not letting people get to a certain point and abuse our water. Um, that doesn't, it wouldn't make sense to me to allow people to do that. Um, however, I just think we missed the mark. So, I would be certainly interested in what that would do to folks. Like how many, I know that we don't know economics, nor would I advocate for us knowing the economics of a user, but do we know how many users go over 30,000 gallons in a year? Um, I have to imagine that we kind of have some of those demographics or even more to the point of, would we use more water if the rates went down? What happened to water when the rates went up? Did, I would have to imagine that consumption went down because that's part of what we were trying to accomplish. Um, so, you know, that's part of what I'm, I'm trying to understand and, and get at because to me, that's, that needs to be the goal. And I don't know that there's, I mean, for me, if you want to know what like 
the goal is. The goal is a well-tamed utility that's not breaking our residents' backs. Um, that's the goal. And I don't know what the right mix to that is. And, you know, the evolution around what I think that is, is certain to my point earlier, has is, is changed over the last four and a half years, five years. Um, the other thing that I, I haven't heard us mention, and I, I want us to be cognizant of this, and this is back to the, the uh, when the rates go up, we're getting conservancy. And that's part of what we want. But it's a two-edged sword because then we also have less revenue and then you have to increase the rates more. So, you know, I just feel like our, our balance is off between the, the tiers and what the rates are. Um, I could be wrong, but I mean, I certainly have heard a change in even the public as they've had a couple of years to ride through this where they're, I have heard people more worried about their neighbors who have been getting slaughtered versus you know, it was a couple hundred dollars this year, three hundred dollars this year, and I can deal with it. Um, so, Councilor Baker. Well, first of all, I'd like to clear up: Would these proposed reductions in any way jeopardize the quality of our water? Define what you mean by quality of water. Meeting the federal standards that the, we have delivery to water for both the drink water we drink, the potable water we drink, and both the effluent that we put into the big dry creek. Uh, does it happen tomorrow? Um, you know, can you well, put a time frame to yeah, that? Uh, from now until 2025, is any of our systems uh, in really risk of failing to meet federal standards? I, I would put that in the context of. Uh, of what I said is that the utility condition index is falling uh, by uh, a notable percentage every year. Um, we are, when we when we presented this topic of utility condition index uh, several years ago, we were asked, well, how low is too low? How low can you let it go? And we set a, you know, we, we responded to city council at that time with, um, you know, a, a, a uh, we should not let it go below 35%. We're already below that on sewer infrastructure. So is it gonna, is it gonna affect our long-term sustainability? Uh, in my opinion, yes, it will affect long-term sustainability. Well, it's up to council. Uh, I did not find a lot of information in that answer. Uh, I find it uh, very difficult to believe that Pueblo can run a sustainable water system and charge $2.98 per thousand gallons as their highest rate. Or Fort Collins can do it for three seventy five, dollars Or Denver can do it for five seventy four. dollars It's just... And obviously the Denver, the Metro wastewater recyclers, I still can't get their name right. They process sewage for three, roughly $3 a thousand. And we're charging our residents right now, $7 and 84 cents a thousand. I believe they're actually looking at increasing their fees and Denver water does not do any water conservation efforts. And they are just starting to look into that. They have first water rights and they don't really worry about it because they're going to get the water and then the rest of us can fight over it. Right. So, and yeah, I, I think we need to have standards. Like I mentioned, you know, if there is a minimum tolerance for our utility condition index, let's set that as one of our standards. And but isn't that a made up number? Isn't that a number that we just made up? Our utility conditions, like yeah, our how many times we have breaks? is a made-up arbitrary value that we've placed on it. And some different engineer could come up with a different scheme. It's, it's a subjective value. Okay, so let's use objective. I'm sure there are objective values There are objective that we can components use. to it, but I'm sure there's tremendous subjective judgment involved in it. I, well, I think you're... Meaning to say subjective, but I would no. I, would, I meant to say subjective. Yeah, that's it was what you a value yeah. judgment okay. on the part of the engineer. Um, engineering rather black and white. 
So I would say that we should be able to work with staff to have them give us some objectives that are, um, or I should say standards that are objective to work toward and to work with as minimums for how we, what is our tolerance for water delivery failure? What is our tolerance for water quality? Let's lay that out and then let's figure out to the extent we can, what a, a plan is to get us to, you know, meet or, you know, rise above those standards. I am all for working with staff and I'm all for giving our uh, water users in the city immediate permanent relief from the high prices. And at a price of $6.8 million, which then would really reduce our operating income or profit in my book from 22 million to 15 million, that's a price we can easily afford. And then we can work with staff and, and see if that is. And we can also have this whole next year to find out if it is gonna increase water consumption. We can find out a whole bunch of things. I don't think taking this step immediately puts us in any jeopardy or risk whatsoever going the, from a $22 million operating income to a $15 million operating income. We're still $15 million ahead. I, I, I don't agree addition, with your opinion. We have $180 million cushion in the bank. I, I don't agree with opinion lead, leading such a essential utility for all of our survival in the community and I don't want to go by like what, which way the wind's blowing on it. However, I do agree and believe that we can meet your desire to give residents relief. So they don't, they are not mutually ex exclusive. And maybe relief is the wrong word. I want to give them a fair price for what they're paying for. And if these other cities can have a price much less than ours, why can't we at least come close? No, this is not relief. This is a fair price for a valuable commodity. Mm. Thank you. I'm just curious. So these are, again, kind of arbitrary. So trying to get to process and in results. And I know that really the long-term thing we need to answer is, is the elephant in the room is, is what's going to happen in 2025. But if you put that aside for a minute and say we, we weren't doing that, we were just 10 years ago and you have your budget. <clears throat> if we were to come back and say we want to cut $10 million out of the budget, and I'm, I'm not saying that's what we want to do, but just that's our goal. We want to cut $10 million out of the budget. What does that do for our users? You know, what would the rates be set at? Um, and then what could you do with, with your capital improvement program and how could you improve? I mean, I, I feel like that's how we need to go about it is that we need to come up with a reasonable cut to the budget and then say, now, how, how do you improve the index over the next 12 months? If that's what you have to spend. Um, one of the things that you said, Max kind of struck me as I'm thinking about this, as you had said, the one that fell below is, um, is the wastewater index, which isn't the one that's been the primary focus of a lot of this stuff. I mean, most of it's been in, in uh, potable water. So um, I feel like maybe that's one way that we do it. And I mean, I don't think we're going to solve that tonight. I think we're going to, in my opinion, going to have to take some of this into our strategic planning. And this are good discussion points, but um, I don't know how everybody feels about that. Like if you want to actually say, let's set some sort of goal. Like how, how do we go about doing that? Would it be overall budget? Would it be if we say, you know, what's the minimal amount you need to improve the, the index by 2% in the next year um, or keep it from dropping any further over the next two years? I mean, maybe you could give us some feedback about how we could do that. I mean, I, I think that's also what, what we're really hoping that we can get from staff because I know this is a change in pace. We've um, been very much, this is the path but, you know, put the path aside for a minute, I guess is what I'm asking. And how can we reasonably make an impact to our budget 
not hurt the utility and be able to help residents. Uh, and, and no solution is not the answer, I guess, is, is where I'm at with it. Like, we can't continue on that this is the only path because there's got to be another path. There's multiple paths to do anything. So um, whether or not they all fit Westminster, probably not. But there's got to be more than just this one we've been on. Councilor Izzati. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, to, uh, to follow up on what MPT said, I think I completely agree. I think we need a financial metric. And to what Council Lamella said, we also need a quality metric. And this is a conversation we should have in the strategic planning retreat. This needs to be in this plan, those two metrics, and then we track against it. And to what has been mentioned, us, Deputy Manager um, Dorr, I think that financial model, so we need some modeling, right? So we need a sheet, a spreadsheet of some kind that gives us the ability to change the variables so that we can see the impact. It's, it shouldn't be too hard to do. You guys have all the numbers. Give us the access to play with it on our own, and that can help us before this strategic planning session, I think. But it, it, I'm not sure how much work that would take you guys to build. Um, it shouldn't be hard. If you have all the numbers, just model it. And, and you know what I'm talking about. Um, that would be very helpful because I think it's long overdue, and it's something that we can all use to inform our decision making, particularly for this retreat, which I want to reemphasize is super critical. We need a water strategy. And I like the idea of having a financial metric and a quality metric. And then we have the city figure out how to meet those metrics. Conservation and conservation. Thanks. Councilor Emmons. Thank you. Uh, good discussion. Uh, I. I I think this is only one piece of the puzzle, though. I'm agreeing with my colleagues. Um, and to your point, Councillor Azadi, uh, the financial piece, it's, I understand your thought process as far as looking at the modeling. Um, but I think we need to go a step further and say, what are we modeling? Are we modeling one to 6,000 gallons or 6,000 to 20,000 gallons? Like, there's so many variables to financial impacts that it will become impossible, especially within three days, um, to get any kind of metrics of what we're looking towards. And so I would not be supportive of, of that piece. I think we need, um, obviously, direction, as to Councillor Nirmela had mentioned, as far as coming up with, and I think this is clear, becoming more clear that we need to look at this in the strategic plan goal. Um, and I think it would be welcome um, just as a focused change of our strategic plan. Um, so for understanding the condition, we're at you know, 44 on potable water and 33 on sewer condition. Um, I kind of, uh, I, I agree to what metric are we achieving? Are we going to 50, you know, 50? Are we going to 75? Are we going to 100? Um, I think that that should be part of our conversation because I think that will help drive um, what we're looking at financially, which kind of leads into Mayor Pro Tem's thought as far as um, if we kind of understand that baseline, then we'll maybe understand the financial costs that we can maybe impact on our budget. So I, I, I agree with kind of blending those and, and meshing those together. So I'm not sure what the answer is tonight, uh, but I think this is just, it's good work to one piece of a very large puzzle. Um, but to Councillor Baker, um, I'm not sure if you drink Pueblo's water, but I don't want to be in that condition. So, <laughs> All right. I, I, I don't disagree. I mean, for myself, water is probably the number one piece because there's so many things that fall under it. Comprehensive bill and use plan. I'm one of those that believes we should be building to what water we have, not the vice versa, and um, making it all squeeze together somehow magically. So we will, I think it's been good conversation. We continue to think about it the rest of the week. And Saturday, we write down your thoughts as you go. Everything's open for discussion. and. You've got three days, four days, 
for um, brainstorming as you're doing other things and free flowing and write those down so that you can bring them to, to um, strategic planning and we can maybe put some more teeth into it. Anything else for the good of the order? Yes, sir. Mayor, if I could, I wonder if council has a preference as to timing for the executive recruitment firm next steps. I understand there are at least two firms now that have um, responded to the inquiries of the city. And I'm wondering whether council members have a preference as to when we might put something on your calendars to talk about your next steps, whether it's interviewing these firms or otherwise. Um, being that one of the other primary goals this council needs to be hiring a city manager. Is that something that um, we could spend a half an hour of time during our retreat on? Or would that be appropriate to have executive session for half an hour to give direction or come up with direction? Perhaps talking next steps. And I think reaching out to your two firms and, and trying to schedule some time with each of the firms might make some sense as well. I feel like uh, that's got to be a priority and timely. So, like we're, we're not going to meet on the 31st. So if we could fit some time in over the weekend, I think it would make sense if my colleagues would agree. Should have time to, right? Well, we have time between now. If you're talking about adding something onto a Saturday um, agenda, which is part of your strategic planning retreat, um, I would have to though defer. I know you have a facilitator coming in for strategic planning and you probably have an agenda that's already been crafted. So how this would fit, I, I offer no opinion on. I don't know how it would fit into your day. Yeah. Well, Sunday's a shorter day. What if we did it at the very end of Sunday? Uh, Mayor, in, uh, in response, we can make it fit. If, if it's council's desire to have a half an hour executive session, we'll work with the facilitator uh, and make the proper public notice ahead of time uh, with, the, with the revised agenda to reflect that. Let's just do it like uh, Mayor Pro Tem said, whatever, whenever we end, we just know we've got some more time to just, I don't think it'll take us long. Um, we just need to be, so bring your calendars. Um, we need to decide if you want it uh, to interview via Zoom, which they're, they've done that. They're willing to come in. So you need to decide what your parameters want to be so that we can discuss how we're going to do the first interview and move on from there. So that's it. Anything else? It is, heaven help us, 202. <laughs> Let's go home. Well, I've only got 58 minutes before Mr. Mack gets up to go to work. <laughs>